Preface and Chapter One of Europe in the Middle Ages by Irna Lifford Plunkett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Seidel. Europe in the Middle Ages by Irna Lifford Plunkett. Preface. The history of medieval Europe is so vast a subject that the attempt to deal with it in a small compass must entail either severe compression or what may appear at first sight reckless omission. The path of compression has been trodden many times, as in J. H. Robinson's Introduction to the History of Western Europe, or in such series as The Periods of European History, published by Messrs. Rivington for Students, or Textbooks of European History, published by the Clarendon Press and Messrs. Methuen. To the authors of all of these, I should like to express my indebtedness both for facts and perspective, as to Mr. H. W. Davis for his admirable summary of the medieval outlook in the Home University Library series. But in spite of so many authorities covering the same ground, I venture to claim for the present book a pioneer path of omission. It may be reckless, but yet, I believe, justifiable. It has been my object not so much to supply students with facts as to make medieval Europe live, for the many who, knowing nothing of her history, would like to know a little in the lives of her principal heroes and villains, as well as in the tendencies of her classes, and in the beliefs and prejudices of her thinkers. This task I have found even more difficult than I had expected, for limits of space have insisted on the omission of many events and names which I would have wished to include. These I have sacrificed to the hope of creating reality and arousing interest, and if I have in any way succeeded, I should like to pay my thanks, first of all, to Mr. Henry Osborne Taylor for his two volumes of The Medieval Mind that have been my chief inspiration, and then to the many authors whose names and books I give elsewhere and whose researches have enabled me to tell my tale. Ierna L. Plunkett Chapter 1. The Greatness of Rome Ave, Roma Immortalis! Hail, immortal Rome! This cry, breaking from the lips of a race that carried the imperial eagles from the northern shores of Europe to Asia and to Africa, was no mere patriotic catchword. It was the expression of a belief that, though humanity must die and personal ambitions fade away, yet Rome herself was eternal and unconquerable, and what was wrought in her name would outlast the ages. In the modern world, it is sometimes necessary to remind people of their citizenship, but the Roman never forgot the greatness of his inheritance. When St. Paul, bound with thongs and condemned to be scourged, declared, I am Roman born, the captain of the guard, who had only gained his citizenship by paying a large sum of money, was afraid of the prisoner on whom he had laid hands without a trial. To be a Roman, however, apparently poor and defenseless, was to walk the earth protected by a shield that none might set aside save at great peril. Not to be a Roman, however rich and of high standing, was to pass in Roman eyes as a barbarian, a creature of altogether inferior quality and repute. Be it thine, O Roman, says Virgil, the greatest of Latin poets, to govern the nations with thy imperial rule and such indeed was felt by Romans to be the destiny of their race. Stretching on the west through Spain and Gaul to the Atlantic, that vast sea of darkness beyond which, according to popular belief, the earth dropped suddenly into nothingness, the outposts of the empire in the east looked across the plains of Mesopotamia toward Persia and the kingdoms of Central Asia. Babylon the Wondrous Syria and Palestine with its turbulent Jewish population, Egypt, the kingdom of the pharaohs, long ere Romulus, the city builder, slew his brother, Carthage, the queen of the Mediterranean commerce, all were now Roman provinces, 
their luster dimmed by a glory greater than they had ever known. The Mediterranean, once the battleground of rival powers, had become an imperial lake, the high road of the grain ships that sailed perpetually from Spain and Egypt to feed the central market of the world. For Rome, like England today, was quite unable to satisfy her population from home cornfields. The fleets that brought the necessaries of life conveyed also shiploads of oriental luxuries, silks, jewels, and perfumes, transported from Ceylon and India in trading sloops to the shores of the Red Sea and thence by caravans of camels to the port of Alexandria. Other trade routes than the Mediterranean were a vast network of roads that, like the threads of a spider's web, kept every part of the empire, however remote, in touch with the center from which their common fate was spun. At intervals of six miles were post houses, provided each with forty or more horses, that imperial messengers speeding to or from the capital with important news might dismount and mount again at the different stages, hastening on their way with undiminished speed. How firm and well made were their roads we know today, when, after the lapse of nearly nineteen centuries of traffic, we use and praise them still. They hold in their strong foundations one secret of their maker's greatness, that the Roman brought to his handiwork the thoroughness inspired by a vision not merely of something that should last a few years or even his lifetime, but that should endure like the city he believed eternal. It was the boast of Augustus, 27 B.C. through A.D. 14, the first of the Roman emperors, that he had found his capital built of brick and had left it marble, and his tradition as an architect passed to his successors. There are few parts of what was once the Roman Empire that possess no trace today of massive aqueduct, or forum, or public baths, or stately colonnades. In Rome itself, the Colosseum, the scene of so many a martyr's death and gladiator's struggle. Elsewhere, as at Nimes in southern France, a provincial amphitheater. The aqueduct of Segovia in Spain, the baths in England that have made and named a town the walls that mark the outposts of empire, all are the witnesses of a genius that dared to plan greatly, nor spared expense or labor in carrying out its designs. Those who have visited the border country between England and Scotland know the Emperor Hadrian's Wall, twenty feet high by seven feet broad, constructed to keep out the fierce Picts and Scots from this most northern of his possessions. Those of the enemy that scaled the top would find themselves faced by a ditch and further wall bristling with spears, while the legions flashed their summons for reinforcements from guardhouse to guardhouse along the seventy miles of this massive barrier. All that human labor could do had made the position impregnable. A scheme of fortifications was also attempted in central Europe, along the lines of the Rhine and the Danube. These rivers provided the third of the imperial trade routes, and it is well to remember them in this connection, for their importance as highways lasted right through Roman and medieval into modern times. Railways have altered the face of Europe. They have cut through her waste places and turned them into thriving centers of industry. They have looped up her mines and ports and tunneled her mountains. There is hardly a corner of any land where they have not penetrated, and the change they have made is so vast that it is often difficult to imagine the world before their invention. In Roman times, in neighborhoods where the sea was remote and road traffic slow and inconvenient, there only remained the earliest of all means of transport, the rivers. The Rhine and the Danube, one flowing northwest, the other southeast, both neither too swift nor too sluggish for navigation, were the natural main high roads of Central Europe. They were also an obvious barrier between the empire and barbarian tribes. To connect the Rhine and the Danube at their sources by a massive wall, to establish forts with strong garrisons at every point where these rivers could easily be forded, such were the precautions by which wise emperors planned to shut in Rome's civilization and to keep out all who would lay violent hands upon it. 
the emperor augustus left a warning to his successors that they should be content with these natural boundaries lest in pushing forward to increase their territory they should in reality weaken their position it is easy to agree with this view centuries afterwards when we know that the defences of the empire pushed ever forward snapped at the finish like an elastic band but the average roman of imperial days believed his nation equal to any strain it was a boast of the army that roman banners never retreat if then a tribe of barbarians were to succeed in fording the danube and in surprising some outpost force the legions sent to punish them would clamor not merely to exact vengeance and return home but to conquer and add the territory to the empire in the case of swamps or forest land the clamor might be checked but where there was pasturage or good agricultural soil it would be almost irresistible emigrants from crowded italy would demand leave to form a colony traders would hasten in their footsteps and soon another responsibility of land and lives perhaps with no natural protection of river sea or mountains would be added to rome's burden of government such was the fertile province of dacia north of the danube a notable gain in territory but yet a future source of weakness at the head of the empire stood the emperor caesar augustus the commander-in-chief of the army the supreme authority in the state the fountain of justice a god before whose altar every loyal roman must burn incense and bow the knee in reverence it was a great change from the old days when rome was a republic and her senate or council of leading citizens had been responsible to the rest of the people for their good or bad government the historian tacitus looking back from imperial days with a sigh of regret says that in that happy age man could speak what was in his mind without fear of his neighbors and draws the contrast with his own time when the emperor's spies wormed their way into house and tavern paid to betray those about them to prison or death for some chance word or incautious action yet rome by her conquests had brought on herself the tyranny of the empire it is comparatively easy to rule a small city well where fraud and self-seeking can be quickly detected but when rome began to extend her boundaries and to employ more people in the work of government unscrupulous politicians appeared these built up private fortunes during their term in office they became senators and in the senate ceased to represent the will of the people and began to govern in the interests of a small group of wealthy men members of their families became governors of provinces first in italy and then as conquest continued across the mountains in gaul and spain and beyond the seas in egypt and asia minor except in name senators and governors ceased to be simple citizens and lived as princes with officials and servants ready to carry out their slightest wish perhaps it may seem odd that the roman people once so fond of liberty that they had driven into exile the kings who oppressed them should afterwards let themselves be bullied or neglected by a hundred petty tyrants but in truth the people had changed even more than the class of patricians to whom they found themselves in bondage no longer pure roman or latin but through conquest and intermarriage of every race from the stalwart Teuton to the supple oriental or swarthy egyptian few amongst the men and women crowding the streets of rome remembered or reverenced the traditions of her early days rome stood for military glory luxury culture at her best for even-handed justice but no longer for an ideal of liberty if national pride was satisfied and adequate food and amusement provided the roman populace was content to be ruled from above and to hail rival senators as masters according to the extent of their promises and successes a failure to fulfill such promises resulting in a lost campaign or a dearth of corn would throw the military tyrant of the moment from his pedestal but only to set up another in his place it was an easy transition from the rule of a corrupt senate to that of an autocrat 
Better one tyrant than many was the attitude of mind of the average citizen toward Octavius Caesar, when, under the title of Augustus, he gathered to himself the supreme command over army and state, and so became the first of the emperors. Had he been a tactless man and shouted his triumph to the seven hills, he would probably have fallen a victim to an assassin's knife. But he skillfully disguised his authority and posed as being only the first magistrate of the state. Under his guiding hand, the Senate was reformed, and its outward dignity rather increased than shorn. Augustus could issue his own edicts or commands independently of the Senate's consent, but he more frequently preferred to lay his measures before it and to let them reach the public as a senatorial decree. In this he ran no risk, for the senators, impressive figures in the eyes of the ordinary citizen, were really puppets of his creation. At any minute he could cast them away. His fellow magistrates were equally at his mercy, for in his hands alone rested the supreme military command, the imperium, from which the title of imperator or emperor was derived. At first he accepted the office only for ten years, but at the end of that time, resigning it to a submissive senate, he received it again amid shouts of popular joy. The tyranny of Augustus had proved a blessing. Instead of corps of troops raised here and there in different provinces by governors at war with one another, and thus divided in their allegiance, there had begun to develop a disciplined army whose legions were enrolled, paid, and dismissed in the name of the all-powerful Caesar, and who therefore obeyed his commands, rather than those of their immediate captains. The same system of centering all authority in one absolute ruler was followed in the civil government. Governors of provinces, once petty rulers, became merely servants of the state. Caesar sent them from Rome, he appointed the officials under them, he paid them their salaries, and to him they must give an account of their stewardship. If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Such was the threat that induced Pontius Pilate, governor of Judea in the reign of Tiberius, to condemn to death a man he knew to be innocent of crime. This is but one of many stories that show the dread of the emperor's name in Rome's far distant provinces. Governors, military commanders, judges, tax collectors, all the vast army of officials who bore the responsibility of government on their shoulders had an ultimate appeal from their decisions to Caesar and were exalted by his smile or trembled at his frown. It is not a modern notion of good government, this complete power vested in one man. But Rome, nearly two thousand years ago, was content that a master should rule her, so long as he would guarantee prosperity and peace at home. This, under the early Caesars, was at least secured. Two fleets patrolled the Mediterranean, but their vigilance was not needed, save for an occasional brush with pirates. Not but storms disturbed her waters. The legions on the frontiers, whether in Syria or Egypt or along the Rhine and Danube, kept the barbarians at bay until Romans ceased to think of war as a trade to which every man might one day be called. It was a profession left to the few, the many content to pay the taxes required by the state and to devote themselves to a civilian's life. To one would fall the management of a large estate, Another would stand for election to a government office. A third would become a lawyer or a judge. Others would keep shops or taverns or work as hired laborers, while below these again would be the class of slaves, whether prisoners of war sold in the marketplace or citizens deprived of their freedom for crime or debt. In Rome itself was a large population living in uncomfortable lodging houses very like the slum tenements of a modern city. Some of the inhabitants would be engaged in casual labor, some idle. But when the empire was at its zenith, lavish gifts of corn from the government stood between this otherwise destitute population and starvation. It crowded the streets to see Caesar pass, threw flowers on his chariot, and hailed him as emperor and god, and in return he bestowed on it 
food and amusements. The huge amphitheaters of Rome and her provinces were built to satisfy the public desire for pageantry and sport. And because life was held cheap, and for all his boasted civilization, the Roman was often a savage at heart, he would spend his holidays watching the despised sect of Christians thrown to the lions, or hired gladiators fall in mortal struggle. We about to die salute thee. With these words, the victims of an emperor's lust of bloodshed bent the knee before the imperial throne, and at Caesar's nod passed to slay or be slain. The emperor's scepter did not bring mercy, but order, justice, and prosperity above the ordinary standard of the age. End of chapter 1「Chapter Two: Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Decline of Rome. The years of Rome's greatness seemed to her sons an age of gold, but even at the height of her prosperity, there were traces of the evils that brought about her downfall. An autocracy, that is, the rule of one man might be a perfect form of government were the autocrat not a man but a god, thus combining superhuman goodness and understanding with absolute power. Unfortunately, Roman emperors were representatives of human nature in all its phases. Some, like Augustus, were great rulers. Others, though good men, incompetent in the management of public affairs, whilst not a few led evil lives and regarded their office as a means of gratifying their own desires. The Emperor Nero, for instance, was cruel and profligate, guilty of the murder of his half-brother, mother, and wife, and also of the deaths of numberless senators and citizens whose wealth he coveted. Because he was an absolute ruler, his corrupt officials were able to bribe and oppress his subjects as they wished, until he was, fortunately, assassinated. He was the last of his line, the famous House of Julius to which Augustus had belonged, and the period that followed his death was known as the Year of the Four Emperors, because during that time no less than four rivals claimed and struggled for the coveted honor. Nominally, the right of election lay with the Senate, but the final champion, Vespasian, was not even a Roman nor an aristocrat, but a soldier from the provinces. He had climbed the ladder of fame by sheer endurance and his power of managing others, and his accession was a triumph not for the Senate, but the legions who had supported him and who had now learned their power. Henceforth, it would be the soldier with his naked sword who could make and unmake emperors, and especially the Praetorian Guard, whose right it was to maintain order in Rome. The gradual recognition of this idea had a disastrous effect on the government of the empire. Too often, the successful general of a campaign on the frontier would remember Vespasian and become obsessed with the thought that he also might be a Caesar. Led by ambition, he would hold out to his legions hopes of the rewards they would receive were he crowned in Rome, and some sort of a bargain would be struck, lowering the tone of the army by corrupting its loyalty and making its soldiers insolent and grasping. The Senate attempted to deal with this difficulty of the succession by passing a law that every emperor should, during his lifetime, name his successor, and that the latter should at once be hailed as Caesar take a secondary share in the government, and have his effigy printed on coins. In this way, he would become known to the whole Roman world, and when the emperor died, would at once be acknowledged in his place. Thus, the Romans hoped to establish the theory that England expresses today in the phrase, the king never dies. Though to a certain extent successful in their efforts to avoid civil war, they failed to arrest other evils that were undermining the prosperity of the government. One of these was the imperial expenditure. It was only natural that the emperor should assume a magnificence and a liberality in excess of his wealthiest subjects, 
but in addition he found it necessary to buy the allegiance of the Praetorian Guard and to keep the Roman populace satisfied in its demands for free corn and expensive amusements. The standard of luxury had grown, and Romans no longer admired, except in books, the simple life of their forefathers. Instead, the fashionable ideal was that of the East they had enslaved, and the emperor was gradually shut off from the mass of his subjects by a host of court officials who thronged his antechambers and exacted heavy bribes for admission. In this unhealthy atmosphere, suspicion and plots grew apace like weeds, and money dripped through the imperial fingers as through a sieve, now into the pockets of one favorite, now of another. I have lost a day, was said by the emperor Titus, whenever twenty-four hours had passed without his having made some valuable present to those about him. His courtiers were ready to fall on their knees and hail him for his liberality as darling of the human race. But he only reigned for two years. Had he lived to exhaust his treasury, it is probable that the greedy thong would have passed a different verdict. Extravagance is as catching as the plague, and the Roman aristocracy did not fail to copy the imperial example. Just as the emperor was surrounded by a court, so every noble of importance had his following of clients, who would wait submissively on his doorstep in the morning, and attend him when he walked abroad to the forum or the public baths. Some would be idle gentlemen, the penniless younger sons of noble houses, others professional poets ready to write flattering verses to order, others again famous gladiators whose long death roll of victims had made them as popular in Rome as a champion tennis player or footballer in England of today. All were united in the one hope of gaining something from their patron, perhaps a gift of money, or his influence to secure them a coveted office, at least an invitation to a banquet or feast. The class of senators to which most of these aristocrats belonged had grown steadily richer as the years of empire increased, building up immense landed properties, something like the feudal estates of a later date. These villas, as they were called, were miniature kingdoms over which their owners had secured absolute power. Their affairs were administered by an agent, probably a favored slave who had gained his freedom, assisted by a small army of officials. The principal subjects of the landlord would be the small proprietors of farms who paid a rent or did various services in return for their houses, while below these again would be a larger number of actual slaves employed as household servants, bakers, shoemakers, shepherds, and the like. The most striking thing about the Roman villa was that it was absolutely self-contained. All that was needed for the life of its inhabitants, whether food or clothing, could be grown and manufactured on the estate. The crimes that were committed there would be judged by the master or his agent, and from the former's decision there would be little hope of appeal. Where the proprietor was harsh or selfish, miserable indeed was the condition of those condemned to live on his villa. The income of the average senator in the 4th century A.D. was about 60,000 pounds, a very large sum when money was not as plentiful as it is today. Aurelius Symmachus, a young senator, typical of this time, possessed no less than 15 country seats, besides large estates in different parts of Italy and three townhouses in Rome or her suburbs. It was his object to become Praetor of Rome, one of the highest offices in the city, and in order to gain popularity, he and his father organized public games that cost them some 90,000 pounds. Lions and crocodiles were fetched from Africa, dogs from Scotland, a special breed of horses from Spain, while captured warriors were brought from Germany, whom he destined to fight one another in the arena. The life of this young senator, according to his letters, was controlled by purely selfish considerations. He did not want the praetorship in order to be of use to the empire, but merely that the empire might crown his career with a coveted honor. 
the same narrow outlook and lack of public spirit was common to the majority of the other men and women of his class so great was their blindness that they could not even see that they were undermining rome's power far less avail to save her more fatal even than the corruption of the aristocracy was the decline of the middle classes usually called the backbone of a nation's greatness the name of Roman citizen, says a native of Marseilles in the 5th century, formerly so highly valued and even bought with great price, is now shunned, nay, it is regarded with abomination. This change from the days of St. Paul may be traced back long before the time when Symmachus wasted his patrimony in bringing crocodiles from Africa and horses from Spain. Its cause was the gradual but constant increase of taxation required to fill the imperial treasury and the unequal scale according to which such taxation was levied. Rome's main source of revenue was an impost on land and ought by rights to have been exacted from the senatorial class that owned the majority of the large estates. Unfortunately, it was left to the local municipal councils, the curias, to collect this tax and if it fell short of the amount required from the locality by the imperial treasury the curiales or class compelled as a duty to attend the councils were held responsible for the deficit here was a problem for roman citizens of medium wealth members of their curia by birth quite unable to divest themselves of this more than doubtful honor and conscious that their sons at eighteen must also accept the dignity and put their shoulders to the burden. It was one thing to assess the chief landlords of the neighborhood at a sum that matched their revenues. It was another to obtain the money from them. In England today, the man who refuses to pay his taxes is punished. In imperial Rome, he was the tax collector." Possessed of money and influence, it was not hard for a senator to outwit mere curiales, either by obtaining an exemption from the emperor or by bribing the occasional inspectors sent by the central government to condone his refusal to pay. The imperial court set an example of corruption, and those who could imitate this example did so. The curiales, faced by ruin, sought relief in various ways those with most wealth tried to raise themselves to senatorial rank others unable to achieve this yet conscious that they must obtain the money required at all costs demanded the heaviest taxes from those who could not resist them so that the phrase spread abroad so many curiales just so many robbers less important members of the middle classes unable to pay their share of taxation nor to force others to do so instead tried in every way to divest themselves of an honor grown intolerable and the legislation of the later empire shows their efforts to escape out of the net in which the government tried to hold them enmeshed some sought the protection of the nearest landowners and joined the dependents of their villas others though forbidden by law entered the army while others again sold themselves into slavery since a master's self-interest would at least secure them food and clothing more desperate and adventurous spirits saw in brigandage a means of both livelihood and of revenge joining themselves to bands of criminals and escaped slaves they infested the high roads waylaid and robbed travelers and carried off their spoils to mountain fastnesses thus through fraud or violence the ranks of the curiales diminished and taxation fell with still heavier pressure on those who remained to support its burdens this evil state of affairs was intensified by the widespread system of slavery that besides its bad influence on the character of both master and slave had other economic defects when forced labor and free work side by side the former will nearly always drive the latter out of the market because it can be provided more cheaply a master need not pay his slaves wages he can make them work as many hours as he chooses and lodge and feed them just as he pleases 
from his point of view it is more convenient to employ men who cannot leave his service however much they dislike the work and conditions for these reasons business and trade tended to fall into the hands of wealthy slave owners who could undersell the employers of free labor and as the number of slaves increased the number of free workmen grew less in rome and the large towns also free laborers who remained were corrupted like men and women of a higher rank by the general extravagance and love of pleasure they did not agitate so much for a reform of taxation or the abolition of slavery but for larger supplies of free corn and more frequent public games and spectacles an extravagant court a corrupt government slavery class selfishness these were some of the principal causes of rome's decline but in recording them it must be remembered that the taint was only gradual like some corroding acid eating away good metal not all curiales in spite of popular assertions were robbers not every taxpayer on the verge of starvation not every dependent of a villa crowd and miserable in many houses masters would free or help their slaves and slaves be found ready to die for their masters the canker lay in the indifference of individual roman citizens to evils that did not touch them personally in the refusal to cure with radical reform even those that did in the foolish confidence of the majority in the glory of the past as a safeguard for the present faith in rome killed all faith in a wider future for humanity this lack of vision has ruined many an empire and kingdom and rome only half opened her eyes even when the despised barbarians who were to expose her weakness were already knocking at the imperial gates barbarian we have noticed was the epithet used by the roman of the early empire to describe and condemn the person not fortunate enough to share his citizenship at this time the most formidable of the barbarians were the german tribes who inhabited large stretches of forest and mountain land to the north of the danube and east of the rhine a tall powerfully built race for the most part with ruddy hair and fierce blue eyes whose business was warfare and the occupation of their leisure hours the chase or gambling in his book germania tacitus a famous roman historian of the first century describes these teutons and besides drawing attention to their primitive customs and lack of culture he made copy of their simplicity to lash the vices of his own countrymen the germans he said did not live in walled towns but in straggling villages standing amid fields these were either shared as common pasturage or tilled in allotments parceled out annually among the inhabitants a number of villages would form a pegas or canton a number of pegai a civitas or state at the head of the state was more usually a king but sometimes only a number of important chiefs or dukes who would be treated with the utmost reverence it was their place to preside over the small councils that dealt with the less important affairs of the state and to lay before the larger meeting of the tribe measures that seemed to require public discussion lying around their campfire in the moonlight the younger men would listen to the advice of the more experienced and clash their weapons as a sign of approval when some suggestion pleased them at the councils were chosen the principes or magistrates whose duty it was to administer justice in the various cantons and villages tribal law was very primitive in comparison with the roman code that required highly trained lawyers to interpret it had a man betrayed his fellow villagers to their enemies let him be hung from the nearest tree that all might learn the fitting reward of treachery had he turned coward and fled from the battle let him be buried in a morass out of sight beneath a hurdle such that shame should be quickly forgotten had he in a rage or by accident slain or injured a neighbor let him pay a fine and compensation half to his victim's nearest relations half to the state if the decision did not satisfy those concerned 
the family of the injured person could itself exact vengeance but since it would probably meet with opposition in so doing more bloodshed would almost certainly result and a feud like the later corsican vendetta be handed down from generation to generation such a state of unrest had no horror for the german tribesmen from his earliest days he looked forward to the moment when receiving from his kinsmen the gift of a shield and a sword he might leave boyhood behind him and assume a man's responsibilities and dangers with his comrades he would at once hasten to offer his services to some great leader of his tribe and as a member of the latter's comitatus or following go joyfully out to battle like the spartan of old he went with a cry ringing in his ears with your shield or on your shield it is a disgrace said tacitus for the chief to be surpassed in battle and it is an infamy and a reproach for life to have survived the chief and returned from the field this statement explains the reckless daring with which the scattered groups of germans would fling themselves time after time against the disciplined roman phalanxes the women shared the hardihood of the race bringing and receiving as wedding gifts not ornaments or beautiful clothes but a warrior's horse a lance or a sword lest a woman should think herself to stand apart from aspirations after noble deeds and from the perils of war she is reminded by the ceremony that inaugurates marriage that she is her husband's partner in toil and danger destined to suffer and die with him alike both in peace and war chaste industrious devoted to the interests of husband and children yet so patriotic that watching the battle she would urge them rather to perish than retreat the barbarian woman struck tacitus as a living reproach to the many faithless idle pleasure-seeking wives and mothers of rome in his own day the german tribes might be uncouth their armies without discipline even their nobles ignorant of culture but they were brave hospitable and loyal above all they held a distinction between right and wrong they did not laugh at vice it is probable that in the days of tacitus his views were received throughout the roman empire with an amused shrug of the shoulders for to many the germans were merely good fighters whose giant build added considerably to the glory of a triumphal procession when they walked sullenly in their shackles behind the victor's car with the passing of the years into centuries however intercourse changed this attitude and much of the contempt on one side and hatred on the other vanished germans captured in childhood were brought up in roman households and grew invaluable to their masters numbers were freed and remained as citizens in the land of their captivity the tribes along the borders became more civilized they exchanged raw produce or furs in the nearest roman markets for luxuries and comforts and as their hatred of rome disappeared admiration took its place something of the greatness of the empire touched their imagination they realized for the first time the possibilities of peace under an ordered government and whole tribes offered their allegiance to a power that knew not only how to conquer but to rule emperors nothing loth gathered these new forces under their standards as auxiliaries or allies federate and franks from flanders at the imperial bidding drove back fellow barbarians from the left bank of the rhine while fair-haired alemanni and saxons fell in caesar's service on the plains of mesopotamia or on the arid sands of africa from auxiliary forces to the ranks of the regular army was an easy stage the more so as the roman legions were every year in greater need of recruits as the boundaries of the empire spread it is at first sight surprising to find that the military profession was unpopular when we recall that it rested in the hands of the legions to make or dispossess their rulers but such opportunities of acquiring bribes and plunder did not often fall to the lot of the ordinary soldier while the disadvantages of his career were many a very small proportion of the army was kept in the large towns of the south save in rome that had its own praetorian guards 
the majority of the legions defended the rhine and danube frontiers or still worse were quartered in cold and foggy britain shut up in fortress outposts like york or chester english regiments today think little of service in far distant countries like egypt or india indeed men are often glad to have the experience of seeing other lands but the roman soldier as he said farewell to his italian village knew in his heart that it had practically passed out of his life the shortest period of military service was sixteen years the longest twenty-five and when we remember that owing to the slow and difficult means of transport leave was impossible we see the roman legionary was little more than the serf of his government bound to spend all the best years of his life defending less warlike countrymen moving with his family from outpost to outpost the memories of his old home would grow blurred and the legion to which he belonged would occupy the chief place in his thoughts as he grew older his sons bred in the atmosphere of war would enlist in their turn and so the military profession would tend to become a caste handed down from father to son the soldier could have little sympathy with fellow citizens whose interests he did not share but would despise them because they did not know how to use arms the civilians on their side would think the soldier rough and ignorant and forget how much they were dependent on his protection for their trade and pleasure instead of trying to bridge this gulf the government in their terror of losing taxpayers widened it by refusing to let the curiales enlist at the same time they filled up the gaps in the legions with corps of franks germans or goths because they were good fighting material and others of their tribe had proved brave and loyal in the same way when land in italy fell out of cultivation the emperor would send numbers of barbarians as colonae or settlers to till the fields and build themselves homes at first they might be looked on with suspicion by their neighbors but gradually they would intermarry and their sons adopt roman habits until in time their descendants would sit in municipal councils and even rise to become praetors or consuls when it is said that roman empire fell because of the inroads of barbarians the impression sometimes left on people's minds is that hordes of uncivilized tribes filled with contempt for rome's luxury and corruption suddenly swept across the alps in the fifth century laying waste the whole of north italy this is far from the truth the peaceful invasion of the empire by barbarians whether as slaves traders soldiers or colonists was a continuous movement from early imperial days there is no doubt that as it increased it weakened the roman power of resistance to the actually hostile raids along the frontiers that began in the second and third centuries and culminated in the collapse of the imperial government in the west in the fifth an army partly composed of half-civilized barbarian troops could not prove so trustworthy as the well-disciplined and seasoned romans of an earlier age for the foreign element was liable in some gust of passion to join forces with those of its own blood against its oath of allegiance as to the main cause of the raids it was rather love of rome's wealth than a sturdy contempt of luxury that led these barbarians to assault the dreaded legions had it been mere love of fighting the alemanni would as soon have slain their saxon neighbors as the imperial troops but nowhere save in spain or southern gaul or on the plains of italy could they hope to find opulent cities or herds of cattle plunder was their earliest rallying cry but in the third century the pressure of other tribes on their flank forced them to redouble in self-defense efforts begun for very different reasons this movement of the barbarians has been called the wandering of the nations gradually but surely like a stream released from some mountain cavern goths from the north and huns and vandals from the east descended in irresistible numbers on southern germany driving the tribes who were already in position there up against the barriers first of the danube and then of the alps and the rhine italy and gaul ceased to be merely a paradise for looters but were sought by barbarians who had learned something of rome's civilization 
as a refuge from other barbarians who trod women and children underfoot, leaving a track wherever their cruel hordes passed, red with blood and fire. With their coming, Europe passed from the brightness of Rome into the Dark Ages. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three The Dawn of Christianity. When Augustus became Emperor of Rome, Jesus Christ was not yet born, with the exception of the Jews who believed in the one Almighty Jehovah most of the races within the boundaries of the empire worshipped a number of gods and these according to popular tales were no better than the men and women who burned incense at their altars but differed from them only in being immortal and because they could yield to their passions and desires with greater success the roman god jupiter who was the same as the greek zeus was often described as king of gods and men but far from proving himself an impartial judge and ruler, the legends in which he appears show him cruel, faithless, and revengeful. Juno, the Greek Hera, queen of heaven, was jealous and implacable in her wrath, as the much-enduring hero Ulysses found when from time after time her spite drove him from his homeward course from Troy. Mercury, the messenger of the gods, was merely a cunning thief. Most of the thoughtful Greeks and Romans, it is true, came to regard the old mythology as a series of tales invented by their primitive ancestors to explain mysterious facts of nature like fire, thunder, earthquakes. Because, however, this form of worship had played so great a part in national history, patriotism dictated that it should not be forgotten entirely and, therefore, emperors were raised to the number of the gods, and citizens of Rome, whether they believed in their hearts or no, continued to burn incense before the altars of Jupiter, Juno, or Augustus in token of their loyalty to the empire. The human race has found it almost impossible to believe in nothing, for man is always seeking theories to explain his higher nature and why it is he recognizes so early the difference between right and wrong. Far back in the 3rd and 4th centuries before Christ, Greek philosophers had discussed the problem of the human soul, and some of them had laid down rules for the leading of the best possible life. Epicurus taught that since our present life is the only one, man must make it his object to gain the greatest amount of pleasure that he can. Of course, this doctrine gave an opening to people who wished to live only for themselves. But Epicurus himself had been simple, almost ascetic in his habits, and had clearly stated that although pleasure was his object, yet we cannot live pleasantly without living wisely, nobly, and righteously. The self-indulgent man will defeat his own ends by ruining his health and character until he closes his days not in pleasure, but in misery. Another Greek philosopher was Zeno, whose followers were called Stoics, from the stoa or porch of the house in Athens in which he taught his first disciples. Zeno believed that man's fortune was settled by destiny, and that he could only find true happiness by hardening himself until he grew indifferent to his fate. Death, pain, loss of friends, defeated ambitions, all these the Stoic must face without yielding to fear, grief, or passion. Brutus, the leader of the conspirators who slew Julius Caesar, was a Stoic, and Shakespeare in his tragedy shows the self-control that Brutus exerted when he learned that his wife Portia, whom he loved, had killed herself. The teaching of Epicurus and Zeno did something during the Roman Empire to provide ideals after which men could strive but neither could hold out hopes of a happiness without end or blemish. The Hades of the old mythology was no heaven, but a world of shades beyond the river Styx, gloomy alike for good and bad. At the gate stood the three-headed monster Cerberus, ready to prevent souls from escaping once more to light and sunshine. 
Paganism was thus a sad religion for all who thought of the future, and this is one of the reasons why the tidings of Christianity were received so joyfully. When St. Paul went to Athens, he found an altar set up to the unknown God, showing that men and women were out of sympathy with their old beliefs and seeking an answer to their doubts and questions. He tried to tell the Greeks that the Christ he preached was the God they sought, but those who heard him ridiculed the idea that a Jewish peasant who had suffered the shameful death of the cross could possibly be divine. The earliest followers of Christianity were not, as a rule, cultured people like the Athenians, but those who were poor and ignorant. To them, Christ's message was one of brotherhood and love overriding all differences between classes and nations. Yet it did not merely attract because it promised immortality and happiness. It also set up a definite standard of right and wrong. The Jewish religion had laid down the Ten Commandments as the rule of life, but the Jews had never tried to persuade other nations to obey them. Rather, they had jealously guarded their beliefs from the Gentiles. The Christians, on the other hand, had received the direct command to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And even the slave, when he felt within himself the certainty of his new faith, would be sure to talk about it to others in his household. In time, the strange story would reach the ears of his master and mistress, and they would begin to wonder if what this fellow believed so earnestly could possibly be true. In a brutal age, when the world was largely ruled by physical force, Christianity made a special appeal to women and to the higher type of men who hated violence. One argument in its favor amongst the observant was the life led by the early Christians, their gentleness, their meekness, and their constancy. It is one thing to suffer an insult through cowardice, quite another to bear it patiently and yet be brave enough to face torture and death rather than surrender convictions. Christian martyrs taught the world that their faith had nothing in it mean or spiritless. Perhaps it may seem strange that men and women whose conduct was so quiet and inoffensive should meet with persecution at all. Christ had told his disciples to render under Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and the strength of Christianity lay not in rebellion to the civil government, but in submission. This is true, yet the Christian who paid his taxes and took care to avoid breaking the laws of his province would find it hard all the same to live at peace with pagan fellow citizens. Like the Jew, he could not pretend to worship gods whom he considered idols. He could not offer incense at the altars of Jupiter and Augustus. He could not go to a pagan feast and pour out a libation of wine to some deity, nor hang laurel branches sacred to the nymph Daphne over his door on occasions of public rejoicing. Such neglect of ordinary customs made him an object of suspicion and dislike amongst neighbors who did not share his faith. A hint was given here and there by mischief-makers and confirmed with nods and whisperings that his quietness was only a cloak for evil practices in secret and this grew into a rumor throughout the empire that the murder of newborn babies was part of the Christian rites. Had the Christians proved more pliant, the imperial government might have cleared their name from such imputations and given them protection. But it also distrusted their refusal to share in public worship. Lax themselves, the emperors were ready to permit the god of the Jews or Christians a place amongst their own deities, and then they could not understand the attitude of mind that objected to a like toleration of Jupiter or Juno. The commandment, Thou shalt have none other gods but me, found no place in their faith, and they therefore accused the Christians and Jews of want of patriotism, and used them as scapegoats for the popular fury when occasion required. In the reign of Nero, a tremendous fire broke out in Rome that reduced more than half the city to ruins. The emperor, who was already unpopular because of his cruelty and extravagance, fearing that he would be held responsible for the calamity, declared hastily that he had evidence that the fire was planned by Christians, and so the first serious persecution of the new faith began. Here is part of an account given by Tacitus, 
whose history the German tribes we have already noticed. Quote, he, Nero, inflicted the most exquisite tortures on those men who under the vulgar appellation of Christians were already branded with deserved infamy. They died in torments, and their torments were embittered by insult and derision. Some were nailed on crosses, others sewn up in the skins of wild beasts and exposed to the fury of dogs. Others, again, smeared over with combustible materials, were used as torches to illuminate the darkness of the night. The gardens of Nero were destined for this melancholy spectacle, which was accompanied with a horse race and honored with the presence of the emperor. Unquote. Tacitus himself was a pagan and hostile to the Christians, yet he admits that this cruelty aroused sympathy. Nevertheless, the persecutions continued under different emperors, some of them, unlike Nero, wise rulers and good men. These people, wrote the Spanish emperor Trajan, referring to the Christians, should not be searched for, but if they are informed against and convicted, they should be punished. Marcus Aurelius declared that those who acknowledged that they were Christians should be beaten to death, and during his reign, Men and women were tortured and killed on account of their faith in every part of the empire. The test required by the magistrates was nearly always the same, that the accused must offer wine and incense before the statue of the emperor and revile the name of Christ. The motive that inspired these later emperors was not Nero's innate love of cruelty or desire of finding a scapegoat, but genuine fear of a sect that grew rapidly in numbers and wealth and that threatened to interfere with the ordinary worship of the temples so bound up with the national life. In the reign of Trajan, the governor of Bithynia wrote to the emperor complaining that on account of the spread of Christian teaching, little money was now spent in buying sacrificial beasts. Nor, he added, are cities alone permeated by the contagion of this superstition, but villages and country parts as well. Emperors and magistrates were at first confident that, if only they were severe enough in their punishments, the new religion could be crushed out of existence. Instead, it was the imperial government that collapsed while Christianity conquered Europe. Very early in the history of Christianity, the apostles had found it necessary to introduce some form of government into the church. And later, as the faith spread from country to country, there arose in each province men who, from their goodness, influence, or learning, were chosen by their fellow Christians to control the religious affairs of the neighborhood. These were called episcopi, or bishops, from the Latin word episcopus, an overseer. Tradition claims that Peter was the first bishop of the church in Rome, and that during the reign of Nero he was crucified for loyalty to the Christ he had formerly denied. To help the bishops, a number of presbyters or priests were appointed, and below these again deacons, who should undertake the less responsible work. The first deacons had been employed in distributing the alms of the wealthier members of the congregation amongst the poor, and though in early days the sum received were not large, yet as men of every rank accepted Christianity regardless of scorn or danger and made offerings of their goods, the revenues of the church began to grow. The bishops also became persons of importance in the world around them. In time, emperors and magistrates whose predecessors had believed in persecution came to recognize that it was not an advantage to the government, even a danger, and instead they began to consult and honor the men who were so much trusted by their fellow citizens. At last, in the fourth century, there succeeded to the throne an emperor who looked on Christianity not with hatred or dread, but with friendly eyes as a more valuable ally than the paganism of his fathers. This was the emperor, Constantine the Great. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Constantine the Great. Constantine the Great was born at a time when the empire was divided up between different emperors, 
His father, Constantius Chlorus, ruled over Spain, Gaul, and Britain, and when he died at York in A.D. 306, Constantine, his eldest son, succeeded to the government of those provinces. The new emperor, who was thirty-two years old, had been bred in the school of war. He was handsome, brave, and capable, and knew how to make himself popular with the legions under his command without losing his dignity or letting them become undisciplined. When he had reigned a few years, he quarreled with his brother-in-law Maxentius, who was emperor at Rome, and determined to cross the Alps and drive him from his throne. The task was difficult, for the Roman army, consisting of picked Praetorian guards and regiments of Sicilians, Moors, and Carthaginians, was quite four times as large as the invading forces. Yet Constantine, once he had made his decision, did not hesitate. He knew his rival had little military experience, and that the corruption and luxury of the Roman court had not increased either his energy or valor. It is said also that Constantine believed that the god of the Christians was on his side, for as he prepared for a battle on the plains of Italy against vastly superior forces, he saw before him in the sky a shining cross and underneath the words, By this, conquer. At once he gave orders that his legions should place on their shields the sign of the cross, and with this same sign as his banner, he advanced to attack. It was completely successful. The Roman army fled in confusion. Maxentius was slain, and Constantine entered the capital almost unopposed. The arch in Rome that now bears his name celebrates this triumph. Constantine was now emperor of the whole of Western Europe, and some years later, after a furious struggle with Licinius, the emperor of the east, he succeeded in uniting all the provinces of the empire under his rule. This was a joyful day for Christians, for though Constantine was not actually baptized until just before his death, yet throughout his reign he showed his sympathy with the Christian religion and did all in his power to help those who professed it. He used his influence to prevent gladiatorial shows, abolished the horrible punishment of crucifixion, and made it easier than ever before for slaves to free themselves. When he could, he avoided pagan rites, though as emperor he still retained the office of Pontifex Maximus, or high priest, and attended services in the temples. His mother, the Empress Helena, to whom he was devoted, was a Christian and one of the old legends describes her pilgrimage to the Holy Land and how she found and brought back with her some wood from the cross on which Christ had been crucified. Soon after Constantine conquered Rome, he published the famous Edict of Milan that allowed liberty of worship to all inhabitants of the empire, whether pagans, Jews, or Christians. The latter were no longer to be treated as criminals, but as citizens with full civil rights, while the places of worship and lands that had been taken from them were to be restored. Later, as Constantine's interest in the Christians deepened, he departed from this impartial attitude and showed them special favors, confiscating some of the treasures of the temples and giving them to the church, as well as handing over to it sums of money out of the public revenues. He also tried to free the clergy from taxation, and allowed bishops to interfere with the civil law courts. Many of these measures were unwise. For one thing, Christianity, when it was persecuted or placed on a level with other religions, only attracted those who really believed in Christ's teaching. When it received material advantages, on the other hand, the ambitious at once saw a way to royal favor and their own success by professing the new beliefs. A false element was thus introduced into the church. For another thing, few even of the sincere Christians could be trusted not to abuse their privileges. The fourth century did not understand toleration, and those who had suffered persecution were quite ready as a rule to use compulsion in their turn towards men and women who disagreed with them, whether pagans or those of their own faith. Quite early in its history, the church was torn by disputes, since much of its teaching had been handed down by tradition or word of mouth, and this led to disagreement as to what Christ had really said or meant by many of his words. 
At length, the church decided that it would gather the principal doctrines of the Catholic or universal faith into a form of belief that men could learn and recite. Thus, the Apostles' Creed came into existence. In spite of this definition of the faith, controversy continued. At the beginning of the 4th century, a dispute as to the exact relationship of God the Father to God the Son and the doctrine of the Trinity broke out between Arius, a presbyter of the church in Egypt, and the bishop of Alexandria, the latter declaring that Arius had denied the divinity of Christ. Partisans defended either side, and the quarrel grew so embittered that an appeal was made to the emperor to give his decision. Constantine was reluctant to interfere. They demand my judgment, he said, who myself expect the judgment of Christ. What audacity of madness! When he found, however, that some steps must be taken if there was to be any order in the church at all, he summoned a council to meet at Nicaea and consider the question, and thither came bishops and clergy from all parts of the Christian world. The meetings were prolonged and stormy, but the eloquence of a young Egyptian deacon called Athanasius decided the case against Arius, and the latter, refusing to submit to the decrees of the council, was proclaimed a heretic or outlaw. The Orthodox Catholics, that is, the majority of bishops who were present, then drew up a new creed to express their exact views, and this took its name from the council and was called the Nicene Creed. In a revised form, it is still recited in all the Catholic churches of Christendom. Arius, though defeated at the council, succeeded in winning the emperor over to his views, and Constantine tried to persuade the Catholics to receive him back into the church. When this suggestion met with refusal, the emperor, who now believed that he had a right to settle ecclesiastical matters, was so angry that he tried to install Arius in one of the churches of his new city of Constantinople by force of arms. The Orthodox bishop promptly closed and barred the gates, and riots ensued that were only ended by the death of Arius himself. The schism, however, continued, and it may be claimed that its bitterness had a considerable influence in deciding the future of Europe by raising barriers between races that might otherwise have become friends. Arianism, like Orthodox Catholicism, was full of the missionary spirit, and from its priests the half-civilized tribes of Goths and Vandals learned the new faith. A Gothic bishop was present at the Council of Nicaea, while another, Ulfilas, who had studied Latin, Greek, and Hebrew at Constantinople, afterwards translated a great part of the Bible into his own tongue. This is the first known missionary Bible and, though the original has disappeared, a copy made about a century later is in the museum at Uppsala, written in Gothic characters in silver and gold on purple vellum. The Goths regarded their Bible with deep awe and carried it with them on their wanderings, consulting it before they went into battle. Like the Vandals, who had also been converted by the Arians, they considered themselves true Christians, but the Orthodox Catholics disliked them as heretics almost more than the pagans. Constantine himself imbibed the spirit of fanaticism, and when he became the champion of Arius, persecuted Athanasius, who had been made bishop of Alexandria, and compelled him to go into exile. Athanasius went to Rome, where it is said that he was at first ridiculed because he was accompanied by two Egyptian monks in hoods and cowls. Western Europe had heard little, as yet, of monasticism, though the Eastern Church had adopted it for some time. To the early Christians, with their high ideals, the world around them seemed a wicked place in which it was difficult for them to lead a Christ-like life. They thought by withdrawing from an atmosphere of brutality and material pleasure, and by giving themselves up to fasting and prayer, they would be able more easily to fix their minds on God and so fit themselves for heaven. Sometimes they would go to desert places and live as hermits in caves, perhaps without talking to a living person for months or even years. Others who could not face such loneliness would join a community of monks, dwelling together under special rules of discipline. 
at fixed hours of the day and night they would recite the services of the church and in between whiles they would work or pray and study the scriptures many of the austerities they practiced sound to us absurd for it is hard to feel in sympathy with a simon stylites who spent the best days of his manhood crouched on a high pillar at the mercy of sun wind and rain until his limbs stiffened and withered away yet the hermits and monks were an arresting witness to christianity in an age that had not fully realized what christ's teaching meant he that will serve me let him take up his cross and follow me this ideal of sacrifice was brought home for the first time to hundreds of thoughtless men and women when they saw someone whom they knew give up his worldly prospects and the joy of a home and children in order to lead a life of perpetual discomfort until death should come to him as a blessing and not a curse the majority of the leading clergy in the early church the fathers of the church as they are usually called were monks two of them saint gregory and saint basil studied together at the university of athens in the fourth century saint basil founded a community of monks in asia minor where his reputation for holiness soon drew together a large number of disciples he did not try to win them by fair words or the promises of ease and comfort for his monks were allowed little to eat and spent their days in prayer and manual labor of the hardest kind the arians who hated saint basil as an orthodox catholic once threatened that they would confiscate his belongings torture him and put him to death my sole wealth is a ragged cloak and some books replied the hermit calmly my days on earth are but a pilgrimage and my body is so feeble that it will expire at the first torment death will be a relief it came when he was only fifty but not at the hands of his enemies for he died exhausted by the penances and privations of his customary life he left many letters and theological works that throw light on the religious questions of his day st gregory had lived for a time with st basil and his monks in asia minor but was not strong enough to submit to the same harsh discipline indeed he declared that but for the kindness of st basil's mother he would have died of starvation afterwards he returned home and was ordained a priest he was a gentler type of man than st basil a poet of no little merit and an eloquent preacher yet another of the catholic fathers of the church was st ambrose bishop of milan he was elected to the see against his own will by the people of the town who respected him because he was strong and fearless st ambrose did not hesitate to use the wealth of the church even melting down some of the altar vessels to ransom christians who had been carried away captive during one of the barbarian invasions the church he declared possesses gold and silver not to hoard but to spend on the welfare and happiness of men the impetuosity and vigor that made him a born leader he also employed to express his intolerance of those who disagreed with him when some christians in milan burned a jewish synagogue and the emperor theodosius ordered them to rebuild it st ambrose advised them not to do so i myself he said would have burned the synagogue what has been done is but a trifling retaliation for acts of plunder and destruction committed by jews and heretics against the catholics this was not the spirit of the founder of christianity it was too often the spirit of the medieval church a man of even greater influence than saint ambrose of milan was saint jerome a monk of the fifth century who is chiefly remembered today because of his latin translation of the bible the vulgate as it is called that is still a recognized edition of the roman catholic church st jerome was born in italy but in his extreme asceticism he followed the practices of the eastern rather than the western church as a youth he had led a wild life but suddenly repenting he disappeared to live as a hermit in the desert starving and mortifying himself so strongly did he believe that this was the only road to heaven that when he went to rome he preached continually in favor of celibacy urging men and women not to marry as if marriage had been a sin 
he was afraid that if they became happy and contented in their home life, they would forget God. Many of the leading families, and especially their women, came under St. Jerome's influence, but such exaggerated views could never be really popular, and instead of being chosen Bishop of Rome as he had expected, he was forced by the many enemies he had aroused to leave town and return once more to the desert. Of his sincerity there can be little doubt, but his outlook on life was warped because, like so many good and earnest contemporary Christians, he believed that human nature and this earth were entirely bad and that only by the suppression of any enjoyment in them could the soul obtain salvation. Several centuries were to pass before St. Francis of Assisi taught his fellow men the beauty and value of what is human. Constantinople, the polis or city of Constantine, had been a Greek colony under the name of Byzantium long before Rome existed. Built on the headland of the Golden Horn, its walls were lapped by an inland sea whose depth and smoothness made it a splendid harbor from the rougher waters of the Mediterranean. Almost impregnable in its fortifications, it frowned on Asia across the narrow straits of the Hellespont and completely commanded the entrance to the Black Sea with its rich ports, markets, then as now for the corn and grain of southern Russia. Constantine, when he decided that Byzantium should be his capital, was well aware of these advantages. He had been born in the Balkans, had spent a great part of his life as a soldier in Asia, had assumed the imperial crown in Britain, and ruled Gaul as his first kingdom. This medley of experience left little place in his heart for Italy, and the name of Rome had no power to stir his blood. Rome to him was a corrupt town and one of the outlying limbs of his empire. It had no harbor nor special military value on land, while the Alps were a barrier preventing news from passing quickly to and fro. Byzantium, on the other hand, near the mouth of the Danube, was easy of access and yet could be rendered almost impregnable to his foes. It had the great military advantage also of serving as an admirable headquarters for keeping watch over the northern frontier and an outlook towards the east. The walls of the original town could not embrace the emperor's ambitions, and he himself, wand in hand, designed the boundaries. His court, following him, gasped with dismay. It is enough, they urged. No imperial city was ever so great before. I shall go on, replied Constantine, until he, the invisible guide who marches before me, thinks fit to stop. Not until the seven hills outside Byzantium were enclosed within his circuit was the emperor satisfied. And then the great work of building began, and the white marble of forum and baths of palaces and colonnades arose to adorn the Constantinople that has ever since this time played so large a part in the history of Europe. In the new marketplace, just beyond the original walls, was placed the golden milestone, a marble column within a small temple, bearing the proud inscription that here was the central point of the world. Inside were statues of Constantine and Queen Helena, his mother, while Rome herself and the cities of Greece were robbed of their masterpieces of sculpture to embellish the buildings of the new capital. In May A.D. 330, Constantinople was solemnly consecrated, and the empire kept high festival in honor of an event that few of the revelers recognized would alter the whole course of her destiny. The new capital, through her splendid strategic position, was to preserve the imperial throne with one short lapse for more than a thousand years. But this advantage was obtained at the expense of Rome, and the complete severance of the interests of the empire in the east and west. The Romans had never loved the Greeks, even when they most admired their art and subtle intellect. And now, in the fourth century, this persistent distrust was intensified when Greece usurped the glory that had been her conquerors. In the absence of an emperor, and of many high officials who had gone to swell the triumph of his new court, Rome set up another idol. The symbols of material glory might vanish, but the Christian faith had supplied men with fresh ideals through the teaching of the apostles and their representatives, the bishops. 
Roman bishops claimed that the gift of grace they received at their consecration had been passed down to them by the successive laying on of hands from St. Peter himself. Thou art Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on the earth shall be loosed in heaven. These words of Christ seem to grant his apostle complete authority over the souls of men, and Christians at Rome began to ask if the power of St. Peter to bind and loose had not been handed down to his successors. If so, Il Papa, that is, their father, the Pope, was undoubtedly the first bishop in Christendom, for on no other apostle had Christ bestowed a like authority. It must not be imagined that this reasoning came like a flash of inspiration or was willingly received by all Christians. Many generations of popes, from the days of St. Peter onwards, were regarded merely as bishops of Rome, that is, as overseers of the church in the chief city of the empire. They were loved and esteemed by their flock, not on account of special divine authority, but because they stood neither for self-interest nor for faction, but for principles of justice, mercy, and brotherhood. Had a Roman been robbed by a fellow citizen? Were there a plague or famine? Was the city threatened by enemies without her walls? It was to her bishop Rome turned, demanding help and protection. Afterwards, it was only natural that when the one power that could and did afford these things when emperors and senators were far away should in time take the emperor's place, and that the pope should appear to Rome, and gradually, as we shall see to Western Europe, God's very viceroy on earth. To the church in Greece, Egypt, and Asia Minor, he never assumed this halo of glory. Byzantium, the great Constantinople, was the pivot on which the Eastern world turned, and the Bishop of Rome, with his tradition of St. Peter, made no authoritative appeal. Thus far back in the 4th century, the cleft had already opened between the churches of the East and West that was to widen into a veritable chasm. Constantine the Great died in 337, and if greatness be measured by achievement, he well deserves his title. Where men of higher genius and originality had failed, he had succeeded, beating down with calm perseverance every object that threatened his ambitions, until at last the Christian ruler of a united empire, feared and respected by subjects and enemies alike, he passed to his rest. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five: Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Ilford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five: The Invasions of the Barbarians. Instead of endeavoring to maintain a united empire, Constantine, in his will, divided up his dominions between three sons and two nephews. Before thirty years were over, however, a series of murders and civil wars had exterminated his family. And two brothers, Valentian and Valens, men of humble birth but capable soldiers, were elected as joint emperors. Valens ruled at Constantinople, his brother at Milan. And it was during this reign that the empire received one of the worst blows that had ever befallen her. We have already mentioned the Goths, a race of barbarians half-civilized by Roman influence and converted to Christianity by followers of Arius. One of their tribes, the Visigoths, had settled in large numbers in the country to the north of the Danube. On the whole, their relations with the empire were friendly, and it was hardly their fault that the peace was finally broken, but rather of a strange Tartar race called the Huns, that, massing in the plains of Asia, had suddenly swept over Europe. Here is a description given of the Huns by a Gothic writer. Quote, Men with faces that can scarcely be called faces, rather shapeless black collops of flesh with tiny points instead of eyes, little in stature but lithe and active, skillful in riding, broad-shouldered, hiding under a barely human form the ferocity of a wild beast. Unquote. 
Tradition says that these monsters, mounted on their shaggy ponies, rode women and children underfoot and feasted on human flesh. Whether this be true or no, their name became a terror to the civilized world, and after a few encounters with them, the Visigoths crowded on the edge of the Danube and implored the emperor to allow them to shelter behind the line of Roman forts. Valens, to whom the petition was made, hesitated. There was obvious danger to his dominions in the sudden influx of a whole tribe. But on the other hand, fear might madden the Visigoths into trying to cross, even if he refused, and if so, could he withstand them? All the multitude that escaped from the murderous savagery of the Huns, says a writer of the day, no less than 200,000 fighting men beside the women and old men and children were there on the river banks, stretching out their hands with loud lamentations and promising that they would ever faithfully adhere to the imperial alliance if only the boon was granted to them. Reluctantly, Valens yielded, and soon the province of Dacia was crowded with refugees. But here the real trouble began. Food must be found for this multitude, and it was evident that the local crops would not suffice. In vain the emperor commanded that corn should be imported. The greed of officials who were responsible for carrying out this order led them to hold up large consignments and sell what little they allowed to pass at wholly extortionate rates. Their unwelcome guests, half-starved and fleeced of the small savings they had been able to bring with them, complained, plotted, and at last broke into open rebellion. This treatment of the Visigoths in Dacia is one of the worst pages in the history of the Roman Empire, but it brought its own speedy punishment. The suspicion and hatred engendered by misery spread like a flame, and the barbarian forces were joined by deserters of their own race from the imperial legions and by runaway slaves until they had grown into a formidable army. Valens, forced to take steps to preserve his throne, met them on the battlefield of Adrianople, but only to suffer crushing defeat. He himself was slain, and some 40,000 of those who had served under his banner. Never before had the imperial eagles met with such a reverse at barbarian hands, and the Visigoths, after the first moment of triumph, were almost alarmed at the extent of their own success. Before the frowning walls of Constantinople, their courage faltered, and without attempting a siege, they retreated northward into Thrace. Gladly, they came to terms with Theodosius, Valen's successor, who, not content with regranting them the lands to the south of the Danube that they so much desired, increased his army by taking whole regiments of their best warriors into his pay. Lover of peace and of the Goths is the character with which Theodosius has passed down to posterity, and during his reign the Visigoths and other northern tribes received continual marks of his favor. One of the Gothic kings, the old chief of Thanaric, went to visit him at Constantinople and was overwhelmed by the magnificent and luxury he saw around him. Now do I at last behold, he exclaimed, what I have often heard but deemed incredible. Doubtless the emperor is a god on earth, and he who raises a hand against him is guilty of his own blood. The alliance between Goth and Greek served its purpose at the moment for by the aid of the new troops Theodosius was able to defeat the rival emperor of Rome and to conquer Italy. When he died, he left Constantinople in the east to his eldest son, Arcadius, a youth of eighteen, and Rome and the west to the younger, Honorius, who was only eleven. True to his belief in barbarian ability, Theodosius selected a vandal chief, Stilicho, to whom he had given his niece in marriage, that he might act as the boy's adviser and command the imperial forces. Under a wise regent, a nation may wait in patience for their child ruler to mature. Unfortunately, Canorius, as he grew up, belied any promise of manliness he had ever shown, languidly refusing to continue his boyish sports of riding or archery, and taking no interest save in some cocks and hens that it was his daily pleasure to feed himself. He had no affection or reverence for Rome, and finally settled in Ravenna on the Adriatic as the safest fortress in his dominions. 
From here, he consented to sign the orders that dispatched the legions to protect his frontiers, or issued haughty manifestos to his enemies. So long as Stilicho lived, such feebleness passed comparatively unnoticed. For the Vandal, a man of giant build and strength, possessed to the full a tireless energy and daring that the dangers of the time demanded. Theodosius had made the Visigoths his friends, but on his death they began to chafe at the restrictions laid on them by the imperial alliance. Arcadius was nearly as poor a creature as his younger brother, so inactive that he seldom spoke and always looked as though he were about to fall asleep. The barbarians bore him no hatred, but on the other hand he could scarcely inspire their affection or fear, and so they chose a king of their own, Alaric, one of the most famous generals, and from this moment they began to think of fresh conquests and pillage. The suggestion of sacking Constantinople was put on one side. Those massive walls against their background of sea would make it a difficult task. Besides, the Visigoths argued, were there not other towns equally rich and more vulnerable? With an exultant shout that answered this question, they set out on their march, first toward Illyricum on the eastern coast of the Adriatic, and then to the fertile plains of Italy. Alaric and Stilicho were well matched as generals, and for years, through arduous campaigns of battles and sieges, the Vandal kept the Goth at bay. When at last death forced him to resign the challenge, it was no enemy's sword but the weapon of treachery that robbed Rome of her best defender. Honorius, lacking in gratitude as in other virtues, had been ill-pleased at the success of his armies, for wily courtiers, hoping to plant their fortunes amid another's ruin, told him that Stilicho intended to secure the imperial throne for himself, and that in order to do so he would think little of murdering his royal master. Suspicion made the timid emperor writhe with terror through sleepless nights. It seemed to him that he would never know peace of mind again, until he had rid himself of this formidable commander-in-chief. And so, by his orders, Stilicho was put to death, and Italy lay at the mercy of Alaric and his followers. Sweeping across the Alps, the Visigoths paused at last before the gates of Rome. We are many in number and prepared to fight, boldly began the ambassadors sent out from the city. Thick grass is easier to mow than thin, replied Alaric. Dropping their lofty tone, the ambassadors demanded the price of peace, and on the answer, your gold, your silver, your treasures, all that you have, they exclaimed in horror, what then do you leave us? Your souls, was the mocking rejoinder. After much argument, the Visigoths consented to be bought off and retreated northwards, but it was only to return in the summer of the year 410, when Rome, after a feeble resistance, opened her gates. Her enemies poured in triumph through the streets. But Alaric was no Hun loving slaughter for its own sake, and ordered his troops to respect human life and to spare the churches and the gold and silver vessels that rested on their altars. He spent only a few days in sacking the city, and then marched southward, intending to invade Africa. While his army was embarking, however, he fell ill and died, and so great was his loss that all thought of the campaign was surrendered. Alaric was mourned by his people as a national hero, and unable to bear the thought that his enemies might one day desecrate his tomb, they dammed up a river in the neighborhood and dug a grave for their general deep in its bed. When they had laid his body there, they released the stream into its old course, and so left their hero safe from insult beneath the waters. The sack of Rome that moved the civilized world profoundly made little impression on the young emperor. He had named one of his favorite hens after the capital and when a messenger, haggard with the news he had brought, fell on his knees gasping, Sire, Rome has perished, Honorius only frowned and replied, Impossible, I've fed her myself this morning. St. Jerome, in his hermit cell at Bethlehem, was stupefied at the fate of the eternal city. The world crumbles, he said. There is no created work that rust or age does not consume, but Rome... 
who could have believed that, raised by her victories above the universe, she would one day fall? Why had Rome fallen? This was the question on everybody's lips. We know today that the process of her corruption had been working for centuries, but men and women rarely see what is going on around them, and some began to murmur that the old gods of Olympus were angry because their religion had been forsaken. It was affirmed that Christ would save the world, but what had he done to save Rome? Christianity was not long in finding a champion to defend her cause, an African monk, Augustine, to medieval minds the greatest of all the fathers of the church. Augustine was the son of a pagan father and a Christian mother, and grew up a wild and undisciplined boy. After some years at the University of Carthage, spent in casual study and habitual dissipation, he determined to go to Rome, and from there he passed to Milan, where he went out of curiosity to listen to the preaching of St. Ambrose. It was obvious that he would either hate or be strongly influenced by this fiery old man. And in truth, Augustine, who secretly repented of the way he had wasted his life, was in a ripe mood to receive the message that he had refused to hear from the lips of Monica, his mother. Soon he was converted and baptized, and later he was made Bishop of Hippo, a place not far from Carthage. It is difficult to give a picture of Augustine in a few words. Like St. Ambrose and others of the early fathers, he was quite intolerant of heresy and believed that ordinary human love and the simplest pleasures of the world were snares set by the devil to catch the unwary. But against these unbalanced views, largely the product of the age in which he lived, must be set his burning enthusiasm for God and the services that he rendered to Christianity. A modern writer says of him, quote, As the supreme man of his time, he summed up the past as it still lived, remolded it, added to it from himself, and gave it a new unity and form wherein it was to live on. The great heart, the great mind, the mind led by the heart's inspiration, the heart guided by the mind, this is Augustine, end quote. Superior in intellect to other men of his day, his whole being, filled with the love of God and fired by the desire to make the world share his worship, he preached, worked, and wrote only to this end. In his confessions, he describes his youth and repentance, but his most famous work is Civitas Dei. Here was the answer to those who declared that Rome had fallen because she neglected her pagan deities. Rome, he maintained, was not and never could be eternal, for the one eternal kingdom was the Savitus Dei, the city of God, toward whose reign of triumph the human race had been tending since earliest times. Before her glory, the kingdoms of this world, and all culture and civilization of which men boasted, must fade away. Thus God had destined, and St. Augustine exerted all his eloquence and powers of reasoning to prove from history the magnitude and sureness of the divine purpose. The author of the Savitas Dei was to have his faith severely tested, for he died amid scenes of desolation and horror that held out no hope of happiness for man on earth. Rome stood at the mercy of barbarians, and Christian Africa was also fast falling under their yoke. These new invaders, the Vandals, were also a German tribe, who, as soon as Stilicho withdrew legions from the Rhine to defend Italy from the Visigoths, broke over the weakened frontier into Gaul, and from there crossed the Pyrenees and marched southwards. Spain had been one of the richest of Rome's provinces, and besides her minerals and corn had provided the empire with not a few rulers as well as famous authors and poets. In her commercial prosperity she had grown, like her neighbors, corrupt and unwarlike, so the Vandals met with little resistance and plundered and pillaged at their will. Instead of settling down amid their conquests, they were driven by the promise of further loot and the pressure of other barbarian tribes following hard on their heels to cross the narrow Strait of Gibraltar and to pursue their way due east along the African coast. In Spain they have left the memory of their presence in the name of one of her fairest provinces, Andalusia. The chief of the Vandals at this time was Genseric, who not only conquered all the coastline of North Africa, 
but also built a fleet that became the terror of the Mediterranean. Like the Goths, the Vandals were Christians, but they held the views of Arius, and there could be little hope that they would tolerate the Orthodox Catholics. Though hardly as inhuman and ruthless as their opponents would have had the world believe, they pillaged and laid waste as they passed, and posterity has since applied the word vandal to the man who willfully destroys. The name Hun is even more sinister in repute. In the first half of the 5th century, the Huns in their triumphant march across Europe were led by their king Attila, the scourge of God, whose boast it was that never grass grew again where his horse's hooves had once trod. So short and squat as to be almost deformed, flat-nosed with a swarthy skin and deep-set eyes that he would roll hideously when angered, the king loved to inspire terror, not only amongst his enemies but in the chieftains under his command. Pity, gentleness, civilization, such words were either unknown or abhorrent to him, and in the towns whose walls were stormed by his troops, old men, women, priests, and children fell alike, victims to his sword. It was his ambition that the name of Attila should become a terror to the whole earth, but the extent to which he succeeded in realizing this aim brought a serious check to his arms, for when he reached the boundaries of Gaul, he found that fear had gathered into a single hostile force of formidable size races that had warred for centuries amongst themselves. Here were not only provincials, descendants of the Romanized inhabitants of Gaul, but Goths, Franks, Burgundians, and other tribes who, like the Vandals, had forced the passage of the Rhine as soon as the imperial garrisons were weakened or withdrawn. They had little in common save hatred of the Hun, a passion so strong that in a desperate battle on the plain of Chalons, they hurled back the Tartar hordes forever from the lands of Western Europe. Shaken by his defeat, but sullen and vindictive, Attila turned his thoughts to Italy, and he and his warriors swept across the passes of the Alps and descended on the fertile country lying to the northwest of the Adriatic. The Italians made but a feeble resistance, and the palaces, baths, and amphitheaters of once wealthy towns vanished in smoking ruins. One important work of construction Attila unconsciously assisted, for the inhabitants of Achillea, seeking refuge from their cruel foe, fled to the coast, and there, amid the desolate lagoons, they and their descendants built for themselves in the course of centuries a new city, Venice, the future queen of the Adriatic. Aquileia has been a city of repute, but it can be safely guessed that she would never have attained the worldwide glory that Venice, safe behind her barrier of marshes and with every incentive to naval enterprise, was to establish in the Middle Ages. From the Adriatic provinces, Attila passed to Rome, but refrained from sacking the city. It is said that he was uneasy because the armies of the Gaul that had defeated him at Chalons still hung on his rear, threatening to cut off his retreat across the Alps. At any rate, he consented to make terms negotiated by the Pope on behalf of the citizens of Rome. Contemporary accounts declare that the Hun was awed by the sight of Leo I in his priestly robes and by the fearlessness of his bearing and certainly for his mediation he well deserved the title of great that the people in their gratitude bestowed on him. Attila, when he left Rome, turned northwards, but died quite shortly after some drunken orgy. The kingdom of massacre and fire that he had built on the terror of his name fell rapidly to pieces, and only the remembrance of that terror remained while the Huns merged themselves in the armies of other tribes or fought together in petty rivalry. Rome had been taken by Alaric the Visigoth and spared by Attila, but her trials were not yet at an end. Genseric, the Vandal king who had established himself at Carthage, was only awaiting his opportunity to plunder a city that was still a world-famous treasure house. His fleet, that had cut off Italy entirely from the cornfields of Egypt, blockaded the mouth of the Tiber, and the Romans, weakened by famine and the warfare of the past few years, quickly sued for peace. Once more Pope Leo went as mediator to the camp of his enemies, 
but the Aryan vandal, unlike the pagan Hun, was adamant. He was willing to forego a general massacre, but nothing further, and for a fortnight the city was ruthlessly pillaged. Then Genseric sailed away, carrying with him thousands of prisoners besides all the treasures of money and art on which he could lay hands. Nearly four hundred years before, the emperor Titus, when he sacked Jerusalem, brought to Rome the golden altar and candlesticks of the Jewish temple, and now Rome in her turn was despoiled of these trophies of her former victories. It was little wonder if the western emperors, who had systematically failed to save their capital, became discredited at last among their own troops, and Rome, that had begun life according to a tradition under a Romulus, was to end her empire under another, a handsome boy nicknamed in derision of his helplessness Augustulus, or Little Augustus. The pretext of his deposition was his refusal to grant Italian lands to the German troops who formed the main part of the imperial army, on which their captain, Odoacer, compelled him to abdicate. So low had the imperial dignity sunk in public estimation that Odoacer, instead of claiming the once coveted honor, sent the diadem and purple robe to the emperor at Constantinople. We disclaim the necessity or even the wish, wrote Augustulus, of continuing any longer the imperial succession in Italy. The majesty of a sole monarch is sufficient to pervade and protect at the same time both east and west. The writer, so fortunate in his insignificance that no one wished to assassinate him, <laughs> spent the rest of his days in a castle by the Mediterranean, supported by a revenue from the state, while Odoacer, with the title of patrician, ruled the land with statesmanlike moderation for fourteen years. Two more waves of invasion were yet to break across the Alps and hinder all attempts at restoration and unity. The first was that of the Ostrogoths, or Eastern Goths, a tribe of the same race as the Visigoths that, meeting the first onslaught of the Huns in their advance from Asia, had only just on the death of Attila freed themselves from this terrible yoke. They sought now an independent kingdom, and under the leadership of their prince, Theodoric, chafed on the boundaries of the Eastern Empire, with which they had formed an alliance. Theodoric had been educated in Constantinople, and, though brave and warlike, did not share the reckless love of battle that animated his followers. He realized, however, that he must lead the Ostrogoths to a new land of plenty or incur their hatred and suspicion. So he appealed to the emperor Zeno for leave to go to Italy as his general and depose Odoacer. Direct me with the soldiers of my nation, he wrote, to march against the tyrant. If I fall, you will be relieved from an expensive and troublesome friend. If, with divine permission, I succeed, I shall govern in your name and to your glory. Zeno had not been sufficiently powerful to prevent Odoacer from taking the title of patrician, but he had never liked the barbarian upstart who had dared to depose an emperor. He had also begun to dread the presence of the restless Ostrogoths so close to Constantinople, and warmly appreciated Theodoric's arguments in favor of their exodus. If the two barbarian kings destroyed one another, it would be all the better for the empire. And so, with the imperial blessing, Theodoric started on his great adventure. He took with him not only his warriors, but the women and children of his tribe and all their possessions, and after several battles succeeded in defeating and slaying his opponent. Rome, that looked upon him as the emperor's representative, joyfully opened her gates, but Theodoric preferred to make Ravenna his capital, and here he settled and planted an orchard with his own hands. It was his hope that he might win the trust and affection of his new subjects, and though he ruled exactly as he liked, he remained outwardly submissive to the emperor, writing him humble letters and marking the coinage with the imperial stamp. He frequently consulted the Senate at Rome that, though it had long ago lost any real power, had never ceased to take a nominal share in the government. And when he gave a third of the Italian lands to his own countrymen, he allowed Roman officials to make the division. 
Theodoric also maintained the laws and customs of Italy and forced the Ostrogoths to respect them too, but his army remained a national bodyguard, and in spite of his efforts at conciliation, the two peoples did not mingle. Between them stood the barrier of religious bitterness, for the Ostrogoths were Arians, and though their ruler was very tolerant in his attitude, the Catholics were always suspicious of his intentions. On one occasion there had been a riot against the Jews, and several synagogues had been burned. Theodoric ordered a collection of money to be made amongst the Orthodox Catholics who were responsible, that the buildings might be restored. This command was disobeyed, and when the ringleaders of the strike were whipped through the streets, popular anger against the Gothic king grew to white heat. He himself changed in character as he became older and showed himself morose and tyrannical. Toward the end of his reign, he put to death Boethius, a Roman senator, who had been one of his favorite advisers, but who had dared to defend openly a man whom he himself had condemned. Boethius was not only a fearless champion of his friends, he was a great scholar who had kept alight the torch of classical learning amid the darkness and horror of invasion. Besides translating some of the works of Aristotle, he wrote treatises on logic, arithmetic, geometry, and astronomy, and made an able defense of the Nicene Creed against Arian attacks. The last and most famous of his works, that for ten centuries men have remembered in love, was his Consolations of Philosophy, written when death in a most horrible form was already drawing close. Tortured by a cord drawn closely around his forehead, and then beaten with clubs, the philosopher escaped from a life where fortune had dealt with him cruelly. His master survived him by two years, repenting on his deathbed in an agony of remorse for the brutal sentence he had meted out. It is scarcely fair to judge Theodoric by the tyranny of his last days. It is better to recall the glory of his prime, and how in the western part of the empire there was no people who refused him homage. Allied by family ties with the Burgundians, the Visigoths, the Vandals, and the Franks, he was undoubtedly the greatest of all the barbarians of his age. Had his successors shown a little of his statesmanlike qualities, Ostrogoth and Italian, in spite of their religious differences, might have united to form a single nation. But unfortunately, before twenty years had passed, the kingdom he had founded was destined to disappear. Theodoric was succeeded by his grandson, a boy who lived only a few years, and then by a worthless nephew without either royal or statesmanlike qualities. In contrast to this weak dynasty, there ruled at Constantinople an emperor who possessed in the highest degree the ability and steadfastness of purpose that the times required. Justinian was only a peasant by birth, but he had been well educated and took a keen interest not only in questions of law and finance that concerned the government, but in theology, music, and architecture. In his manner to his subjects he was friendly, though dignified, but there was something unsympathetic in his nature that prevented him from becoming popular. His courtiers regarded his industry with awe, but some professed to believe that he could not spend so many midnight hours at work unless he were an evil spirit, not requiring sleep. One writer says that no one ever remembered him young, yet this serious prince married for love a beautiful actress, Theodora, and dared in the face of general indignation to make her his empress. An historian of the time says of Theodora, it were impossible for mere man to describe her comeliness in words or imitate it in art. Yet she was no doll, but took a very definite share in the government, extorting admiration by her dignity even from those who had pretended to despise her. Justinian's chief passion was for building and he spent a great part of his revenue in erecting bridges, baths, forts, and palaces. Most famous of all the architecture of his time was St. Sophia, the Church of the Holy Wisdom, that, after Constantinople passed into the hands of the Turks, became a mosque. It is not, however, for St. Sophia that Justinian is chiefly remembered, 
but for the corpus juris civilis literally the body of civil law that he published in order that his subjects might know what the roman law really was the corpus juris civilis consisted of three parts the code a collection of decrees made by various emperors next the digest the decisions of eminent lawyers and thirdly the institutes an explanation of the principles of roman law after thirteen centuries says a modern writer it stands unsurpassed as a treasury of legal knowledge all through the middle ages men were to look to it for inspiration thus it was on the corpus juris civilis that ecclesiastical lawyers based the canon law that gave the pope an emperor's power over the church justinian worked for the progress of the world when he codified roman law it was unfortunate that military ambition led him to exhaust his treasury and overtax his subjects in order that he might establish his rule over the whole of europe like theodosius and constantine Besides carrying on an almost continuous war with the king of Persia, he sent an army and a fleet under an able general, Belisarius, to fight against the Vandals in North Africa. And so successful was this campaign that Justinian became master of the whole coastline and even of a part of southern Spain. This gave him command of the Mediterranean, and he at once determined to overthrow the feeble descendants of Theodoric, and to restore the imperial dominion over Italy indeed, not as it had been from the time of Odoacer, merely in name. The task was not easy, for the Italians, if we have noticed, did not love the Greeks, while the Goths fought bravely for independence. At length, in the year 555, after nineteen campaigns, Narsus, an Armenian who was at the head of Justinian's forces, succeeded in crushing the barbarians and established his rule at ravenna from which city under the title of exarch he controlled the whole peninsula narsus triumph had been in a great measure due to a german tribe the lombards whose hosts he enrolled under the imperial banner these lombards longobardi or longbeards as the name originally stood had migrated from the banks of the elba to the basin of the danube and there, looking about them for a warlike outlet for their energies, were quite as willing to invade Italy at Justinian's command as to go on any other campaign that promised to be profitable. Narsus, as soon as he was assured of success, paid them liberally for their services and sent them back to their own people. But the Lombards had learned to love the sunny climate and the vines growing out of doors, and were soon discontented with their bleaker homeland. They waited, therefore, until Narcissus, whom they knew and feared, was dead, and then, under the leadership of Alboin, their king, crossed over the Alps and invaded North Italy. They did not come in such tremendous strength as the Ostrogoths in the past, nor were the imperial troops powerless to stand against them. Indeed, the two forces were so balanced that, while the Lombards succeeded in establishing themselves in the province of Lombardy, to which they gave their name, with Pavia as its capital, the representatives of the emperor still held the coastline on both sides, also Ravenna, Naples, Rome, and other principal towns. This Lombard inroad, the last of the great barbarian invasions of Italy, was by far the most important in its effects. For one thing, two hundred years were to pass before the power of the new settlers was seriously shaken, and therefore, even the fact that they were pagans and imposed their own laws ruthlessly on the Italians could not keep the races from gradually intermingling. In time, the higher civilization conquered, and the fair-haired Teutons learned to worship the Christian god, forgot their own tongue, and adopted the customs and habits they saw around them. The Italians, on their part, in the course of their struggles with the Lombards, became trained in the art of war they had almost forgotten. By the 8th century, the fusion was complete. Another very interesting and important result of the Lombard invasion was that the prolonged duel between barbarians and Greeks prevented the development of any common form of government. There might in time emerge an Italian race, but there could be no Italian nation so long as towns and provinces were dominated by rulers whose policy and ambitions were utterly opposed. 
the exarch of Ravenna claimed in the name of the emperor at Constantinople to collect taxes from and administer the whole peninsula, but in practice he often ruled merely the strip of land around his city cut off from other Greek officials by Lombard dukes. He would be able to communicate by sea with the important towns on or near the coast, such as Naples, but so irregularly that the government would tend to grow every year more independent of his control. In Rome, for instance, there was not only the Senate with its traditions of government, but the Pope, who even more than the Senate had become the protector and adviser of his fellow citizens. We have seen how Leo the Great persuaded Attila the Hun to withdraw when his armies threatened at the very gates of Rome, while later he went on a like though unavailing mission to Genseric the Vandal. It was acts like this that won recognition for the papacy amongst other rulers. And more than any of the popes before him, Gregory the Great, who ascended the chair of Peter in A.D. 590, built up the foundations of this authority. A Roman of position and wealth, Gregory had become in middle age a poor monk, giving all his money to the poor and disciplining himself by fasting and penance. He is remembered best in England today for the interest he showed in the fair-haired angles in the Roman slave market. They have angels' faces. They should be fellow heirs of the angels in heaven. His comment he followed up by a petition that he might sail as a missionary to the northern island from which these slaves came. And when instead he was sent on an embassy to Constantinople, he did not forget England in the years that passed. But after he became pope, chose St. Augustine to go and convert the heathen king of Kent. In this way, southern England was Christianized and brought into touch with the life of western Europe. A great pope, it has been said, is always a missionary pope. Gregory had the true missionary's enthusiasm, and his writings, all of them theological, bear the stamp of St. Augustine of Hippo's ardent spirit, enforced with a faith absolutely assured and unbending. Besides being instrumental in converting England, Gregory during his pontificate saw the Arian church in Spain reconciled to the Catholic, while he succeeded in winning the Lombard king to Christianity and friendship. It was little wonder that the people of Rome, who had been at war with these invaders for long years, looked up to the peacemaker not only as their spiritual father, but also as a temporal ruler. Had he not fed them when they were starving, declaring that it was thus the church should use her wealth? Had he not raised soldiers to guard the walls and sent out envoys to plead the city's cause against her enemies? There was no such practical help to be obtained from the exarchs of Ravenna, talk as they might about the glories of Constantinople. Thus Romans argued, and Gregory, who knew the real weakness of Constantinople, was able to disregard the imperial viceroys when he chose, a policy of independence followed by his successors. Since the Lombard kingdom had split up into a number of duchies, each with its own capital, Italy in the early Middle Ages tended to become a group of city-states, each jealous of its neighbors and ambitious only for local interests. This provincial influence was so strong that it has lasted into modern times. An Englishman or a Frenchman will claim his country before thinking of the particular part from which he comes, but it is more natural for an Italian to say first, I am Roman, or Neapolitan, or Florentine, as the case may be. It is only by remembering this difference that Italian history can be read aright. End of chapter 5europe in the middle ages by ierna lifford plunkett this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six the rise of the franks the historian tacitus whose description of the german tribes we have already quoted had told the people of gaul that unless these same germans were kept at bay by the roman armies on the rhine frontier they would exchange the solitude of their woods and morasses for the wealth and fertility of Gaul. The fall of Rome, he added, would be fatal to the provinces, and you would be buried in the ruins of that mighty fabric. This prophetic warning proved only too true, 
when Vandal and Visigoth, Burgundian, Hun, and Frank forced the passage of the Rhine and swept in irresistible masses across vineyards and cornfields, setting fire to those towns and fortresses that dared to offer resistance. The Vandal migration was but a meteor flash on the road to Spain and North Africa, while on the battlefield of Chalon the Huns were beaten back and carried their campaign of bloodshed to Italy, but the other three tribes succeeded in establishing formidable kingdoms in Gaul during the 5th and 6th centuries. At the head of the Visigoths rode Athalf, brother-in-law of Alaric, unanimously chosen king by the tribe on the death of that mighty warrior. Instead of continuing the campaign in South Italy, Athalf had made peace with the Emperor Honorius and married his sister, thus gaining a semi-royal position in the eyes of Roman citizens. I once aspired, he said frankly, to obliterate the name of Rome and to erect on its ruins the dominion of the Goths, but I was gradually convinced that laws are essentially necessary to maintain and regulate a well-constituted state. From that moment, I proposed to myself a different object of glory and ambition, and it is now my sincere wish that the gratitude of future ages should acknowledge the merits of a stranger who employed the sword of the Goths not to subvert but to restore and maintain the prosperity of the Roman Empire. Fortified by such sentiments and the benediction of the emperor, who was glad to free Italy from his brother-in-law's presence, Athalf succeeded, after a short struggle, in establishing a Visigothic kingdom in southern Gaul, stretching from the Mediterranean to the Bay of Biscay. This, under his successors, was enlarged until it embraced the whole of the province of Aquitania, with Toulouse as its capital, as well as both slopes of the Pyrenees. The Burgundians, another German tribe, had in the meanwhile built up a middle kingdom along the banks of the Rhone. Years of intercourse with the Romans had done much to civilize both their manners and thoughts, and they were quite prepared to respect the laws and customs that they found in Gaul, so long as they met with no serious opposition to their rule. The fact that both Burgundians and Visigoths were Arians raised, however, a fatal barrier between conquerors and conquered, and did more than anything else to determine that ultimate dominion over the whole of Gaul should be the prize of neither of these races, but of a third Teutonic tribe, the Salian Franks, whom good fortune placed beyond the influence of heresy. The Franks were a tall, fair-haired, loose-limbed people, who, emerging from Germany, had settled for a time in the country we now call Belgium. Like their ancestors, they worshipped Woden and other heathen gods of the Teutons, while in their Salic law we see much to recall the German customs described by Tacitus five centuries before. The king was no longer elected by his people, for his office had become hereditary in the house of Merovius, one of the heroes of the race. No woman, even of the Merovingian line, might succeed to the throne, nor prince whose hair had been shorn, since with the Franks flowing locks were a sign of royalty. Yet, in spite of the king's new position, the old spirit of equality had not entirely disappeared. The assembly of freemen, still held once a year, had degenerated into a military review, but the warriors thus collected could demand that the coming campaign should meet with their approval. When a battle was over and victory obtained, the lion's share of the booty did not fall to the king, but the whole was divided by lot. A great part of the Salic law was really a tariff of violent acts, with a fine that those who had committed them must pay, so much for shooting a poisoned arrow, even if it missed its mark, so much for wounding another in the head, or for cutting off his nose or his great toe, or, worst of all, for damaging his second finger so that he could no longer draw the bowstring. The underlying principle of this code was different from that of the Roman law, which set up a certain standard of right inflicting penalties on those who fell short of it. Thus, the Roman citizen who murdered or maimed his neighbor would be punished because he had dared to do what the state condemned as a crime. The Frank, in a similar case, would be fined by the judges of his tribe and the money paid as compensation to the person or the relations of the person whom he had wronged. 
the idea being not to appease the anger of the state, but to remove the resentment of the injured party. For this purpose, each Frank had his vergeld, literally his worth gold, or the sum of money at which, according to his rank, his life was valued, beginning with the nobles of the king's palace and descending in a scale to the lowest freemen. When the Franks left Belgium and advanced, conquering into northern Gaul, they also fixed vergels for their Roman subjects, but rated them at only half the value of their own race. The vergeld of a Frankish freeman was two hundred gold pieces, of a Roman only one hundred. By the beginning of the sixth century, when the Franks were well established in Gaul, the management of their important tribal affairs had passed entirely into the hands of the nobles surrounding the king. These bore such titles as Major Domus, or Mayor of the Palace, at first only a steward, but later the chief minister of the crown. The seneschal, or head of the royal household, the marshal, or master of the stables, the chamberlain, or chief servant of the bedchamber. The most famous of the Merovingian kings, as the descendant of Merovius were called, was Clovis, who established the Frankish capital at Paris. He and his tribe, though pagans, were on friendly terms with the Roman inhabitants of northern Gaul, and especially with some of the Catholic clergy. When Clovis sacked the town of Soissons, he tried to save the church plate, and especially a vase of great beauty that he knew St. Remy, Bishop of Reims, highly valued. Let it be put amongst my booty, he said to his soldiers, intending to give it to the bishop later. But one of them answered him insolently, only that is thine which falls to thy share by lot. And with his axe he shivered the vase into a thousand pieces. Clovis concealed his fury at the moment, but he did not forget. And a year afterwards, when he was reviewing his troops, he noticed the same man who had opposed his will. Stepping forward, he tore the fellow's weapons from his grasp and threw them on the ground, saying, No arms are worse cared for than thine. The soldier stooped to pick them up, and Clovis, raising his battle-axe high in the air, brought it down on the bent head before him with a comment, Thus didst thou to the vase at Soissons. Clovis married a Christian princess, Clotilda, a niece of the Burgundian king, and at her request he allowed their eldest child to be baptized. But for a long time he refused to become a Christian himself. One day, however, when in the midst of a battle in which his warriors were so hard-pressed that they had almost taken to flight, he cried aloud, Jesus Christ, thou whom Clotilda doth call the Son of the living God, I now devoutly beseech thy aid, and I promise, if thou dost give me victory over these my enemies, that I will believe in thee and be baptized in thy name, for I have called on my own gods, and they have failed to help me. Shortly afterwards, the tide of battle turned, the Franks rallied, and Clovis obtained a complete victory. Remembering his promise, he went to Reims, and there he and three thousand of his warriors were received into the Catholic Church. Bow thy head low, said St. Remy, who baptized the king. Henceforth adore that which thou hast burned, and burn that which thou didst formerly adore. When he became a Catholic, Clovis had no idea that he had altered the whole future of his race, for to him it seemed merely that he had fulfilled the bargain he had made with the Christian God. He did not change his ways, but pursued his ambitions as before, now by treachery and now by force. It was his determination to make himself supreme ruler over all the Franks, and in the case of another branch, the Ripuarians, he began by secretly persuading the heir to their kingly title, the young prince Cloderic, to kill his father and seize the royal coffers. Cloderic, fired by the idea of becoming powerful, did so and wrote exultingly to Clovis, My father is dead and his wealth is mine. Let some of thy men come hither, and that of his treasure which pleaseth them I will send thee. Ambassadors from the Salians duly arrived, and Cloderic led them secretly apart and showed them his money, running his hand through the pieces of gold that lay on the surface of the coffer. The men begged him to thrust his arm in deep that they might judge how great his wealth really was, and as he bent to do so, one of them struck him a mortal wound from behind. Then they fled. 
Thus, by treachery, died both father and son. But Clovis unblushingly denied to the Ripuarian Franks that he had been in any way responsible. Cloderic murdered his father, and he hath been assassinated by I know not whom. I am no partner in such deeds, for it is against the law to take the life of relations. Nevertheless, since it has happened, I offer you this advice, that you should put yourselves under my protection. The Ripuarian Franks were without a leader, and like all barbarians, they worshipped success. So, believing that Clovis would surely lead them to victory, they raised him on their shields and hailed him as king. Each day God struck down the enemies of Clovis under his hand, says Bishop Gregory of Tours, describing these events, and enlarged his kingdom because he went with an upright heart before the Lord and did the things that were pleasing in his sight. It is startling to find a bishop pass such a verdict on a career of treachery and murder, the more that Gregory of Tours was no cringing court flatterer, but a priest with a high sense of duty who dared, when he believed it right, to oppose some of the later Frankish kings, even at the risk of his life. Yet it must be remembered that a sense of honor was not understood by the barbarians, except in a very crude form. They believed it was clever to outwit their neighbors, while to murder them was so ordinary as to excite little or no comment, save the infliction of a vergeld if the crime could be brought home. Centuries of the civilizing influence of Christianity were needed before the men and women of these fierce tribes could accept the Christian principles of truth, justice, and mercy in anything like their real spirit. The Romans and Gaul had almost given up expecting anything but brutality from their invaders if they aroused their enmity, and therefore welcomed even the smallest sign of grace. Thus, the protection that Clovis afforded to the Catholic Church, after her years of persecution, blinded their eyes to many of his vices. When Clovis had made himself master of the greater part of northern Gaul, he determined to strike a blow at the Visigoths in the south. It pains me, he said to his followers, to see Arians in a part of Gaul. Let us march against these heretics with God's aid and gain their country for ourselves. Probably he was sincere in his dislike of heresy, but it was a politic attitude to adopt, for it meant that wherever he and his warriors marched, they would find help against the Burgundians and Visigoths amongst the Orthodox Roman population. It seemed to the latter that Clovis brought with him something of the glory of the vanished Roman Empire, kept alive by the Catholic Church, and now revived through her in this her latest champion. In a fierce battle near Poitiers, Clovis defeated the Visigoths and drove them out of Aquitaine, leaving them merely narrow strips of territory along the Mediterranean seaboard and on either slope of the Pyrenees. He also fought against the Burgundians, and though he was not so successful, reduced them temporarily to submission. When he died at the age of 45, he was master of three-quarters of Gaul and had stamped the name of his race forever on the land he had invaded. His work of conquest was continued by his successors and reached its zenith in the time of King Dagobert, who lived at the beginning of the 7th century. Dagobert has been called the French Solomon because, like the Jewish king, he was world-famed for his wisdom and riches. Not content with maintaining his power over Gaul to the west of the Rhine, he fought against the Saxon and Friesen tribes in Germany and forced them to pay tribute. At last, his empire stretched from the Atlantic to the mountains of Bohemia. The Duke of Brittany, who had hitherto remained independent of the Franks, came to offer his allegiance, while the Emperor of Constantinople sought a Frankish alliance. A chronicler of the day, speaking of Dagobert, says, quote, He was a prince terrible in his wrath toward traitors and rebels. He held the royal scepter firmly in his grasp, and like a lion he sprang upon those who would foment discord. Quote. Another account describes his journeys through his kingdom and how he administered justice with an even hand, not altogether to the joy of tyrannical landowners. His judgment struck terror into the hearts of the bishops and of the great men, but it overwhelmed the poor with joy. In the troublous years that were to come, his reign stood out in people's minds as an age of prosperity. But already, before the death of the king, this prosperity had begun to wane. 
luxury sapped the vigor of a once powerful mind and body and the authority that the french solomon relaxed in his later years through self-indulgence was never regained by his successors with a contemptuous title the sluggard kings the last rulers of the merovingian line had passed down to posterity few were endowed with any ability or even ambition to govern the majority died before they had reached manhood looking already like senile old men and the power that should have been theirs passed into the hands of the mayors of the palace who administered their domains on state occasions indeed they were still shown to their subjects as they jolted to the place of assembly in a rough cart drawn by oxen but the ceremony over they returned to their royal villas and in insignificance nothing was left to the king save the name of the king the flowing locks the long beard he sat on his throne and played at government gave audiences to envoys and dismissed them with the answers with which he had been schooled it was a situation that could only last so long as the name merovius retained its spell over the franks but the day came when the spell was broken and a race of stronger fiber the carolingians usurped the royal title the heads of this family had for generations held the office of mayor of the palace in the part of gaul between the meuse and the lower rhine then called austrasia it was their duty to administer the royal domains in this large district that is to see that the laws were obeyed to superintend the cultivation of the soil and to collect a share of the various harvests as a revenue for the king this was more important work than it may sound to modern ears for in the early middle ages the majority of people unlike men and women today lived in the country ever since the decay of the roman empire when the making of roads was neglected and then the imperial grain fleets disappeared from the mediterranean the problem of carrying merchandise and food from one part of europe to another had grown steadily more acute as commerce and industry languished towns ceased to be centers of population and became merely strongholds where the neighborhood could find refuge when attacked by its enemies people preferred to spend their ordinary life in villages in the midst of fields where they could grow corn and barley or keep their own sheep and oxen if the crops failed or their beasts were smitten by disease a whole province might suffer starvation the mayor of the palace must guard the royal domains as far as possible from the ravages of weather wolves or lawless men for the king of the franks as much as any of his subjects depended on the harvests and herds for his prosperity rather than on commerce or manufactures by the end of the seventh century the mayors of austrasia had ceased to interest themselves merely in local affairs and had begun to extend their authority over the whole of france nominally they acted in the name of the merovingian kings but once when the throne fell vacant they did not trouble to fill it for two years the franks made no protest it was to their mayors not to their kings that they now turned whether in search of good government or daring national exploits the carolingian charles martel charles the hammer was a warrior calculated to arouse their profound admiration he was a herculean warrior says an old chronicle an ever victorious prince who triumphed gloriously over other princes and kings and peoples and barbarous nations insomuch that from the slavs to the frisians and even to the spaniards and saracens there were none who rose up against him that escaped from his hand without prostrating themselves in the dust before his empire it was charles martel who saved france from falling under the yoke of the saracens a race of arabian warriors who crossing from africa at the strait of gibraltar subdued in one short campaign three-quarters of spain describing the first great victory over the gothic king rodrigo at wadalate the governor of africa wrote to his master the caliph o oh, commander of the faithful these are no common conquests they are like the meeting of the nations on the day of judgment puffed up with the glory they had gained the saracens who were followers of the prophet mohammed believed that they had only to advance for christian armies to run away and over the pyrenees they swept in large bands seizing first one stronghold on the mediterranean coast and then another 
Before this invasion, Charles Martel had been engaged in a quarrel with the Duke of Aquitaine, but now they hastily made friends and on the field of Poitiers joined their forces to stem the Saracen tide. So terrible was the battle, we are told, that over 300,000 Saracens fell before the Frankish warriors, inflexible as a block of ice. This number is almost certainly an exaggeration, and so also is the claim that the victors, by forcing the remnant of the Mohammedan army to retreat towards the Pyrenees in hasty flight, saved Europe for Christianity. Even had the decision of the battle been reversed, the Moors would have found the task of holding Spain in the years to come quite sufficient to absorb all their energies. Indeed, their attacks on Gaul were, from the first, more in the nature of gigantic raids than of invasions with a view to settlement, though at the time their ferocity made them seem of worldwide importance. Thus it was only natural that the mayor of the palace, to whom the victory was mainly due, became the hero of Christendom. The pope, who was at that time trying to defend Rome from the king of the Lombards, set to implore his aid. But Charles knew that his forces had been weakened by their struggle with the Saracens, and dared not undertake so big a campaign. Some years later, his son, Pepin the Short, 751-768, who had succeeded him, received the suggestion with a different answer. Pepin, as his nickname shows, was short in stature, but he was powerfully built, and so strong that with a single blow of his axe, he once cut off the head of a lion. Energetic and shrewd, he saw a way of turning the Pope's need of support against the Lombards to his own advantage. He therefore sent Frankish ambassadors to Rome to inquire whether it was not shameful for a land to be governed by kings who had no authority. The Pope, who was anxious to please Pepin, replied discreetly, He who possesses the authority should doubtless possess the title also. This was exactly what the mayor of the palace had expected and wished, and the rest of the story may be told in the words of the old Frankish annals for the year 751. Quote, in this year, Pepin was named King of the Franks with the sanction of the popes, and in the city of Soissons he was anointed with the holy oil and was raised to the throne after the custom of the Franks. But Childeric, who had the name of king, was shorn of his locks and sent into a monastery. End quote. The last of the Merovingians had vanished into the oblivion of a cloister, and Pepin the Carolingian was ruler of France. With the Pope's blessing, he had achieved his ambition, and fortune soon enabled him to repay his debt, mainly, as it happened, at another's expense. In the last chapter, we described the effect of the Lombard invasion of Italy and how the Teutonic race sank its roots deep in the heart of the peninsula, leaving a Greek fringe along the coast that still considered itself part of the Eastern Empire. Rome, in theory, belonged to this fringe, but in reality the popes hated the imperial authority almost as much as the aggressions of Lombard king and dukes, and struggled to free themselves from its yoke. When Pepin, his own ambition satisfied, turned his attention to the pope's affairs, the Lombards had just succeeded on overrunning the exarchate of Ravenna, the seat of the imperial government in Italy. Collecting an army, the king of the Franks crossed the Alps without encountering any opposition, marched on Pavia, the Lombard capital, and struck such terror into his enemies that, almost without fighting, they agreed to the terms that he dictated. Legally, he should have at once commanded the restoration of the exarchate to the empire, but there was no particular reason why Pepin should gratify Constantinople while he had a very strong inclination to please Rome. He therefore told the Lombards to give the exarchate to Stephen II, who was pope at that time, and this they faithfully promised to do. But, as he turned homewards, they began instead to oppress the country around Rome, preventing food from entering the city and pillaging churches. Pepin was very angry when he heard the news. Once more he descended on Italy, and this time the Lombards were compelled to keep their word, and the papacy received the first of its temporal possessions, ratified by a formal treaty that declared the exact extent of the territory and the papal rights over it. This was an important event in medieval history, for it meant that henceforward the Pope, who claimed to be the spiritual head of Christendom, 
would also be an Italian prince with recognized lands and revenues, and therefore with private ambitions concerning these. It would be his instinct to distrust any other ruler in the peninsula who might become powerful enough to deprive him of these lands, while he would always be faced, when in difficulties, by the temptation to use his spiritual power to further purely worldly ends. On the way in which popes dealt with this problem of their temporal and spiritual power, much of the future history of Europe was to depend. Pepin, in spite of his shrewdness, had no idea of the troubles he had sown by his donation. Well pleased with the generosity he had found so easy, with the title of patrician bestowed on him by the pope, and perhaps still more by the spoils that he and his Franks had collected in Lombardy, he left Italy and was soon engaged in other campaigns nearer home against the Saracens and the rebellious German tribes. In these he continued until his death in 768. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven: Europe in the Middle Ages by Irna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: Mahomet. Christianity, first preached by humble fishermen in Palestine, had become the foundation of life in medieval Europe. Some three hundred years after Constantine the Great had made this possible, another religion, Islam designed to be the rival of Christianity, was also born in the east in Arabia, a narrow strip of territory lying between the Red Sea and miles of uninhabitable desert. On the sea coast of Arabia were some harbors, inland a few fertile oases where towns of low, white stone houses and mud hovels had sprung into being. But from the very nature of the soil and climate, the Arabs were not drawn to manufacture goods or grow corn. Instead, they preferred a wanderer's life, to tend the herds of horses or sheep that ranged the peninsula in search of water and pasturage, or, if more adventurous, to guard the caravans of camels that carried the silks and spices of India to Mediterranean seaports. These caravans had their regular routes, and every merchant a band of armed men to protect his goods and drive off robbers along the way. Only in the sacred months, the time of the sowing of seeds in the spring and at the autumn harvest, were such convoys of goods safe from attack. For then, and then only, every Arab believed, according to the traditions of his forefathers, that peace was a duty, and that a curse would fall on him who dared to break it. The Arab, like all Orientals, was superstitious. He worshipped Allah, the all-supreme God, but he accepted also a variety of other gods, heavenly bodies, spirits, devils, stones, and idols. One of the most famous Arabian sanctuaries was a temple at Mecca called the Kaaba, where a black stone had been built into the wall that pilgrims would come from long distances to kiss and worship. Amongst the youths of the town who saw the ceremony, and himself took part in the religious processions, was an orphan lad, Muhammad. 576 to 632, brought up in the house of his uncle Abu Talib. Mohammed was handsome and strong. He had looked after sheep on the edge of the desert, taken part in tribal fights, and from the age of twelve wandered with caravans as far as the sea coast. What distinguished him from his companions was not his education, nor any special skill as a warrior, but his quickness of observation, his tenacious memory, and his gift for bending others to his will. Unable to read, he could only gain knowledge by word of mouth, and wherever he went, amongst the colonies of the Jews who were the chief manufacturers in the towns, or lying beside the campfires of the caravans at night, he would keep his ears open and store up in his mind all the tales that he heard. In this way, he learned of the Jewish religion and a garbled version of Christianity. Soon he knew the stories of Joseph and of Abraham and some of the sayings of Christ, and the more he thought over them, the more he grew to hate the idol worship of the Arabs around him. When he was twenty-five, Muhammad married a rich widow, Kadijah, whose caravan he had successfully steered across the desert, 
and in this way he became a man of independent means, possessing camels and horses of his own. Kadija was some years older than Muhammad, but she was a very good wife to him, and brought him not only a fortune, but a trust and a belief in his mission that he was to need sorely in the coming years. To her he confided his hatred of idol worship, and also to Abu Bakr, the wealthy son of a cloth merchant of Mecca, who had fallen under his influence. Muhammad declared that God, and later the angel Gabriel, had appeared to him in visions and had given him messages condemning the superstitions of the Arabs. There is but one God, Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. This was the chief message, received at first with contempt, but destined to be carried triumphant in the centuries to come, right to the Pyrenees and the gates of Vienna. The visions or trances during which Muhammad received his messages, afterwards collected in the sacred book, the Koran, are thought by many to have been epileptic fits. His face would turn livid, and he would cover himself with a blanket, emerging at last exhausted to deliver some command or exhortation. Later, it would seem that he could produce this state of insensibility at will and without much effort, whenever questions were asked, indeed, in answering which he required divine guidance. Much of the teaching in the Koran was based, like Judaism or Christianity, on far higher ideals than the fetish worship of the Arabs. It emphasized such things as the duty of almsgiving, the discipline that comes of fasting, the necessity of personal cleanliness, while it forbade the use of wine, declaring drunkenness a crime. With regard to the position of women, the Koran would show nothing of the chivalry that was to develop in Christendom through the respect felt by Christians for the mother of Christ and for the many women martyrs and saints who suffered during the early persecutions. Muslims were allowed by the Koran to have four wives. Muhammad permitted himself ten. And those might be divorced at their husband's pleasure without any corresponding right on their part. On the other hand, the power of holding property before denied was now secured to women, and the murder of female children that had been a practice in the peninsula was sternly abolished. As the years passed, more and more surahs or chapters were added to the Koran, but at first the Prophet's messages were few and appealed only to the poor and humble. When the Meccans, told by Abu Bakr that Muhammad was a prophet, came to demand a miracle as proof, he declared that there could be no greater miracle than the words he uttered. But this, to the prosperous merchants, seemed merely crazy nonsense. When he went farther, and, acting on what he declared was Allah's revelation, destroyed some of the local idols, contempt changed to anger. For the inhabitants argued that if the Kaaba ceased to be a sanctuary, their trade with the pilgrims who usually came to Mecca would cease. For more than eight years, while a prophet maintained his unpopular mission, his poorer followers were stoned and beaten, and he himself shunned. Perhaps it seems odd that in such a barbarous community he was not killed. But, though Arabia possessed no government in any modern sense, yet a system of tribal laws existed that went far towards preventing promiscuous murder. Each man of any importance belonged to a tribe that he was bound to support with his sword, and that in turn was responsible for his life. If he were slain, the tribe would exact vengeance or demand blood money from the murderer. Now the head of Muhammad's tribe was Abu Talib, his uncle, and though the old man refused to accept his nephew as a prophet, he would not allow him to be molested. In spite of persecution, the number of believers in Muhammad's doctrines grew, and when some of those who had been driven out of the city took refuge with the Christian king of Abyssinia and were treated by him with greater kindness than the pagan Arabs, the Meccans at home became so much alarmed that they adopted a new policy of aggression. Henceforth, both Muhammad and his followers, the hated Moslems or heathen, as they were nicknamed in the Syriac tongue, were to be outlaws and no one might trade with them or give them food. In an undisciplined community, like an Arabian town, such an order would not be strictly kept, and for three years Muhammad was able to defy the ban. But every day his position grew more precarious, 
and the sufferings of his followers from hunger and poverty increased. During this time, too, both Kadijah and Abu Talib died, and the prophet, almost overwhelmed with his misfortunes, was only kept from doubting his mission by the faith and loyalty of those who would not desert him. Weary of trying to convert Mecca, he sent messengers through Arabia to find if there were any tribe that would welcome a prophet, and at last he received an invitation to go to Yathrib. This was a larger town than Mecca, farther to the north, and was populated mainly by Jewish tribes who hated the Arabian idol worshippers and welcomed the idea of a teacher whose views were based largely on Jewish traditions. In 622, therefore, Muhammad and his followers fled secretly from Mecca to Yathrib, later called Medina, or the City of the Prophet, and this date of the Hijra or flight, when the new religion broke definitely with old Arab traditions, was taken as the first year of the Moslem calendar, just as Christians reckoned their time from the birth of Christ. Here in Medina was built the first mosque, or temple of the new faith, a faith christened by its believers Islam, a word meaning surrender, for in surrender to Allah and to the will of this prophet lay the way of salvation to the Moslem garden of paradise. So beautiful to the Arab mind were the very material luxuries and pleasures with which Muhammad entranced the imagination of believers that in later years his soldiers would fling themselves recklessly against their enemy's spears in order to gain paradise the quicker. The alternative for the unbeliever was hell, the everlasting fires of the Old Testament that so terrified the minds of medieval Christians. And between paradise and hell, there was no middle way. The Jews in Medina were, like Muhammad, worshippers of one god, but they soon showed that they were not prepared to accept this wandering Arab as Jehovah's final revelation to man. They demanded miracles, sneered at the Koran, which they declared was a parody of their own scriptures, and took advantage of the poverty of the refugees to drive hard bargains with them. At length, it became obvious that the Moslems must find some means of livelihood, or else Medina, like Mecca, must be left for more friendly soil. Pressed by circumstances, Muhammad evolved a policy that was destined to overthrow the tribal system of government in Arabia. Mention has already been made of the caravans of camels that journeyed regularly from south to north of the peninsula, bearing merchandise. Many of these caravans were owned by wealthy Meccans, whose chief trade route passed quite close by the town of Medina, and they were protected and guarded by members of the tribe of Abu Talib and of other families whose relations were serving with the Prophet. At first, when Muhammad commanded that these caravans should be attacked and looted, his followers looked aghast, for the sacredness of the tribes from attack by kinsmen was a tradition they had inherited for generations. Their prophet at once proved to them by a message from Allah that a new relationship had been formed, stronger than the ties of blood, namely the bond of faith, and that to the believer, the unbeliever, whether father or son, was accursed. In the same way, when the first marauding expeditions were unsuccessful because the caravans attacked were too well guarded, Muhammad explained the way the sacred months and chose in future at that very time for his warriors to descend upon unsuspecting merchants. The Meccans, outraged by what they somewhat naturally considered treachery, soon dispatched some thousand men determined to make an end of the prophet and his followers, and at Badr, not very far from the coast on the trade route between the two towns, this large force encountered 300 Moslems commanded by Muhammad. It is difficult to gain a clear impression of the battle, for romance and legend have rendered real details obscure. But, either by superior generalship, the valor and discipline of the Moslems as compared to the conduct of their forces, or, as was later stated, through the agency of angels sent by Allah from heaven, the vastly more numerous Meccan force was utterly put to rout. Moslems refer to the Battle of Badr as the Day of Deliverance, for though not long afterwards they in their turn were defeated by the Meccans, yet never again were they to become mere discredited refugees. 
success pays, and with the victory of Badr as a tangible miracle to satisfy would-be converts, Mahomet soon gained a large army of warriors whom his personality molded into obedience to his will. The Jews who had mocked him had soon cause to repent, for Muhammad, remembering their jibes and the petty persecution to which they had subjected his followers, adopted a definitely hostile attitude towards them. Taking advantage of the reluctance with which these Jews had shared in the defense of Medina, and in the throwing up of earthworks to protect it, when the Meccans came to besiege it in the year five of the new calendar, Muhammad, as soon as the siege was raised, obtained his revenge. Those Jews of the city who still refused to recognize him as a prophet were slaughtered, their wives and children sold into slavery. The teaching and ritual of the Koran also, once carefully based on the scriptures of Israel, began to cast off this influence, and where of old Muhammad had commanded his followers to look toward Jerusalem in their prayers, he now bade them kneel with their faces toward Mecca. In this command may be seen his new policy of conciliation toward his native town, for Muhammad recognized that in the city of Mecca lay the key to the peninsula, and he was determined to establish his power there, if not by force, then by diplomacy. After some years of negotiation, he persuaded those who had driven him into exile not so much of the truth of his teaching as of the certainty that his presence would bring more pilgrims than ever before to visit the shrine of Kaaba. In AD 630, he entered Mecca in triumph, and the worship of Islam was established in the heart of Arabia. As a concession to the Meccans, divine revelation announced that the sacred black stone built into the temple wall had been hallowed by Abraham, and was therefore worthy of veneration. Instead of a general scheme of revenge, only two of Mahavat's enemies were put to death, and it is well to remember that, judged by the standards of his age and race, the prophet was no lover of cruelty. In his teaching, he condemned the use of torture, and throughout his life he was nearly always ready to treat with his foes rather than slay them. Those amongst his enemies who refused him recognition as a prophet, while willing to acknowledge him as a ruler, were usually allowed to live in peace on the payment of a yearly ransom divided amongst the believers. But in cases where he had met with an obstinate refusal or persistent treachery, as from the Jews of Medina, Muhammad would put whole tribes to the sword. In 632, the prophet of Islam died, leaving a group of Arabian tribes bound far more securely together by the faith he had taught them than they could have been by the succession of any royal house. Though Muhammad is dead, yet is Muhammad's God not dead. While Muhammad was still in exile at Medina, it is evident that he already contemplated the idea of gaining the world for Islam. Let there be in you a nation summoning unto good, says the Quran, and in token of this mission, the prophet, in the years following his Arabian victories, sent letters to foreign rulers to announce his ambition. Here is one to the chief of the Copts, a Christian race living in Egypt. Quote, in the name of Allah the Merciful, from the Apostle of Allah to chief of the Copts, peace be upon him who follows the guidance. Next I summon thee with the appeal to Islam. Become a Moslem and thou shalt be safe. God shall give thee thy reward twofold. But if thou decline, then on thee is the guilt of the cops. O ye people of the book, come unto an equal arrangement between us and you, that we should serve none save God, associating nothing with him, and not taking one another for lords besides God. And if ye decline, then bear witness that we are Moslems. End quote. Similar letters were sent to Chosroes, king of Persia, and to Heraclius, the Christian emperor at Constantinople. The former tore the letter in pieces contemptuously, for at that time his kingdom extended over the greater part of Asia. Jerusalem, once the pride of the Eastern Empire, had fallen into his grasp, while his armies were besieging Constantinople itself. A letter that he himself penned to the Christian emperor shows his overweening pride and the depths into which Byzantium had fallen in the public regard. 
quote, Chosros, greatest of the gods and master of the whole earth, to Heraclius, his vile and insensate slave. Why do you still refuse to submit to our rule and call yourself a king? Have I not destroyed the Greeks? You say that you trust in your god. Why has he not delivered out of my hand Caesarea, Jerusalem, Alexandria? And shall I not also destroy Constantinople? But I will pardon your faults if you will submit to me, and come hither with your wife and children, and I will give you lands, vineyards, and olive groves, and look upon you with a kindly aspect. Do not deceive yourself with vain hope in that Christ, who was not even able to save himself from the Jews, who killed him by nailing him to a cross. Even if you take refuge in the depths of the sea, I shall stretch out my hand and take you, so that you shall see me whether you will or no. End quote. Christendom was fortunate in Heraclius. Instead of contemplating either despair or surrender, he called upon the church to summon all Christians to his aid, and by means of the gold and silver plate presented to him as a war loan by the bishops and clergy, and in command of a large army of volunteers, he beat back the Persians from the very gates of his capital. Not content with a policy of defense, he next invaded Asia and at the Battle of Nineveh utterly destroyed the hosts of Chosros. The fallen king, deposed by his subjects, was forced to take refuge in the mountains and later was thrown into a dungeon where he died of cold and starvation. Had the reign of Heraclius ended at this date, it would be remembered as a glorious era in the history of Constantinople. But, unfortunately for his fame, another foe was to make much more lasting inroads on his empire, already weakened by the Persian occupation. When the emperor, 610 to 641, like Chosros, received Mahomet's letter, he is said to have read it with polite interest. It seemed to him that this fanatic Arab, who hated Jews as much as the Christians did, might turn his successful sword not only against them, but against the Persians. In this surmise, Heraclius was right, for under Abu Bakr, now caliph, or successor of Muhammad, since a prophet had left no son, the Moslems invaded Persia. Unfortunately for Heraclius, they were equally bent on an aggressive campaign against the Christian Empire. There is but one God, Allah. With this test, and by which they could distinguish friend from foe, the Arab hosts burst through the gate of Syria, and at Yermuk encountered the imperial army sent by Heraclius to oppose them. The Greeks fought so stubbornly that, at first, it seemed that their disciplined valor must win. Is not paradise before you? Are not hell and Satan behind? cried the Arab leader to his fanatical hordes. And in response to his words, they rallied, broke the opposing lines by the sudden ferocity of their charge, and finally drove the imperial troops in headlong flight. After the Battle of Yermuk, Syria fell and Palestine was invaded. In 637, Jerusalem became a Moslem town, with a mosque standing where once had been the famous Temple of Solomon. Muhammad had declared Jerusalem a sanctuary only second in glory to Mecca, and his followers, with a toleration strange in that age, left under Christian guardianship the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre and other sacred sites. After Syria, Palestine. After Palestine, Egypt and the North African coastline. The dying Heraclius heard nothing but the bitter news of disaster, and after his death the quarrels of his descendants increased the feebleness of Christian resistance. A spirit of unity might have carried the Moslem banners to the limits of the Eastern Empire, but in 656 the Caliph Othman was murdered, and the civil war that ensued enabled the Christian emperor, Constans II, to negotiate peace. He had lost Tripoli, Syria, Egypt, and the greater part of Armenia to his foes, who had also succeeded in establishing a naval base in the Mediterranean that threatened the islands of Greece herself. In the north, his borders were overrun by Bulgar and Slav tribes, while in Italy, the Lombards maintained a perpetual struggle against his viceroy, the Exarch of Ravenna. Constans himself spent six years in Italy, the greater part in campaigns against the Lombards. He even visited Rome, 
but earned hatred there as elsewhere by his ruthless pillage of the west for the benefit of the east thus the pantheon was stripped of its golden tiles to enrich constantinople and the churches of south italy were robbed of their plate to pay for his wars at last a conspiracy was formed against him and while enjoying the baths at syracuse one of his servants struck him on the head with a marble soap-box and fractured his skull constans had been a brave and resolute emperor of considerable military ability his son constantine poganatus or the bearded inherited his gifts and drove back the mohammedans from constantinople with so great a loss of men and prestige that the caliph promised to pay a large sum of money as tribute every year in return for peace constantine poganatus died when a comparatively young man and was succeeded by his son justinian ii a lad of seventeen arrogant cruel and restless without any reason save ambition he picked a quarrel with a moslem caliph marched a large army across his eastern border and when he met with defeat proceeded in his rage to execute his generals and soldiers declaring that they had failed him at home in constantinople his ministers tortured the inhabitants in order to extract money for his treasury and filled the imperial dungeons with senators and men of rank suspected of disloyalty such a state of affairs could not last and the emperor who treated his friends as badly as his foes was captured by one of his own generals and after having his nose cruelly slit was exiled to the crimea mutilation was supposed to be a final bar to the right of wearing the imperial crown but justinian the two was a type of man to be ignored only when dead after some years of brooding over his wrongs he fled from the crimea and took refuge with the king of the bulgars on his sea journey a terrific storm arose that threatened to overwhelm both him and his crew my lord exclaimed one of his attendants i pray you make a vow to god that if he spare you you will also spare your enemies may god sink this vessel here and now reported his master if i spare a single one of them that falls into my hands and the words were an ill omen for his reign that began once more in seven o five when with the aid of bulgar troops and of treachery within the capital justinian too established himself once more in constantinople during six years the empire suffered his tyranny anew and those who had previously helped to dethrone him were hunted down tortured and put to death like nero of old he burned alive his political enemies or he would order the nobles of his court who had offended him to be sewn up in sacks and thrown into the sea at last another rebellion brought a final end to his reign and that of the house of heraclitus for both he and his young son were murdered and the eastern empire given up to anarchy the man who did the most to save constantinople from the next mohammedan invasion was one of the military governors of the emperor called leo the Isaurian. conscious of his own ability he took advantage of his first successes to seize the imperial crown and then having heard that the mohammedan fleet was moored off the shores of asia minor he secretly sent a squadron of his own vessels that set the enemy's ships on fire in the panic that ensued more than half the arabian ships were sunk about the same time a mohammedan land force was also defeated by the king of the bulgars who had allied himself with the emperor on account of their mutual dread of an eastern invasion the result of these combined christian victories was that the caliph Mosulman, whose main forces were encamped beneath the walls of constantinople grew alarmed lest he should be cut off from support and provisions he therefore raised the siege embarking his army and what remained of his fleet and retreated to his own kingdom leaving the christian capital free from acute danger from the east for another three hundred years elsewhere the mohammedans pursued their triumphant progress with little check after the fall of carthage in six ninety seven north africa lay almost undefended before them and the half savage tribes such as the berbers who lived on the borders of the desert welcomed the new faith with its mission of conversion by the sword and prospects of plunder it was the berbers who at the invitation according to tradition of a treacherous spanish governor count julian 
crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and descended on the plains of Andalusia. Spain, when the power of the Roman Empire snapped, had been invaded first by Vandals and then by Visigoths. The Vandals, if we have seen, passed on to Africa, while the Visigoths, like the Lombards in Italy, became converted to Christianity and, falling under the influence of the civilization and luxury they saw all around them, gradually adapted their government, laws, and way of life to the system and ideals of those whom they had conquered. Thus, their famous Lex Visigothorum, or Law of the Visigoths, was in reality the Roman Code remodeled to suit the German settlers. In this new land, the descendants of the once warlike Teutons acquired an indifference to the art of war, and when their king Rodrigo had been killed at the disastrous battle of Guadalete and his army overthrown, they made little further resistance to the Saracen hordes except in the far northern mountains of the Asturias. From France, we have seen the Mohammedans were beaten back by Charles Martel, and here, established in Spain and on the borders of the Eastern Empire, we must leave their fortunes for the time. If Mohammed's life is short and can be quickly told, the story of how his followers attempted to establish their rule over Christendom is nothing else than the history of the foreign policy of Europe during medieval times. End of chapter 7「Chapter Eight of Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight Charlemagne. Just before his death, Pepin the Short had divided his lands between his two sons, Charles, who was about twenty six, and Carloman, a youth some years younger. As they had no affection for each other, this division did not work well. Carloman gave little promise of statesmanlike qualities. He was peevish and jealous and easily persuaded by the nobles who surrounded him that his elder brother was a rival who intended to rob him of his possessions, it might be, of his life. There seems to have been no ground for this suspicion, but nevertheless he spent his days in trying to hinder whatever schemes Charles proposed, and when he died three years later, there was a general breath of relief. Enumerating the blessings that heaven had bestowed on Charlemagne, a monk writing to the king about this time, completed his list with a candid statement, the fifth, and not least, that God has removed your brother from this earthly kingdom. Charlemagne was exactly the kind of person to seize the fancy of the early Middle Ages. Tall and well-built, with an eagle nose and eyes that flashed like a lion when he was angry, so that none dared to meet their gaze, he excelled all his court in strength, energy, and skill. He could straighten out with his fingers four horseshoes locked together, lift a warrior fully equipped for battle to the level of his shoulder, and fell a horse and its rider with a single blow. It was his delight to keep up old national customs and to wear the Frankish dress with its linen tunic, cross-guarded leggings, and long mantle reaching to the feet. What is the use of these rags, he once inquired contemptuously of his courtiers, pointing to their short cloaks. Will they cover me in bed or shield me from the wind and rain when I ride abroad? This criticism was characteristic of the king. Intent on a multitude of schemes for the extension or improvement of his lands, and so eager to realize him that he would start on fresh ones when still heavily encumbered with the old, he was yet, for all his enthusiasm, no vague dreamer, but a level-headed man looking questions in the face and demanding a practical answer. By the irony of fate, it is the least practical and most important task he undertook that has made his name world famous. For the story of Charlemagne and his paladins, told in the greatest of medieval epics, the Chanson de Roland, exceeds today in popularity even the exploits of Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. This much is history, that Charlemagne, invited secretly by some discontented demurs to evade Spain and attack the Caliph of Cordova, crossed the Pyrenees, and, after reducing several towns successfully, was forced to retreat. 
On his way back across the mountains, his rear guard was cut off by Gascon mountaineers and slaughtered almost to a man, while he and the rest of his army escaped with difficulty. On this meager and rather inglorious foundation, poets of the 11th century based a cycle of romance. Charlemagne is the central figure, but round him are grouped numerous paladins or famous knights, including the inseparable friends Oliver and Roland, warden of the Breton marches. After numerous deeds of glory in the land of Spain, the king, it was said, was forced by treachery to turn back towards the French mountains, and he had already passed the summits when Roland, in charge of the rear guard, found himself entrapped in the pass of Roncevaux by a large force of Gascons. His horn was slung at his side, but he disdained to summon help from those in the van, and drawing his good sword Durenda, laid about him valiantly. The Gascons fell back, dismayed by the vigorous resistance of the French, but 30,000 Saracens came to their aid, and the odds were now overwhelming. Oliver lay dead, and, covered with wounds, Roland fell to the ground also, but first of all he broke Durenda in half, that none save he might use this peerless blade. Putting his horn to his lips, with his dying breath he sounded a blast that was heard by Charlemagne in his camp more than eight miles away. Surely that is the horn of Roland, cried the king uneasily. But treacherous courtiers explained away the sound, and it was not till a breathless messenger came with the news of the reverse that he hastened toward the scene of the battle. There, in the pass, stretched on the ground amid the heaped-up bodies of their enemies, he found his paladins, Roland with his arms spread in the form of a cross, his broken sword beside him, and seeing him, the king fell on his knees, weeping. O oh, right arm of thy sovereign's body, honor of the Franks, sword of justice, why did I leave thee here to perish? How can I behold you dead and not die with thee? At last, restraining his grief, Charlemagne gathered his forces together, and the very sun, we are told, stood still to watch his terrible vengeance on Gascons and Saracens for the slaughter of Christians at Roncevaux. The Chanson de Roland is one of the masterpieces of French literature. It is not history, but in its fiction lies the substantial germ of truth. Charlemagne in the early ninth century was what poets described him more than two hundred years later, the central figure in Christendom, the recognized champion of the cross, whether against Mohammedans or pagans. Through your prosperity, wrote Alcuin, an Anglo-Saxon monk and scholar who lived at his court, Christendom is preserved, the Catholic faith defended, the law of justice made known to all men. When the popes sought help against the Lombards, it was to Charlemagne, as to his father Pepin, that they naturally turned. Charlemagne had hoped at the beginning of his reign to maintain a friendship with King Didier of Lombardy, and had even married his daughter, an alliance that roused the Pope at that date to demand in somewhat violent language, Do you not know that all children of the Lombards are lepers, that the race is outcast from the family of nations? For these there is neither part nor lot in the heavenly kingdom. May they broil with the devil and his angels in everlasting fire. Charlemagne went his own way, in spite of the papal denunciations, but he soon tired of his bride, who was plain and feeble in health, and divorced her that he might marry a beautiful German princess. This was, of course, a direct insult to King Didier, who henceforth regarded the Frankish king as his enemy, and Rome took care that the gulf, once made between the sovereigns, should not be bridged. In papal eyes, the Lombards had really become accursed. It is true that they had been, since the days of Gregory the Great, Orthodox Catholics, that their churches were some of the most beautiful in Italy, their monasteries the most famous for learning, and Pavia, their capital, a center for students and men of letters. Their sin did not lie in heretical views, but in the position of their kingdom that now included not only modern Lombardy in the north, but also the Duchy of Spoletum in South Italy. Between stretched the papal dominions like a broad wall from Ravenna to the western Mediterranean, 
and on either side the Lombards chafed, trying to annex a piece of land here or a city there, while the popes watched them, lynx-eyed, eager on their part to dispossess such dangerous neighbors, but unable to do so without assistance from beyond the Alps. Soon after the death of his younger brother, Charlemagne was persuaded to take up the papal cause and invade Italy. At Geneva, where he held the Mayfield or annual military review of his troops, he laid the object of his campaign before them and was answered by their shouts of approval. It was a formidable host, for the Franks expected every man who owned land in their dominions to appear at these gatherings prepared for war. The rich would be mounted, protected by mail shirts and iron headpieces and armed with sword and dagger. The poor would come on foot, some with bows and arrows, others with lance and shield, and the humblest of all with merely scythes or wooden clubs. Tenants on the royal domains must bring with them all the free men on their estates, and while it was possible to obtain exemption, the fine demanded was so heavy that few could pay it. When the army set out in battle array, it was accompanied by numerous baggage carts, lumbering wagons covered with leather awnings that contained enough food for three months, as well as extra clothes and weapons. It was the general hope that on the return journey the wagons would be filled to overflowing with the spoils of the conquered enemy. The Lombards had ceased, with the growth of luxury and comfortable town life, to be warriors like the Franks, and Charlemagne met with almost as little resistance as Pepin in past campaigns. After a vain attempt to hold the western passes of the Alps, Didier and his army fled to Pavia, where they fortified themselves leaving the rest of the country at the mercy of the invaders. Frankish chroniclers in later years drew a realistic picture of Didier, crouching in one of the high towers of the city, awaiting in trembling suspense the coming of the terrible Charles. Beside him stood Otger, a Frankish duke, who had been a follower of the dead Carloman and was therefore hostile to his elder brother. Is Charles in that great host? demanded the king continually, as first a long line of baggage wagons came winding across the plain, and then an army of the common folk, and after them the bishops with their train of abbots and clerks. Every time his companion answered him, No, not yet. Then Didier hated the light of day. He stammered and sobbed and said, Let us go down and hide in the earth from so terrible a foe and Otger, too, was afraid. Well, he knew the might and wrath of the peerless Charles. In his better days, he had often been at court, and he said, When you see the plain bristle with harvest of spears and rivers of black steel come pouring in on your city walls, then you may look for the coming of Charles. While he yet spoke, a black cloud arose in the west, and the glorious daylight was turned to darkness. The emperor came on, a dawn of spears darker than night rose on the beleaguered city. King Charles, that man of iron, appeared. Iron his helmet, iron his arm guards, iron the corselet on his breast and shoulders. His left hand grasped an iron lance. Iron the spirit, iron the hue of his war steed. Before, behind, and at his side rode men arrayed in the same guise. Iron filled the plain and open spaces. Iron points flashed back the sunlight. There is the man whom you would see, said Otger to the king, and so saying he swooned away like one dead. In spite of this picture of Carolingian might, it took the Franks six months to reduce Pavia, and then Didier, at last surrendering, was sent to a monastery, while Charlemagne proclaimed himself king of the newly acquired territories. During the siege, leaving capable generals to conduct it, he himself had gone to Rome, where he was received with feasting and joy. Crowds of citizens came out of the gates to welcome him, carrying palms and olive branches, and hailing him as patrician and defender of the church. Dismounting from his horse, he passed on foot through the streets of Rome to the cathedral, and there, in the manner of the ordinary pilgrim, climbed the steps on his knees until the Pope, awaiting him at the top, raised and embraced him. From the choir arose the exultant shout, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. A few days later, once more standing in St. Peter's, 
Charlemagne affixed his seal to the donation Pepin had given to the church. The document was entered amongst the papal archives, but it has long since disappeared, and with it the exact information as to the territory's concern. About this time, the papal court produced another document, the so-called Donation of Constantine, in which the first of the Christian emperors apparently granted to the popes the western half of the Roman Empire. Centuries later, this was proved to be a forgery, but for a long while, people accepted it as genuine, and the power of the popes was greatly increased. We do not know how much Charles believed in papal supremacy in temporal matters, but throughout his reign, his attitude to the pope over Italian affairs was rather that of master to servant than the reverse. It was only when spiritual questions were under discussion that he was prepared to yield as if to a higher authority. When he had reduced Pavia, Charlemagne left Lombardy to be ruled by one of his sons and returned to France. But it was not very long before he was called back to Italy as fresh trouble had arisen there. The cause was the unpopularity of Pope Leo III in Rome and the surrounding country where turbulent nobles rebelled as often as they could against the papal government. One day, as Leo was riding through the city at the head of a religious procession, a band of armed men rushed out from a side street, separated him from his attendants, dragged him from his horse, and beat him mercilessly, leaving him half dead. It was even said that they put out his eyes and cut off his tongue, but that these were later restored by a miracle. Leo, at any rate whole, though shaken, succeeded in reaching Charlemagne's presence, and the king was faced by the problem of going to Rome to restore order. Had it been merely a matter of exacting vengeance, he would have found little difficulty with his army of stalwart Franks behind him but Leo's enemies were not slow in bringing forward accusations against their victim that they claimed justified their assault. Charlemagne was thus in an awkward position, for he was too honest a ruler to refuse to hear both sides, and his respect for the papal office could not blind him to the possibility of evil in the acts of the person who held it, especially in the case of an ambitious statesman like Leo III. He felt that it was his duty to sift the matter to the bottom. And yet, by what law could the king of France, or even of Italy, put Christ's vice-regent upon his trial and cross-examine him? One way of dealing with this problem would have been to seek judgment at Constantinople as the seat of empire, a final appeal unto Caesar, such as St. Paul had made in classical times. But, ever since Pepin the Short had given the exarchate of Ravenna to the Pope, instead of restoring it to the Byzantine emperors, relations with the East, never cordial, had grown more strained. Now they were at a breaking point. The late emperor, a mere boy, had been thrown into a dungeon and blinded by his mother, the Empress Irene, in order that she might usurp his throne and the Western Empire recoiled from the idea of accepting such a woman as arbiter of their destinies. Thus, Charlemagne, forced to act on his own responsibility, examined the evidence laid before him, and declared Leo innocent of the crimes of which he had been accused. In one sense, it was a complete triumph for the Pope, but Leo was a clear-sighted statesman and knew that the power to which he had been restored rested on a weak foundation. The very fact that he had been compelled to appeal for justice to a temporal sovereign lowered the office that he held in the eyes of the world, and he possessed no guarantee that, once the Franks had left Rome, his enemies would not again attack him. Without a recognized champion, always ready to enforce her will, the papacy remained at the mercy of those who chose to oppose or hinder her. In the dramatic scene that took place in St. Peter's Cathedral on Christmas Day, A.D. 800, Leo found a way out of his difficulties. Arrayed in glorious vestments, he said mass before the high altar, lit by a thousand candles hanging at the arched entrance to the chancel. In the half-gloom beyond knelt Charlemagne and his sons, and at the end of the service, Leo, approaching them with a golden crown in his hands, placed it upon the king's head. Instantly, 
the congregation burst into the cry with which Roman emperors of old had been acclaimed at their accession. To Charles Augustus, crowned of God, the great and pacific emperor, long life and victory. From that time, says a Frankish chronicle, commenting on the scene, there was no more a Roman Empire at Constantinople. Leo had found his champion, and in anointing and crowning him, had emphasized the dignity of his own office. He had also pleased the citizens of Rome, who rejoiced to have an emperor again after the lapse of more than three centuries. Charlemagne alone was doubtful of the greatness that had been thrust upon him, and he accepted it with reluctance. He had troubles enough near home without embroiling himself with Constantinople. But, as it turned out, the Eastern Empire was too busy deposing the Empress Irene to object actively to its rejection in the West, and Irene's successors agreed to acknowledge the imperial rank of their rival in return for the cession of certain coveted lands on the Eastern Adriatic. Other sovereigns hastened to pay their respects to the new emperor. Charlemagne received several embassies in search of alliance from Harun al-Rashid, the Caliph of Baghdad. Harun al-Rashid ruled over a mighty empire stretching from Persia to Egypt and thence along North African coast to the Strait of Gibraltar. On one occasion, he sent Charlemagne a present of a wonderful water clock that, as it struck the hour of twelve, opened as many windows through which armed horsemen rode forth and back again. Far more exciting in Western eyes was the unhappy elephant that for nine years remained the glory of the imperial court at Aachen. Its death, when they were about to lead it forth on an expedition against the northern tribes of Germany, is noted sadly in the national annals. Rulers less fortunate than Harun al-Rashid sought not so much the friendship of the Western emperor as his protection, and through his influence, exiled kings of Wessex and Northumberland were able to recover their thrones. The most significant tribute of all to the honor in which Charlemagne's name was held was the petition of the Patriarch of Jerusalem that he would come and rescue Christ's city from the infidel. The message was accompanied by a banner and the keys of the Holy Sepulchre. But Charlemagne, though deeply moved by such a call to the defense of Christendom, knew that the campaign was beyond his power and put it from him. Were there not infidels to be subdued within the boundaries of his own empire, fierce Saxon tribes that year after year made mock both of the sovereignty of the Franks and of their religion? The Saxons lived amongst the range of low hills between the Rhine and the Elba. By the end of the 8th century, when other Teutonic races such as the Franks and the Bavarians had yielded to the civilizing influence of Christianity, they still cherished their old beliefs in the gods of nature and offered sacrifices to spirits dwelling in groves and fountains. The chief object of their worship was a huge tree trunk that they kept hidden in the heart of a forest, their priests declaring that the whole heavens rested upon it. This ermensul, or all-supporting pillar, was the bond between one group of Saxons and another that led them to rally round their chiefs when any foreign army appeared on their soil. Though, if at peace with the rest of the world, they would fight amongst themselves for sheer love of battle. A part of the Saxon race had settled in the island of Britain when the Roman authority weakened at the breakup of the empire and amongst the descendants of these settlers were some Christian priests who determined to carry the gospel to the heathen tribes of Germany, men and women of their own race, but still living in spiritual darkness. The most famous of these missionaries was St. Winifrith, or St. Boniface, according to the Latin version of his name. It means, he who brings peace. About the time that Charles Martel was Duke of the Franks, Boniface arrived in Germany and began to travel from one part of the country to the other, explaining the gospel of Christ and persuading those whom he converted to build churches and monasteries. When he went to Rome to give an account of his work, the Pope made him a bishop and sent him to preach in the Duchy of Bavaria. Later, as his influence increased and he gathered disciples around him, he was able to found not only parish churches but bishoprics, with a central archbishopric at mine. 
Thus, long before Germany became a nation, she possessed a church with an organized government that belonged not to one, but to all of her provinces. Only in the north and far east of Germany, heathenism still held sway, and St. Boniface, after he had gone at the Pope's wish to help the Franks reform their church, determined to make one last effort to complete his missionary work in the land he had chosen as his own. He was now sixty-five, but nothing daunted by the hardships and dangers of the task before him, he set off with a few disciples to Friesland and began to preach to the wild pagan tribes who lived there. Before he could gain a hearing, however, he was attacked and, refusing to defend himself, was put to death. Thus passed away the Apostle of Germany, and with him much of the kindliness of his message. Christianity was to come indeed to these northern tribes, but through violence and the sword, rather than by the influence of a gentle life. Charlemagne had a sincere love of the Catholic faith, whose champion he believed himself, but he considered that only folly and obstinacy could blind men's eyes to the truth of Christianity and he was determined to enforce its doctrines, by the sword if necessary. The Saxons, on the other hand, though if they were beaten in battle they might yield for a time and might promise to pay tribute to the Franks and build churches, remained heathens at heart. When an opportunity occurred, and they learned that the greater part of the Frankish army was in Italy or on the Spanish border, they would sally forth across their boundaries and drive out or kill the missionaries. Charlemagne knew that he could have no peace within his empire until he had subdued the Saxons, but the task he had set himself was harder than he had imagined, and it was thirty-eight years before he could claim that he had succeeded. The final conquest of the Saxons, says Egenhard, a scholar who lived at Charlemagne's court and wrote his life, would have been accomplished sooner but for their treachery. It is hard to tell how often they broke faith surrendering to the king and accepting his terms, and then breaking out into wild rebellion once more. Egenhard continues that Charlemagne's method was never to allow a revolt to remain unpunished, but to set out at once with an army and exact vengeance. On one of these campaigns, he succeeded in reaching the forest where the sacred trunk Ermensul was kept, and set fire to it and destroyed it. But the Saxons, though disheartened for the moment, soon rallied under the banner of a famous chief called Wittekind. We know little of the latter except his undaunted courage that made him refuse for many years to submit to a foe so much stronger that he must obviously gain the final victory. Charlemagne, exasperated by the repeated opposition, used every means to forward his aim. Sometimes he would bribe separate chieftains to betray their side, but often he would employ methods of deliberate cruelty in order to strike terror into his foes. 4,500 Saxons who had started a rebellion were once cut off and captured by the Franks. They pleaded that Wittekind, who had escaped into Denmark, had prompted them to act against their better judgment. If Wittekind is not here, you must pay the penalty in his stead, returned the king relentlessly, and the whole number were put to the sword. At different times he transplanted hundreds of Saxman households into the heart of France, and in the place of this great multitude, as the chronicle describes them, he established Frankish garrisons. He also sent missionaries to build churches in the conquered territories and compel the inhabitants to become Christians. Often the bishops and priests thus sent would have to fly before a sudden raid of heathen Saxons hiding in the neighboring forests and marshes, and lacking the courage of St. Boniface. A few would hesitate to return when the danger was suppressed. "'What ought I to do?' cried one of the most timid, appealing to Charlemagne. "'In Christ's name go back to thy diocese,' was the stern answer." While the king expected the same obedience and devotion from church officials as from captains in his army, he took care that they should not lack his support in the work he had set them to do. If any man among the Saxons, being not yet baptized, shall hide himself and refuse to come to baptism, let him die the death. 
If any man despise the Lenten feast for contempt of Christianity, let him die the death. Let all men, whether nobles, free, or serfs, give to the churches and the priests the tenth part of their substance and labor. These capitularies, or laws, show that Charlemagne was still half a barbarian at heart and matched pagan savagery with a severity more ruthless because it was more calculating. In the end, Wittekind himself, in spite of his courage, was forced to surrender and accept baptism, and gradually the whole of Saxony fell under the Frankish yoke. The Duchy of Bavaria, that had been Christian for many years, did not offer nearly so stubborn a resistance, and after he had reduced both it and Saxony to submission, Charlemagne was ruler not merely in name, but in reality of an empire that included France, the modern Holland and Belgium, Germany, and the greater part of Italy. Some of the conquests he had made were to fall away, but Germany, that had suffered most at his hands, emerged in the end the greatest achievement of his foreign wars. He swept away the black deceitful night and taught our race to know the only light, wrote a Saxon monk of the ninth century, showing that already some of the bitterness had vanished. In a few generations, says a modern writer, the Saxons were conspicuous for their loyalty to the faith. No story of Charlemagne would be true to life that admitted his harsh dealings with his Saxon foe. And yet it would be equally unfair to paint him as only a warrior, mercilessly exterminating all who opposed him in barbaric fashion. Far more than a conqueror, he was an empire builder to whom war was not an end in itself, as it was to his Frankish forefathers, but a means toward the safeguarding of his realm. The forts and outworks that he planted along his boundaries, the churches that he built in the midst of hostile territory, belonged indeed to his policy of inspiring terror and awe, but Charlemagne had also other designs only in part of a military nature. Roads and bridges that should make a network of communication across the empire, acting like channels of civilization in assisting transport and encouraging trade and intercourse, royal palaces that should become centers of justice for the surrounding country, monasteries that should shed the light of knowledge and of faith. All of these form part of his dream of a Roman Empire brought back to her old stately life and power. A canal joining the Rhine and Danube, and thus making a continuous waterway between east and west, was planned and even begun, but it had to wait till modern times for its completion. Charlemagne possessed the vision and enterprise that did not quail before big undertakings, but he lacked the money and labor necessary for carrying them out. Unlike the Roman emperors of classic times, he had no treasury on whose taxes he could draw, but depended, save for certain rents, on the revenues of his private estates that were usually paid in kind, that is to say, not in coin, but the raid of so many head of cattle or so much milk, corn, or barley, according to the means of the tenant. Of these supplies he kept a careful account, even to the number of hens on the royal farms and the quantity of eggs that they laid. Yet, at their greatest extent, revenues in kind could do little more than satisfy the daily needs of the palace. The chief debt that the Frankish nation owed to the state was not financial but military, the obligation of service in the field laid on every freeman. As the empire increased in size, this became so irksome that the system was somewhat modified. In future, men who possessed less than a certain quantity of land might join together and pay one or two of their number according to the size of their joint properties to represent them in the army abroad, while the rest remained at home to see to the cultivation of the crops. Charlemagne was very anxious to raise a body of laborers from each district to assist in his building schemes, but this suggestion awoke a storm of indignation. Landowners maintained that they were only required by law to repair the roads and bridges in their own neighborhood, not to put their tenants at the disposal of the emperor, that he might send them at his whim from Aquitaine to Bavaria or from Austria to Lombardy. And in the face of this opposition, many of his designs ceased abruptly from lack of labor. A royal palace and cathedral 
adorned with columns and mosaics from Ravenna, were, however, completed at Aachen. And here Charlemagne established his principal residence and gathered his court around him. The life of this new Rome, as he loved to call it, was simple in the extreme, for the emperor, like a true Frank, hated unnecessary ostentation and ceremony. When the chief nobles and officials assembled twice a year in the spring and autumn to debate on public matters, he would receive them in person, thanking them for the gifts they had brought him, and walking up and down amongst them to jest with one and ask questions of another with an informality that would have scandalized the court at Constantinople. In this easy intercourse between sovereign and subject, lay the secret of Charlemagne's personal magnetism. To warriors and churchmen, as to officials and the ordinary freemen of his domains, he was not some far-removed authority, who could be approached only through a maze of court intrigue, but a man like themselves with virtues and failings they could understand. If his temper was hasty and terrible when roused, it would soon melt away into a genial humor that appreciated to the full the rough practical jokes in which the age delighted. The chronicles tell us, with much satisfaction, how Charlemagne once persuaded a Jew to offer a vainglorious bishop, ever fond of vanities, a painted mouse that he pretended he had brought back straight from Judea. The bishop at first declined to give more than three pounds for such a treasure, but, deceived by the Jew's prompt refusal to part with it for so paltry a sum, consented at length to hand over a bushel of silver in exchange. The emperor, hearing this, gathered the rest of the bishops at his court together. See what one of you has paid for a mouse, he exclaimed gleefully. And we may be sure that the story did not stop at the royal presence, but spread throughout the country where haughty ecclesiastics were looked on with little favor. We are told that Charlemagne loved to bombard the people he met, from the Pope downwards, with difficult questions but it was not merely a malicious desire to bring them to confusion that prompted his inquiries. Alert himself and keenly interested in whatever business he had in hand, he despised slipshod or inefficient knowledge. He expected a bishop to be an authority on theology, an official to be an expert on methods of government, a scholar to be well grounded in the ordinary sciences of his day. Hard work was the surest road to his favor and he spared neither himself nor those who entered his service. Even at night, he would place writing materials beneath his pillow that if he woke or thought of anything, it might be noted down. On one occasion, he visited the palace school that he had founded and discovered that while boys of humble birth were making the most of their opportunities, the sons of the nobles, despising book learning, had frittered away their time. Commending those who had done well, the emperor turned to the others with an angry frown. Relying on your birth and wealth, he exclaimed, and caring nothing for our commands and your own improvement, you have neglected the study of letters and have indulged yourself in pleasures and idleness. By the king of heaven, I care little for your noble birth. Know this, unless straightway you make up for your former negligence by earnest study, you need never expect any favor from the hand of Charles. It was with the wealthy nobles and landowners that Charlemagne fought some of his hardest battles, though no sword was drawn or open war declared. Not only were most of the high offices at court in their hands, but it was from their ranks that the counts, and later the viscounts, were chosen who ruled over the districts into which the empire was divided and subdivided. The count received a third of the gifts and rents from his province that would otherwise have been paid to the king, and these, if he were unscrupulous, he could increase at the expense of those he governed. He presided in the local law courts and was responsible for the administration of justice, the exaction of fines, and for the building of roads and bridges. He was in fact a petty king and would often tyrannize over the people and neglect their royal interests to forward his selfish ambitions. The Merovingians had tried to limit the authority of the counts and other provincial officials by occasionally sending private agents of their own to inquire into the state of the provinces and to reform the abuses that they found. Charlemagne adopted this practice as a regular system. 
and at the annual assemblies he appointed missi or messengers who should take a tour of inspection in the district to which they had been sent at least four times in the year and afterwards report on their progress to the emperor wherever they went the count or viscount must yield up his authority to them for the time being allowing them to sit in his court and hear all the grievances and complaints that the men and women of the district cared to bring forward if the missi insisted on certain reforms the count must carry them out and also make atonement for any charges proved against him here are some of the evils that the men of istria a province on the eastern adriatic suffered at the hands of their lord johannes and that the inquiries of the royal missi at length brought to light johannes had sold the people on his estates as serfs to his sons and daughters he had forced them to build houses for his family and to go on voyages on his business across the sea to venice and ravenna he had seized the common land and used it as his own bringing in slavs from across the border to till it for his private use he had robbed his tenants of their horses and their money on the plea of the emperor's service and had given them nothing in exchange if the emperor will help us they cried we may be saved but if not, we had better die than live. From this account, we can see that Charlemagne appeared to the mass of his subjects as their champion against the tyranny of the nobles, and in this sense his government may be called popular. But the old popular assemblies of the Franks, at which the laws were made, had ceased by this reign to be anything but aristocratic gatherings summoned to approve the measures laid before them the emperor's capitularies would be based on the advice he had received from his most trusted missi and when they had been discussed by the principal nobles they would be read to the general assembly and ratified by a formal acceptance that meant nothing because it rarely or never changed into a refusal besides introducing new legislation in the form of royal edicts or capitularies charlemagne commanded that a collection should be made of all the old tribal laws such as the salic law of the franks and of the chief codes that had been handed down by tradition or word of mouth for generations and this compilation was revised and brought up to date it was a very useful and necessary piece of work and yet charlemagne for all his industry does not deserve to be ranked as a great lawgiver like justinian the very earnestness of his desire to secure immediate justice made his capitularies hasty and inadequate he would not wait to trace some evil to its root and then try to eradicate it but would pass a number of laws on the matter only touching the surface of what was wrong and creating confusion by the multiplicity of instructions and the contradictions they contained sometimes the missi themselves were not a success but would take bribes from the rich landowners on their tour of inspection and this would mean more government machinery and fresh laws to bring them under the royal control in their turn if it was difficult to make wise laws it was even harder in that rough age to carry them out for the nobles found it to their interest to defy or at least hinder an authority that struck at their power while the mass of the people were too ignorant to bear responsibility and few save those educated in palace schools could become trustworthy counts or royal agents dimly however the nation understood that the emperor held some high ideal of government planned for their prosperity no one cried out to him says the chronicle but straight away he should have good justice and in every church throughout france those who had not been called to follow him to battle prayed for his safety and that God would subdue the barbarians before his triumphant arms. To Charlemagne, there was a higher vision than that of mere victory in battle, a vision born of his favorite book, The Savitas Day, wherein St. Augustine had described the perfect emperor, holding his scepter as a gift God had given and might take away, and conquering his enemies that he might lead them to a greater knowledge and prosperity charlemagne believed that to him had been entrusted the guardianship of the catholic church not only from the heathen without its pale but from false doctrine and evil living within to the pope as christ's vice-regent he bore himself humbly as on the day when he had climbed st peter's steps on his knees 
but to the pope as a man dealing with other men he spoke as a lord to his vassal tendering his views and expecting compliance in return for which he guaranteed the support of his sword may the ruler of the church be rightly ruled by thee o king and mayest thou be ruled by the right hand of the almighty in this prayer alcuin probably expressed the emperor's opinion of his own position leo the third on the other hand preferred to talk of his champion as a faithful son of the mother church of rome thereby implying that the emperor should pay a son's duty of obedience but he himself was never in a strong enough position to enforce this point of view and the clash of empire and papacy was left for a later age within his own dominions charlemagne like the frankish kings before him reigned supreme over the church appointing whom he would as bishops and using them often as missi to assist him in his government yet the church remained in a state apart from the rest of the nation supported by the revenues of the large sees belonging to the different bishoprics and by the tithe or tenth part of the layman's income when churchmen attended the annual assembly they were allowed to deliberate apart from the nobles and freemen when a bishop excommunicated some heretic or sinner the emperor's court was bound to enforce the sentence thus the privileges and rights were many but charlemagne determined that the men who enjoyed them must also fulfill the obligations that they carried with them in earlier years charles martel and st boniface had struggled hard to raise the character of the frankish church and charlemagne continued their task with his usual energy insisting on frequent inspections of the monasteries and convents and on the maintenance of a stricter rule of life within their walls the ordinary parish clergy were also brought under more vigilant supervision in accordance with the laws of the roman church they were not allowed to marry nor might they take part in any worldly business enter a tavern carry arms or go on hunting or hawking above all they were encouraged to educate themselves that they might be able to teach their parishioners and set a good example good works are better than knowledge wrote charlemagne to his bishops and abbots in a letter of advice but without knowledge good works are impossible in accordance with this view he commanded that a school should be established in every diocese in order that the boys of the neighborhood might receive a grounding in the ordinary education of their day his own court became a center of learning for he himself was keenly interested in all branches of knowledge from a close study of the scriptures to mathematics or tales of distant lands histories he liked to have read out to him at meals Egenhard, his biographer tells us that he never learned to write but that he was proficient in latin and could understand greek it was his desire to emulate augustus the first of the roman emperors and gather round him the most literary men of europe and he eagerly welcomed foreign scholars and took them into his service chief amongst these adopted sons of the empire was alcuin the northumbrian a wanderer on the face of the earth as he called himself whom danish invasions had driven from his native land alcuin settled at the frankish court organized the palace school of which we have already made mention and himself wrote the primers from which the boys were taught his influence soon extended beyond this sphere and he became the emperor's chief adviser inspiring his master with high ideals while he himself was stirred by the other's vivid personality to share his passion for hard work it is this almost volcanic energy that gives the force and charm to charlemagne's many-sided character we think of him first it may be as the warrior the hero of romance or else as a statesman planning his empire of the west at another time we see in him the guardian of his people the king who wills that justice should be done but we recall a story such as that of the painted mouse and instantly his simple almost schoolboy side becomes apparent the great charles was no saint but a frank of the rough type of soldiers he led to battle capable of cruelty as of kindness hot-tempered a lover of sport strong perhaps where his ideals were at stake but weak towards women 
and an overindulgent father who let the intrigues of his daughters bring scandal on his court. Yet another contrast to this homely figure is the scholar and theologian, the friend of Alcuin, who believed that without knowledge good works were impossible. Many famous characters in history have equaled or surpassed Charlemagne as general, statesman, or legislator. There have been better scholars and more refined princes, but few or none have followed such divers aim and achieved by the sheer force of their personality such memorable results. Painters and chroniclers love to depict him in an old age still majestic, and in truth, up till nearly the end of his long reign, he kept the fire and vigor of his youth, swimming like a boy in the baths of Aachen, or hunting the wild boar upon the hills, drawing up capitularies, or dictating advice to his bishops, doing, in fact, whatever came to hand with an intensity that would have exhausted anyone less healthy and self-reliant. Fortunately for Charlemagne, he had the sturdy constitution of his race, and when at last he died an old man in 814, people believed that he did not share the common fate of humanity. Nearly 200 years later, it was said, when the funeral vault was open, he was found seated in his chair of state, firm of flesh as in life, with his crown on his snowy hair and his sword clasped in his hand. Our Lord gave this boon to Charlemagne that men should speak of him as long as the world endureth. It is a boast that, as centuries passed, sweeping away the memory of lesser heroes, time still justifies. End of chapter 8「Nine, Europe in the Middle Ages」by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9. The Invasions of the Northmen At the death of Charlemagne, the empire that he had built up stretched from Denmark to the Pyrenees and the Duchy of Spoletum south of Rome, from the Atlantic on the west to the Baltic, Bohemia, and the Dalmatian coast. It had been a brave attempt to realize the old Roman ideal of all civilized Europe gathered under one ruler, but he himself was well aware that the foundations he had laid were weak. His own personality that must vanish was the mortar holding them all together. Without his genius and the terror of his name, his possessions were only too likely to fall away. And therefore, instead of attempting to leave a united empire, he nominated one son to be the emperor in name, but made a rough division of his territory between three. Only the death of two, just before his own, defeated his aims and united the inheritance under the survivor, Louis. The new emperor was like his father in build, but without his wideness of outlook. His natural geniality was sometimes marred by uncontrollable fits of suspicion and cruelty, as in the case of his nephew, Bernard, king of Italy, whom he believed to be secretly conspiring to bring about his overthrow. Louis ordered the young man to appear at his court, and when Bernard hesitated, fearing treachery, his uncle sent him a special promise of safety by the empress, whom he trusted. Reluctantly, Bernard at last obeyed the summons, whereupon he was seized, thrust into a dungeon, and his eyes put out so cruelly that he died. Shortly afterwards, the empress died also, and Louis, who had loved her, believed that God was punishing him for his broken word. Overcome by remorse, he became so devout in his religious observances that his subjects called him Louis the Pious. Louis, like his father, was ever ready to listen to the petitions of those who were oppressed and to pass laws for their security. For the first sixteen years of his reign, the Carolingian dominions, put to no test, appeared unshaken, and then, of a sudden, just as if a cloud were blotting out the sunlight, prosperity and peace were lost in the horrors of civil war. Louis the Pious had three sons by his first wife, and, following Charlemagne's example, he named the eldest Lothar as his successor in the empire, while he divided his lands between the other two. 
It was only when he married again, and another son, Charles, was born to him, that trouble began. This fourth son was the old emperor's favorite, and Louis would gladly have left him a large kingdom, but such a gift he could only make now at the expense of the elder brothers, who hated the young boy as an interloper, and were determined that he should receive nothing to which they could lay claim. When Charles was six years old, Louis insisted that the country now called Switzerland, and part of modern Germany, Swabia, should be recognized as his inheritance, and on hearing this, all three elder brothers, who had been secretly making disloyal plots, broke into open revolt. The history of the next ten years is an ignominious chronicle of the emperor's weakness. Twice were he and his empress imprisoned and insulted, and on each occasion, when the quarrels of his sons amongst themselves led to his release, he was induced to grant a weak forgiveness that led to further rebellion. When Louis died in 840, the seeds of dissension were widely scattered, and those of his house who came after him openly showed that they cared for nothing save personal ambition. Lothar, the eldest, was proclaimed emperor, and obtained as his share of the dominions a large middle kingdom stretching from the mouth of the Rhine to Italy, and including the two capitals of Aachen and Rome. To the east, in what is now Germany, reigned his brother Louis. To the west, in France, Charles the Bald, the hated younger brother who had succeeded at last in obtaining a substantial inheritance. This division is interesting because it shows two of the nationalities of Europe already emerging from the imperial melting pot. When the brothers Louis and Charles met at Strasbourg in 842 to confirm an alliance they had formed against Lothar, Charles and his followers took the oath in German, Louis and his nobles in the Romance tongue of which modern French is the descendant. This they did that the armies on both sides might clearly understand how their leaders had bound themselves, and the oath of Strasbourg remains today as evidence of this new growth of nationality that had already acquired distinct national tongues. The partition of Verdun, signed shortly afterwards by all three brothers, acknowledged the division of the empire into three parts, France on the west, Germany in the east, and between them, the debatable kingdom of Lotharingia, that, dwindled during the Middle Ages and modern times into the province of Lorraine, has remained always a source of war and trouble. It would be wearisome to trace in detail the history of the years that followed the partition of Verdun. One historian has described it as a dizzy and unintelligible spectacle of monotonous confusion, a scene of unrestrained treachery, of insatiable and blind rapacity. No son is obedient or loyal to his father, no brother can trust his brother, no uncle spares his nephew. There were rapid alterations in fortune, rapid changing of sides. There was a universal distrust and a universal reliance on falsehood or crime. In 881, Charles the Fat, son of Louis the German of Strasbourg oath fame, succeeded, owing to the deaths of his rival cousins and uncles, in uniting for a few years all the dominions of Charlemagne under his scepter. But, weak and unhealthy, he was not the man to control so great possessions, and very shortly he was deposed and died in prison on an island in Lake Constance. With him faded away the last reflection of the Carolingian glory that had once dazzled the world. In France, the descendants of Charles the Bald carried on a precarious existence for several generations, despised and threatened by their own nobles as the later Merovingians had been, and utterly unable to defend their land from the hostile invasions of Northmen. That, beginning in the 8th century, seemed likely during the ninth and 10th centuries to paralyze the civilization and trade of Europe as the inroads of Goths, Huns, and Vandals had broken up the Roman Empire. The longships of the Northmen had been seen off the French coasts even in the days of Charlemagne, and one of the chroniclers records how the wise king, seeing them, exclaimed, These vessels bear no merchandise but cruel foes, and then continued with prophetic grief, Know ye why I weep? 
truly i fear not that these will injure me but i am deeply grieved that in my lifetime they should be so near a landing on these shores and i am overwhelmed with sorrow as i look forward and see what evils they will bring upon my offspring and their people the northmen we can guess from their name came from the wild often snow-bound coasts of scandinavia and denmark few weaklings could survive in such a climate and the race was tall well-built and hardy made up of men and women who despised the fireside and loved to feel the fresh sea wind beating against their faces life to them was a perpetual struggle but a struggle they had glorified into an ideal until they had ceased to dread either its discomforts or dangers here is a description of the three classes thrall churl and noble into which these tribes of northmen or vikings were divided Quote, thrall was swarthy of skin his hands wrinkled his knuckles bent his fingers thick his face ugly his back broad his heels long he began to put forth his strength binding the bast making loads and bearing home faggots the weary day long his children busied themselves with the building fences dunging plough land tending swine herding goats and digging peat carl or churl was red and ruddy with rolling eyes and took to breaking oxen building ploughs timbering houses and making carts earl the noble had yellow hair his cheeks were rosy his eyes were keen as a young serpent's his occupation was shaping the shield bending the bow hurling the javelin shaking the lance riding horses throwing dice fencing and swimming he began to wake war to redden the field and to fell the doomed to wake war this was the object of the viking's existence his gods odin and thor were battle heroes who struck one another in the flash of lightning and with a rumble of thunder as they moved their shields not for the man who lived long and comfortably and died at last in his bed were either the glory of this world or the joys of the next the scandinavian valhalla was no such paradise as the faithful moslems conceived where in sunlit gardens gay with fruit and flowers he should rest from his labors attended by huris or maidens of celestial beauty the viking asked for no rest only for unfailing strength and a foe to kill in the halls of his paradise reign perpetual battle all the day long and in the evening feasts where the warrior miraculously cured of his wounds could boast of his prowess and rise again on the morrow to fresh deeds of heroic slaughter in their dragon ships the huge prows fashioned into the heads of fierce animals or monsters the viking earls weary of dicing and throwing the javelin at home or exiled by their kings for some misdeeds would sweep in fleets across the north sea some to explore iceland and the far-off shores of greenland and north america some to burn the monasteries along the irish coast others to raid north germany france or england at first their only object was plunder for unlike the huns they did not despise the luxuries of civilization only those who allowed its influence to make them soft at a later date when they met with little resistance they began to build homes and thus the east coast of england became settled with danish colonies in this year says the anglo-saxon chronicle writing under the date eight fifty five the heathen men for the first time remained over winter in Sheppey. during the fifty years that followed it seemed as if the invaders might sweep away the anglo-saxons as completely as the ancestors of these anglo-saxons had exterminated the original british inhabitants and their roman conquerors that they failed was largely due to one of the most famous of english kings alfred the great a prince of the royal house of wessex wessex was a province lying mainly to the south of the river thames and at wantage in berkshire in the year eight forty nine alfred was born cradled in an atmosphere of war and danger from boyhood he fought by the side of his brothers in a long campaign of which the very victories could not hold at bay the restless danes when alfred succeeded to the throne 
he secured a temporary peace and began to build a fleet and reform his army but in a few years his enemies broke across his boundaries once more and he himself overwhelmed by their numbers was forced to take refuge in the marshes of somerset here at athelney he built a fort and collecting around him the english warriors of the neighboring counties organized so strong a resistance that at last he inflicted a decisive defeat upon the danish army king guthrum his enemy sued for peace and at the treaty of wedmore consented to become a christian and to recognize alfred as king of wessex while he himself retained the danelaw to the north of the thames this was the beginning of a new england for from this time alfred and his descendants having secured the freedom of wessex set themselves to win back bit by bit the territory held by the danes first of all under edward the elder alfred's son the middle kingdom of mercia was won back and the danes beyond its borders agreed to recognize the king of wessex as their overlord while later other wessex rulers overran northumbria and the south of scotland so that by the middle of the tenth century it could be said that england from the fourth to the channel was under one ruler the winning back of the danelaw had not been merely a matter of hewing down northmen nor did alfred earn his title of the great because he could wield a sword bravely and lead other men who could do the same he was a successful general because in an age of wild fighting he recognized the value of discipline and training in order to obtain the type of men he required he increased the number of thegans that is of nobles whose duty it was to serve the king as horsemen while he reorganized the furd or local militia henceforth instead of a large army of peasants who must be sent to their homes every autumn to reap the harvest he arranged for the maintenance of a small force that he could keep in the field as long as required its arms were to be supplied by fellow villagers released from the obligation to serve themselves on this condition alfred besides remodeling his army set up fortresses along its borders and constructed a fleet and because he believed that no great nation can be built on war alone he made wise laws and appointed judges like charlemagne's missy to see that they were carried out he also founded schools and tried by translating books himself and inviting scholars to his court to teach the men around him the glories and interests of peace amongst the books that he chose to set before his people in the anglo-saxon tongue was one called pastoral care by the pope gregory who had wished to go to england as a missionary and the consolations of philosophy written by boethius in prison i have desired said alfred the great summing up his ideal of life to leave to the men who come after me my memory and good works and the english people of to-day descendants of both anglo-saxons and their danish foes remember with pride and affection this wise king this truth-teller this england's darling as he was called in his own day who like charlemagne believed in patriotism justice and knowledge for three-quarters of a century after alfred's death his descendants kept alive something at any rate of this spirit of greatness but in nine seventy eight there succeeded to the crown a boy of ten named ethelred who as he grew up earned for himself the nickname of reedless or man without advice it is only fair before condemning ethelred's conduct to point out the heavy difficulties with which he was faced both the renewed danish attacks on his shores and also the jealousies and feuds of his own nobles the earls or elder men who had carved out large estates for themselves that they ruled as petty kings even a statesman like alfred would have needed all his strength and tact to unite these powerful subjects under one banner in order to lead them against the invaders ethelred proved himself weak and without any power of leadership the policy for which he has been chiefly remembered is his levy of a tax called Danegeld or Danish gold, the sums of money that he raised from his reluctant subjects to pay the Danes to go away. As a wiser man would have realized, this really meant that he paid them to return in still larger numbers in order to obtain more money. 
At last, alarmed at the result of this policy, he did something still more short-sighted and less defensible. He ordered a general massacre of all the Danes in the kingdom. The massacre of St. Bryce's Day, as this drastic measure is usually called, brought on England a bitter revenge at the hands of the angry Vikings. One well-armed force after another landed on the coasts, combining in an attack on the Anglo-Saxon king that drove him from the country to seek refuge in France. Very shortly afterwards he died, and Canute, one of the Danish leaders, forced the country to accept him as her ruler. This accession of a Danish foe might have been expected to undo all the work of Alfred and his sons, but fortunately for England, Knut was no reckless Viking with his heart set on war for war's sake. On the contrary, he was by nature a statesman who planned the foundation of a northern empire with England as its central point. He maintained a bodyguard of Danish huskarls, supported by attacks levied on his new subjects, in order to ensure his personal safety and the fulfillment of his orders. But otherwise, he showed himself an Englishman in every way he could. In especial, he made large gifts to monasteries and convents, bestowed favor and lands on English nobles, and accepted the laws and customs of the country whose throne he had usurped. King of Denmark and conqueror of England and Norway, he was anxious to ally his empire with the nations of the continent. With this in view, he went on a pilgrimage to Rome to win the sympathy of the Pope, and took a great deal of trouble to arrange foreign alliances. He himself married Emma, widow of Ethelred the Reedless, and a sister of the Duke of Normandy, thus pleasing the English and bringing himself into touch with France. The mention of Normandy brings us to a second invasion of Northmen, for the Normans, like Newt himself, were of Scandinavian origin. When some of the Vikings during the ninth century had sailed up the Humber and the Thames in the search of plunder and homes, others, as Charlemagne, according to the chronicler, had foreseen, preferred the harbors of the Seine, the Somme, and the Loire. In their methods they showed the same reckless daring and brutality as the early invaders of England, leaving where they passed smoking ruins of towns and churches. Charles the Bald and the feeble remnant of the Carolingian line who succeeded him were quite unable to deal with this terror, and it was only the creation of a duchy of Paris, whose forces were commanded by a fighting hero, Odo Capet, that saved the future capital of France. History repeats itself, it is sometimes said, and certainly the fate that the Carolingian mayors of the palace had meted out to their Merovingian kings their own descendants were destined to receive again in full measure. In 987 died Louis, the good-for-nothing, the last of the Carolingian kings, leaving as heir to the throne an uncle, Charles, Duke of Lorraine. In his short reign, Louis had shown himself feeble and profligate, and the nobles of northern France, weary of a royal house that, like Ethelred of England, preferred bribing the goodwill of invaders to fighting them, readily agreed to set Charles on one side and to take in his place Hugh Capet, Duke of Paris, descendant of the famous Odo. "'Our crown goes not by inheritance,' exclaimed the Archbishop of Reims, when sanctioning the usurper's claims, but by wisdom and noble blood. The unfortunate Duke of Lorraine, captured after a vain attempt to gain his inheritance, perished in prison, and with him disappeared the Carolingians. The house of Capet, built on their ruin, survived in the direct line until the 14th century, and then in a younger branch, the Valois, until France in modern times was declared a republic. Under the Capets, France became not merely a collection of tribes and races as under the Merovingians, nor a section of a European empire as under the house of Charlemagne, but a nation as we see her today, with separate interests and customs to distinguish her from other nations. This process of fusion was slow, and King Hugh and his immediate successors appeared in their own day more as powerful rulers of this small district in which they lived than as overlords of France. 
when they marched abroad at the head of a large army achieving victories outlying provinces hastily recognized them as suzerains or overlords but when they turned their backs and went home the commands they had issued would be ignored and defied amongst the most formidable neighbors of these rulers of paris were the dukes of normandy descendants of a certain viking chief rollo the granger so called because on account of his size he could find no horse capable of bearing him and must therefore gang afoot this rollo established himself at rouen and because charles the simple one of the later carolingians was unable to defeat him in battle he gave him instead the lands which he had won and created him a duke hoping that like a poacher turned gamekeeper he might prove as valuable a subject as he had been a troublesome foe in return rollo promised to become a christian and to acknowledge charles as his overlord one of the old chronicles says that when rollo was asked to ratify this allegiance by kissing his toe the viking replied in dignity not so by god and that a dane who consented to do so in his place was so rough that he tumbled charles from his throne amid jeers of his companions this is probably only a tale for in reality rollo married a daughter of charles and settled down in his capital at rouen as a model ruler of a semi-civilized state supporting the church and administering such law and order that it was said when he left a massive bracelet hanging on a tree and forgot he had done so that the ornament remained for three years without anyone daring to steal it the rulers of the new duchy were nearly all strong men hard fighters shrewd-headed and ambitious but the greatest of the line was undoubtedly william an illegitimate son of duke robert the devil william's ambition was of the restless type of his scandinavian forefathers and his duchy in northern france seemed to him too small to match his hopes when he noted that england was ruled by edward the confessor a feeble son of ethelred the reedless who had gained the throne on the death of Knut's two sons, he determined shrewdly that his conquest should lie in this direction. Many things favored his cause, not the least that Edward the Confessor himself, who had been brought up in Normandy and who had no direct heirs, was quite willing to acknowledge William as his successor. The national hero of England at the time Edward died, and who promptly proclaimed himself king, was Harold the Saxon a member of the powerful family of Godwin that had for years controlled and owned the greater part of the land in the south. Unfortunately for Harold, the north and midlands were mainly governed by the house of Morcara and their friends, who hated the family of Godwin as dangerous rivals far more than they dreaded a Norman invasion. Thus, any help that they or their tenants proffered was so slow in its rendering and so niggardly in its amount that it proved of very little use in addition to jealousies at home harold at the moment he heard william duke of normandy had indeed landed on the south coast was far off in yorkshire where he had just succeeded in repelling an invasion of danes at the battle of stamford bridge at once he started southward but as he marched his army melted away some of the men to enjoy the spoils taken from the danes others to attend to their harvests the deserters could claim that they were following the advice of the father of Christendom, since Pope Gregory the Seventh had given William a banner that he had blessed and had denounced Harold as a perjurer. One of the reasons for Gregory's anger with the Saxons was that Harold had dared to appoint as Archbishop of Canterbury a bishop of whom he did not approve, while further the crafty William had persuaded him that Harold, who as a young man had been wrecked on the Norman coast, had sworn on the bones of some holy saint that he would never seize the crown of England. He had been a prisoner in William's power, and only on this condition had he been set free to return to his native land. The exact truth of events so long ago is hard to reach, but Harold, at any rate, fought under a cloud of suspicion and neglect and not all his reckless daring nor the devotion of his brothers and friends could save his fortunes when on the field of senlac standing beneath his dragon banner he met the shock of the disciplined norman forces 
Chroniclers relate that the human wall of Saxon archers and foot soldiers remained unshaken on the hillside until William, setting a snare, turned in pretended flight. The ruse was successful, for as the Saxons, cheering triumphantly, descended from their position in pursuit, the invaders faced around and charged their disordered ranks. Only Harold and the men of his bodyguard remained firm under the onslaught, until at last an arrow fired in the air struck the Saxon king in the eye as he looked up, so that he fell down dead. All resistance was now at an end, and William, Duke of Normandy, was left master of the field and ruler of England. Here rose the dragon banner of our realm, here fought, here fell, our Norman slandered king. O garden blossoming out of English blood, O strange hate healer time, we stroll and stare where might made right eight hundred years ago. These lines of Tennyson on Battle Abbey recall the fact that just as the Danes and Saxons were fused into one race, so would the Norman invaders mingle with their descendants until to after generations William, as well as Harold, should appear a national hero. In his own day, the conqueror struck terror into the heart of the conquered. In 1069, when the north of England, too late to help Harold, rose in revolt, he laid waste a desert by sword and fire from the Humber to the Tees. When the Norman barons and the English earls challenged his rule, he threw them alike into dungeons. What seemed to the Saxon mind even more wonderful and horrible than his cruelty was the record of all the wealth of his kingdom that he caused to be compiled. This Domesday book contained a close account not only of the great estates, lay and ecclesiastical, but of every small hamlet and even the numbers of livestock on each farm. So very narrowly did he cause the survey to be made, says the Anglo-Saxon chronicle, that there was not a single hide nor a root of land nor, it is shameful to relate that which he thought no shame to do, was there an ox or a cow or a pig, passed by that was not set down in the account. William, it can be seen, was thorough in his methods, both in war and peace, and through this very thoroughness he won the respect, if not the affection, of his new subjects. Ever since the death of Newt the Dane, England had suffered either from actual civil war or from a weak ruler who allowed his nobles to quarrel and oppress the rest of the nation. As a result of the Norman conquest, the bulk of the population found that they had gained one tyrant instead of many, and how they appreciated the change is shown by the way, all through Norman times, the middle and lower classes would help their foreign king against his turbulent baronage. This is what a monk, an Anglo-Saxon, and therefore by race an enemy of the conqueror, wrote about him in his chronicle. Quote, if any would know what manner of man King William was, then will we describe him as we have known him. This King William was a very wise and a great man, and more honored and more powerful than any of his predecessors. He was mild to those good men who loved God, but severe beyond measure to those who withstood his will. So also he was a very stern and wrathful man, so that none durst do anything against his will, and he kept in prison those earls who acted against his pleasure. He removed bishops from their sees, and at length he spared not his own brother Odo. Amongst other things, the good order that William established must not be forgotten. It was such that any man, who was himself aught, might travel over the kingdom with a bosom full of gold, unmolested, and no man durst kill another, however great the injury he might have received from him. End quote. A few lines farther on, the chronicler, having mentioned the peace that William gave, sadly relates the tyranny that was the price he extorted in exchange. Quote, Truly there was much trouble in these times and very great distress. He caused castles to be built and oppressed the poor. He was given to avarice and greedily loved gain. He made large forests for the deer and enacted laws therewith so that whoever killed a hart or a hind should be blinded. He loved the tall stags as if he were their father. He also appointed, concerning the hares, that they should go free. 
The rich complained, and the poor murmured, but he was so sturdy that he recked not of them. They must will all that the king willed if they should live. Alas, that any man should so exalt himself, may Almighty God show mercy to his soul. End quote. The monk wrote after September 1087, when the conqueror lay dead. Not in any Viking glory of battle against a national foe had he passed to his fathers, but in sordid struggle with his eldest son Robert, who, aided by the French king, had rebelled against him. His crown was at once seized by his second son, William Rufus, and with him the line of Norman kings was firmly established on the English throne. The adventurous spirit of the Northmen had led them from Denmark and Scandinavia to the coasts of England and France, and from France their descendants, driven by the same roving instincts, had crossed the channel in search of fresh conquests. Other Normans in the 11th century sailed south instead of north. Their talk was of a pilgrimage to Rome, perhaps to the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. But when they found that the beautiful island of Sicily had been taken up by the Moslems, and that South Italy was divided up among a number of princes too jealous of one another to unite against any invaders, either Christian or pagan, their thoughts turned quite naturally to conquest. An Italian at this time describes the Normans as cunning and revengeful, and adds, in their eager search the wealth and dominion, they despise whatever they possess and hope whatever they desire. Such an impression was to be gained by bitter experience, but, not knowing it, Maniasis, the Greek governor of that part of South Italy that still maintained its allegiance to the Eastern Empire, invited these northern warriors in the 11th century to help him win back Sicily from the Saracens. They agreed, attacked in force, gained the greater part of the island, but then quarreled with Maniasis over the spoils. Outraged by what they considered his miserly conduct, they invaded the province of Apulia, made themselves master of it, and established their capital at Melfi. The head of the new Norman state was a certain William de Hauteville, who with several of his brothers had been leaders in the Italian expedition. No member of the House of Hauteville ever saw a neighbor's lands without wanting them for himself. So says a biographer of that family. And if this was their ideal, it was certainly shared by William and his numerous brothers. Since other people's possessions were not surrendered without a struggle, even in the Middle Ages, it was fortunate for them that they had the genius to win and hold what they coveted. Pope Leo IX, like his predecessors in the See of Peter ever since Charlemagne had confirmed their right to the lands of the Exarch of Ravenna, looked uneasily on invaders of Italy, and he, Leo, therefore attempted to form a league with both the emperors of the East and West that should ruin these presumptuous usurpers. The league came into being, but the Pope's allies failed him, and at the Battle of Civitate he was defeated and all but taken prisoner. Here was a chance for Norman diplomacy, or, as Italians would have called it, cunning, and the conquerors promptly declared that it had been with the utmost reluctance that they had made war on the father of Christendom and begged his forgiveness. His absolution was obtained, and a few years later, through the mediation of Hildebrand, then Archdeacon of Rome and later as Pope Gregory the Seventh, one of the leading statesmen of Europe, a compact was arranged by which the Normans recognized Pope Nicholas II as their overlord, while he, on his part, acknowledged their right to keep their conquests. Both parties to this bargain were pleased. The Pope, because he had gained a vassal state, however unruly, and the Normans, since they felt that they no longer reigned on sufferance, but had a legal status in the eyes of Europe. Neither had any idea of the mine of trouble they were laying for future generations. The fortunes of the House of Hauteville, thus established, mounted steadily. William died and was succeeded by a younger brother, Robert, named Giscard, or the Wise, during his reign, he forced both the Greek governor and the independent princes who held the rest of South Italy to surrender their possessions, 
while he even carried his war against the eastern empire to greece itself only his death put an end to this daring campaign robert guiscard as master of south italy had been created duke of apulia his nephew roger the second count of sicily who inherited his stagecraft and strength induced the pope to magnify both mainland and island into a joint kingdom and thereafter reigned as king of naples he was a lover of justice says a chronicler of his day and the most severe avenger of crime he hated lying and never promised what he did not mean to perform he never persecuted his private enemies and in war endeavored on all occasions to gain his point without shedding blood justice and peace were universally observed through his dominions roger the second of naples was evidently a finer and more civilized character than william of england but in both lay that norman capacity for establishing and maintaining order that at first seemed so strange in an inheritance from wild norse ancestors clear-sighted iron-nerved an adventurer with an instinct for business the norman of the early middle ages was just the leaven that europe required to raise her out of the indolent depression of the dark ages that followed the fall of rome end of chapter nine Chapter 10 Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10 Feudalism and Monasticism. Feudalism. Wherever in the course of history men have gathered together, they have gradually evolved some form of association that would ensure mutual interests it might be merely the tribal bond of the arabians by which a man's relations were responsible for his acts and avenged his wrongs it might be a council of village elders such as the russian mir making laws for the younger men and women it might be a group of german chiefs legislating on moonlit nights according to the description of tacitus by their campfires in contrast to primitive associations stands the elaborate government of rome under augustus and his successors the despotic emperor his numberless officials the senators with their huge estates the struggling curiales the army of legions carrying out imperial commands from scotland to the euphrates when rome fell her government like a house whose foundations have collapsed fell also Barbarian conquerors, established in Italy and the Roman provinces, took what they liked of the laws that they found, added to them their own customs, and out of the blend evolved new codes of legislation. Yet legislation, without some method of ensuring its execution, could not save nations from invasion, nor the merchant or peasant from becoming the victims of robberies and petty crimes medieval centuries are sometimes called the age of feudalism because during this time feudalism was the method gradually adopted for dealing with the problems of public life amongst all classes and nearly all the nations of europe there are two chief things to be remembered about feudalism first that it was no sudden invention but a growth out of old ideas both roman and barbarian and next that it was intimately connected in men's minds with the thought of land this was natural for after all land or its products are as necessary to the life of every individual as air and water and therefore the cultivation of the soil and the distribution of its fruits are the first problems with which the governments are faced feudalism assumed that all the land belonging to a nation belonged in the first place to that nation's king because he could not govern or cultivate it all himself, he would parcel it out in fiefs amongst the chief nobles at his court, promising them his protection and asking in return that they should do him some specified service. This system recalls the villa of Roman days with its senator granting protection to its tenants from robbery and excessive taxation and employing them to plow and sow, to reap his crops and build his houses and bridges in the middle ages the service of the chief tenants was nearly always military 
to appear when summoned by the king with so many horsemen and so many archers fully armed. In order to provide this force, the tenant would be driven in his turn to grant out parts of his land to other tenants who would come when he called them with horsemen and arms that they had collected in a similar way. This process was called sub-infudation. Society thus took the form of a pyramid with the king at the apex, immediately below him, his tenants and chief, and below them in graded ranks or layers, the other tenants. This brings us to the base of the pyramid, the people who could not fight themselves, having neither horses nor weapons, and who certainly could not lend any other soldiers to their lord's banner. Were they to receive no land? In the Roman villa, the bottom strata was the slave, the chattel with no rights, even over his own body. Under the system of feudalism, the base of the pyramid was made up of serfs, men originally free with a customary right to the land on which they lived, who had lost their freedom under feudal law and had become bound to the land, a scripti glebae, in such a way that if the land were sublet or sold, they would pass over to the new owner like the trees or the grass. In return for their land, though they might not serve their master with spear or bow, they would work in his fields, build his bridges and castles, mend his roads, and guard his cattle. From the top to bottom of this pyramid of feudal society ran the binding border of tenure and service. But these were not the only links which kept feudal society together. When a tenant did homage for his land, and, with head uncovered, with belt ungirt, his sword removed, placed his hands between those of his lord, and took an oath, after the manner of the Thegans of Wessex to their king, to love what he loved and shun what he shunned, both on sea and on land, there entered into this relationship the finer bond of loyalty due from a vassal to his overlord. It was the descendant of the old Teutonic idea of the Comitatus, described by Tacitus, the chief destined to lead and guide, his bodyguard pledged to follow him to death if necessary. Put shortly, then, feudalism may be described as a system of society based upon the holding of land, a system, that is, in which a man's legal status and social rank were in the main determined by the conditions on which he held, that is, possessed, his land. Such a system, to return to our example of the pyramid, grew not only from the apex by the sovereign granting lands, as the king of France did to Rollo the Granger, but from the middle and base as well. One of the chief feudal powers in medieval times was the church, for though abbots and bishops were not supposed to fight themselves, yet they would often have numbers of lay military tenants to bring to the help of the king or their overlord. Some of these tenants were men whom they had provided with estates, but others were landowners who had voluntarily surrendered their rights over the land in return for the protection of a local monastery or bishopric, and thus had become its tenants. A large part of the church land was, however, held not by military or lay tenure, but in return for spiritual services, or free alms, as it was called, i.e. prayers for the soul of the donor. Perhaps a landowner wished to make a pious gift on his deathbed, or had committed a crime and believed that a surrender of his property to the church would placate God. For some such reason, at any rate, he made over his land or part of it to the church, which in this way accumulated great estates and endowments, free from the usual liabilities of lay tenure. All over Europe, other men and even whole villages and towns were taking the same steps, seeking protection direct from the king or a great lord or an abbot or bishop, offering in return rent, services, or tolls on their merchandise. Feudalism at its best stood for the protection of the weak in an age when armies and a police force, as we understand the terms, did not exist. Even when the system fell below this standard, and it often fell badly, there still remained in its appeal to loyalty an ideal above and beyond the ordinary outlook of the day, a seed of nobler feeling that, with the growth of civilization and under the influence of the church, blossomed into the flower of chivalry. I made them lay their hands in mine and swear to reverence the king as if he were their conscience, and their conscience as their king, 
to break the heathen and uphold Christ, to ride abroad redressing human wrongs, to speak no slander, no, nor listen to it, to honor his own word as if his gods, to live sweet lives in purest chastity. Such are the vows that Tennyson puts in the mouth of Arthur's knights, who, with Charlemagne and his paladins, were the heroes of medieval romance and dreams. King Henry the Fowler, who ruled Germany in the early part of the 10th century, instituted the Order of Knighthood, forming a bodyguard from the younger brothers and sons of his chief barons. Before they received the sword tap on their shoulder that confirmed their new rank, these candidates for knighthood took four vows. First, to speak the truth, next to serve faithfully both king and church, thirdly, never to harm a woman, and lastly, never to turn their back on a foe. Probably many of these half-barbarian young swashbucklers broke their vows freely, but some would remember and obey, and so amid the general roughness and cruelty of the age, there would be established a small leaven of gentleness and pity left to expand its influence through the coming generations. It is because of this ideal of chivalry, often eclipsed and even travestied by those who claim to be its brightest mirrors, but never quite lost to Europe, that strong nations have been found ready to defend the rights of the weak, and men have laid down their lives to avenge the oppression of women and children. On the evil side of feudalism, much more could be written than of the good. The system, on its military side, was intended to provide the king with an army, but if one of his tenants in chief chose to rebel against him, the vassals who held their lands from this tenant were much more likely to keep faith with the lord to whom they paid immediate homage than with their sovereign. Thus, often the only force on which a king could rely were the vassals of the royal domain. Again, feudalism by its policy of making tenants in chief responsible for law and order on their estates had set up a number of petty rulers with almost absolute power. Peasants were tried for their offenses in their lord's court by his bailiff or agent, and by his will they suffered death or paid their fines. Except in the case of Charlemagne, strong enough to send out Misi and to support them when they overrode local decisions, the lord's justice or injustice would seem a real thing to his tenants and serfs. The king's law, something shadowy and far away. As Duke of Normandy, William the Conqueror had been quite as powerful as his overlord, the King of France. When he came to England, he was determined that none of the barons to whom he had granted estates should ever be his equal in this way. He therefore summoned all landowning men in England to a council at Salisbury in 1086, and made them take an oath of allegiance to himself before all other lords. Because he was a strong man, he kept his barons true to their oath or punished them, but during the reign of his grandson Stephen, who disputed the English throne with his cousin Matilda, and therefore tried to buy the support of the military class by gifts and concessions, the vices of feudalism ran almost unchecked. They had done homage to him and sworn oaths, says the Anglo-Saxon chronicler, but they no faith kept, for every rich man built his castles and defended them against him, and they filled the land with castles. Then they took these whom they suspected to have any goods by night and by day, seizing both men and women, and they put them in prison for their gold and silver and tortured them with pains unspeakable. I cannot and I may not tell of all the wounds and of all the tortures that they inflicted upon the wretched men of this land, and this state of things lasted the nineteen years that Stephen was king, and ever grew worse and worse. Stephen was a weak ruler struggling with a civil war, so that it might be argued that no system of government could have worked well under such auspices. But if we turn to the normal life of the peasant folk on the estates of the monastery of Mont St. Michael in the 13th century, we shall see that the humble tenants at the base of the feudal pyramid paid dearly enough for the protection of their overlords. In June, the peasants must cut and pile the hay and carry it to the manor house. In August, they must reap and carry in the convent grain. Their own grain lies exposed to wind and rain. On the nativity of the virgin, 
the villain owes the pork due one pig and eight at christmas a fowl fine and good on palm sunday the sheep do at easter he must plough sow and harrow when there is building the tenant must bring stone and serve the masons he must also haul the convent wood for two deniers a day if he sells his land he owes his lord a thirteenth of its value if he marries his daughter outside the lord's domain he pays a fine he must grind his grain at the lord's mill and bake his bread at the lord's oven where the customary charges never satisfy the servants. Certainly the peasant to the Middle Ages can have had little time to lament even his own misery. Perhaps to keep his hovel from fire and pillage and his family from starvation was all to which he often aspired. War, it has been said, was the law of the feudal world, and all over Europe the moat-girt castles of powerful barons and walled towns and villages sprang up as a witness to the turbulent state of society during these centuries to some natures this atmosphere of violence of course appealed i sirs am for war peace giveth me pain no other creed will hold me again on monday on tuesday whenever you will day week month or year are the same to me still so sang a Provencal baron of the twelfth century, and we find an echo of his spirit in Spain as late as the fifteenth, when a certain noble, sighing for the joys and spoils of civil war, remarked, I would there were many kings in Castile, for then I should be one of them. The church, endeavoring to cope with the spirit of anarchy, succeeded in establishing on different occasions a truce of God, somewhat resembling the sacred months devised by the Arabs for a like purpose. From Wednesday to Monday, and during certain seasons of the year, such as Advent or Lent, war was completely forbidden under ecclesiastical censure, while at no time were priests, laborers, women, or children to be molested. The defect of such reforms lay in the absence of machinery to enforce them, and feudalism, the system by which in practice the few lived at the expense of the many, continued to flourish until foreign adventure, such as the Crusades, absorbed some of its chief supporters, and civilization and humanity succeeded in building up new foundations of society to take its place. It would seem as if the lessons of good government had to be learned in a hard school, generally through bitter experience on the part of the governed monasticism if the study of feudalism is necessary to a knowledge of the material life of the middle ages its spirit is equally a closed book without an understanding of monasticism what induced men and women not just a few devout souls but thousands of ordinary people of all nations and classes from the prince to the serf to forsake the world for the cloister and far from regretting the sacrifice to maintain with obvious sincerity that they had chosen the better part. If we would realize the medieval mind, we must find an answer to this question. Turning to the earliest days of monasticism, when the fathers of the church sought hermit cells, we recall the shrinking of finer natures from the brutality and lust of pagan society, the intense conviction that the way to draw nearer God was to shut out the world and the desire of a Simon Stylites to make the thoughtless mind, by the sight of his self-inflicted penance, think for a moment, at any rate, of a future heaven and hell. Motives such as these continued to inspire the enthusiastic Christians throughout the Dark Ages following the fall of Rome. But, as Europe became outwardly converted to the Catholic faith, it was not paganism from which the monk fled, but the mockery of his own beliefs that he found in the lives of so-called Christians. The corruption of imperial courts, even those of a Constantine or Charlemagne, the cunning cruelty of a baptized Clovis, the ruthless selfishness of a feudal baron or Norman adventurer fighting in the name of Christ, all these were hard to reconcile with a gospel of poverty, gentleness, and brotherhood. Even the light of pure ideals once held aloft by the church had begun to burn dim, for men are usually tolerant of evils to which they are accustomed, 
and the priest who had grown up amid barbarian invasions was inclined to look on the coarseness and violence that they bred as a natural side of life. As a rule, he continued to maintain a slightly higher standard of conduct than his parishioners, but sometimes he fell to their level or below. The great danger to the church, however, was, as always in her history, not the hardships that she encountered, but the prosperity. The bishops, overseers responsible for the discipline and well-being of their dioceses, became in the Middle Ages, by reason of their very power and influence, too often the servants of earthly rulers rather than of God. Far better educated and disciplined than the layman, experienced in diocesan affairs, without ties of wife and family, since the church law forbade the clergy to marry, they were selected by kings for a responsible office in the state. Usually they proved the wisdom of his choice through their gifts of administration and loyalty, but the effect on the church of adding political to ecclesiastical power proved disastrous in the end. Their great landed wealth made the bishops feudal barons, while bishoprics, in their turn, came to be regarded as offices at the disposal of the king. A bad king would parcel them out amongst his favorites or sell them to the highest bidders heedless of their moral character. Thus crept into the church the sin of simony or traffic in holy things so strongly condemned by the first apostles and following hard on the heels of simony the worldliness born of temptations of wealth and power. The bishop who was numbered amongst a feudal baronage and entertained a lax nobility at his palace was little likely to be shocked at priests convicted of ignorance or immorality or spend his time in trying to reform their habits. It was, then, not only in horror of the world, but in reproach of the church herself, that the monk turned to the idea of separation from man and communion with God. In the earliest days of monasticism, each hermit followed his special theory of prayer and self-discipline. He would gather round him small communities of disciples, and these would remain or go away to form other communities as they chose, a lack of system that often resulted in unhealthy fanaticism or useless idleness. In the 6th century, an Italian monk, Benedict of Nursia, 480-543, compiled a set of regulations for his followers, which, under the name The Rule of Benedict, became the standard code of monastic life for all Western Christendom. Benedict demanded of his monks a novitiate of twelve months, during which they could test their call to a life of continual sacrifice. At the end of this time, if the novice still continued resolute in his intention and was approved by the monastic authorities, he was accepted into the brotherhood by taking the perpetual vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity, the three conditions of life most hostile to the lust of possession, turbulence, and sensuality that dominated the Middle Ages. To these vows were added the obligation of manual labor, seven hours' work a day in addition to the recitation of prayers enjoined on the community. The faithful Benedictine at least could never be accused of idleness, and to the civilizing influence of the regulars, as the monks were called because they obeyed a rule regula, in contrast to the secular priests who lived in the world, Europe owed an immense debt of gratitude. Sometimes it is said, contemptuously, that the monks of the Middle Ages chose beautiful sites on which to found luxurious homes. Certainly they selected as a rule the neighborhood of rivers and lakes, water being a prime necessity of life, and in such neighborhoods raised chapels and monasteries that have become the architectural wonders of the world. Yet many of these wonders began in a circle of wooden huts built on a reclaimed marsh, and it was the labor of the followers of St. Benedict that replaced wood by stone and swamps by gardens and farms. Where the barbarian or feudal anarchist burned and destroyed, the monk of the Middle Ages brought back the barren soil to pasturage or tillage, and just as he weeded, sowed, and planted as part of his obligation to God, so from the produce of his labors he provided for the destitute at his gate, or in his cloister school supplied the ignorant with the rudiments of knowledge and culture. 
The monasteries were centers of medieval life, not, like the castles, of death. In his quiet cell, the monk chronicler became an historian. The copyist reproduced with careful affection decaying manuscripts. The illuminator made careful pictures of his day. The chemist concocted strange healing medicines, or in his crucibles developed wondrous colors. Good it is for us to dwell here where man lives more purely, falls more rarely, rises more quickly, treads more cautiously, rests more securely, is absolved more easily, and rewarded more plenteously. This is the saying of St. Bernard, one of the later monastic reformers, and his ideal was the general conception of the best life possible as understood in the Middle Ages. To the monasteries flocked the devout, seeking a home of prayer, but also the student or artist, unable to follow his bent in the turbulent world, and the man who despised or feared the atmosphere of war. Even the feudal baron would pause in his quarrels to make some pious gift to abbey or priory, a tribute to a faith he admired, but was too weak to practice. Sometimes he came in later life, a penitent who, toiling like a serf, sought in the cloister the salvation of his soul. In the monasteries, says a medieval German, one saw counts cooking in the kitchen and margraves leading their pigs out to feed. Monasticism, with its belief in brotherhood, was a leveler of class distinctions, but, like the rest of the church, it found in the popular enthusiasm it aroused the path of temptation. Men, we have seen, entered the cloister for other reasons than pure devotion to God, and the rule of Benedict, proving too strict, they yield secretly to sins that perhaps were not checked or reproved because abbots and times ceased to be saints and became, like the bishops, feudal landlords with worldly interests. In this way, vice and laziness were allowed to spread and cling like bindweed. Throughout the Middle Ages, there were times of corruption and failure amongst the monastic orders, followed by waves of sweeping reform and earnest endeavor, when, once again, the cross was raised as an emblem of sacrifice and drew the more spiritual of men unto it. In 910, the monastery of Cluny was founded in Burgundy, and freed from the jurisdiction of local bishops by being placed under the direct control of the Pope, was able to establish a reformed Benedictine order. Its abbot was recognized not only as the superior of the monastery at Cluny, but also of daughter houses that sprang up all over Europe, subject to his discipline and rule. Other monastic orders founded shortly after this date were those of the Carthusians and Cistercians. In their desire to combat worldliness, the early Carthusians, or monks of the monastery of Chartreux, carried on in ceasing war against the pleasures of the world. Strict fasting for eight months in the year, one meal a day eaten in silence and alone, no conversation with other brethren save at a weekly meeting, this was the background to a life of toil and prayer. The monastery of Citeaux in southern France, from which the Cistercians take their name, was another attempt to live in the world, but not of it. The white monks, so called from the color of their woolen frocks, sought solitudes in which to build their houses. Their churches and monasteries remain among the glories of architecture, but through fear of riches they refused to place in them crosses of gold or silver or to allow their priests to wear embroidered vestments. No Cistercian might recite the service of the Mass for money or be paid for the cure of souls. With his hands he must work for his meager fare, remembering always to give God thanks for the complete self-renunciation to which he was pledged by his order. Chief among the Cistercian saints is Bernard, 1090-1153, a Burgundian noble who in 1115 founded a daughter monastery of his order at Clairvaux and as its head became one of the leaders of medieval thought. When he was only twenty, he had appeared before the abbot of Citeaux with a band of companions, relations and friends whom his eloquence had persuaded to enter the monastery with him. Throughout his life, this power over others and his fearlessness in making use of this influence were his most vivid characteristics. His speech, wrote someone who knew him, was suited to his audience, to country folk, 
he spoke as though born and bred in the country, and so to other classes as though he had been always occupied with their business. He adapted himself to all, desiring to gain all for Christ. In these last words lie his mission and the secret of his success. Never was his eloquence exerted for himself, and so men who wished to criticize were overborne by his single-minded sincerity. Severe to his own shortcomings, gentle and humble to his brethren, ready to accept reproof or undertake the meanest task, Bernard was fierce and implacable to the man or the conditions that seemed to him to stand in the way of God's will. I grieve over thee, my son Geoffrey, he wrote to a young monk who had fled the austerities of Clairvaux. How could you, who were called by God, follow the devil recalling thee? Turn back, I say, before the abyss swallows thee, before bound hand and foot thou art cast into outer darkness, shut in with the darkness of death. To the ruler of France, he sent a letter of reproof ending with the words, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, even for thee, O king. And his audacity, instead of working his ruin, brought the leading clergy and statesmen of Europe to the cells of Clairvaux, as if to some oracle's temple to learn the will of God. From his cell, St. Bernard preached the Second Crusade, reformed abuses in the church, deposed an anti-pope, and denounced heretics in his distrust of human reason, trying to free itself from some of the dogmatic assertions of early Christian thought, he represented the narrow outlook of his age. But in his love of God, and through God, of humanity, he typifies the spiritual charm that, like a thread of gold, runs through all the dross of hardness and treachery in the medieval mind. Do not grieve, he wrote to the parents of Anaphis. He goes to God, but you do not lose him. Rather, through him you gain many sons, for all of us who belong to Clairvaux have taken him to be a brother, and you to be our parents. To St. Bernard, self-renunciation meant self-realization, the laying down of a life to find it again purified and enriched. And this was the ideal of monasticism, often misunderstood and discredited by its weaker followers, like all ideals, but yet the glory of its saints. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lifford Plunkett This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Investiture Question we have said that, in the oath of Strasbourg, it was possible to distinguish the infant nations of France and Germany. This is true, yet Germany, though distinct from her neighbors, was to remain all through the Middle Ages rather an agglomeration of states than a nation as we understand the word today. One reason for the absence of any common policy and ambitions was that Charlemagne, though he had conquered the Saxons and other Germanic tribes, had never succeeded in welding them into one people. Under his successors, the different races easily slipped back into regarding themselves rather as Saxons, Franconians, or Bavarians than as Germans. Indeed, the Bohemians relapsed into heathendom and became once more altogether uncivilized. This instinct for separation was aided by the feudal system, since rebel tenants and chiefs could count on provincial feeling to support them against the king, their overlord. It is hardly surprising, then, if the struggle that broke out in Germany, as elsewhere in Europe, between rulers and their feudal baronage, was decided there in favor of the baronage. Perhaps if some strong king could have given his undivided attention to the problem, he might have succeeded, like William I of England, in making himself real master of all Germany. But unfortunately, the rulers of the German kingdom were never free from foreign wars. Just as the Norsemen had descended on the coasts of France, so Danes, Slavs, and Hungarians were a constant menace to the civilization of Germany. Hordes of these barbarians, breaking over the frontiers every year and even pillaging the districts as far west as the Rhine. German kings, in consequence of this external menace, 
had to rely for the defense of their frontiers upon the military power of their great vassals. They were even forced to create large estates called marks, marchlands, upon their northern and eastern border to act as national bulwarks. Over these ruled margraves, grafts or counts of the mark, with a large measure of independence. Modern Prussia was once the mark of Brandenburg, a war state created against the Slav. Austria, the mark placed in the east between Bavaria and the Hungarians. Schleswig, the mark established to hold back the Danes. Yet another cause told for disruption. The fact that when the Carolingian line came to an end in Germany early in the 10th century, the practice sprang up of electing kings from among the chief princes and dukes. Though this plan worked well if the electors made an honest choice, Yet it gave the feudal baronage a weapon, on the other hand, if they wished to strike a bargain with a would-be ruler or to appoint a weakling whose authority they could undermine. The first of the elected kings of Germany was Conrad of Franconia, during whose reign the feudal system took strong root, and who ruled rather through his barons than in opposition to their wishes. On his deathbed he showed his honest desire for the welfare of Germany. I know, he declared, that no man is worthier to sit on my throne than my enemy, Henry of Saxony. When I am dead, take him the crown and the sacred lance, the golden armlet, the sword, and the purple mantle of the old kings. The princes, who followed his advice, found their new ruler out hawking on the mountainside, and under the nickname Henry the Fowler, he became their king and one of Germany's national heroes. In his untiring struggle against invaders, Henry I recalls the Anglo-Saxon Alfred the Great, and like Alfred, he was at first forced to fly before his enemies. To the disgust of the great dukes, he bought a nine years peace from the Hungarians by paying tribute. But when the enemy went away, he at once began to build castles or burgs, and filled them with soldiers under the command of burgraves. These castles were placed all along the frontiers, and gradually villages and towns gathered round them for safety. In the tenth year, the Hungarians came as usual to ask for the tribute money, but Henry ordered a dead dog to be thrown at their messenger's feet. In the future, this is all your master will get from us, he exclaimed, and the answer, as he expected, provoked an immediate invasion. Instead of being able to lay waste the countryside as of old, however, the Hungarians now found burgs well fortified and provisioned that they could neither take nor leave with safety in their rear. When at last they met Henry in pitched battle, they broke and fled before his onslaught, declaring that the golden banner of St. Michael carried at the head of his troops had by some wizardry contrived their ruin. Besides repulsing invaders, Henry the Fowler imposed his will to a considerable extent over his rebellious baronage. In another chapter, we have noted how he instituted the Order of Knighthood as a way of harnessing to his service the restless energy of the younger sons of the nobles. He also tried to strengthen the middle classes as a counterpoise to the baronage by encouraging the construction of walled towns for the protection of merchants, while he would hold his councils rather in towns than in the woods like his predecessors in order to attract people to settle there. Many of the marks owe their origin to Henry's policy of strengthening the border provinces, and in this and in his determination to subdue the Hungarians, he found an able successor in his son Otto I. Otto's reign might, from one aspect, be called a history of wars, First, there were foreign wars, the subjugation of Denmark, whose king became a German vassal, the reconquest and conversion of Bohemia, and also a series of campaigns against the Hungarians, resulting at last in 955 in a victory at Augsburg so complete that never again the hated invaders dared to cross the border save in marauding bands. But besides fighting against foreign neighbors, Otto had a continual struggle at home in order to reassert the authority of the crown over the great duchies such as Lotharingia and Bavaria. When he was able to do so, he would replace the most turbulent of the dukes by members of his own family, or he would make gifts of large estates to bishops, hoping in this way to provide himself with loyal tenants in chief. 
In this, however, he was not successful, for he found the feudal bishops amongst his worst enemies, so that he turned at last for help to the new type of churchmen bred by the Cluniac reform movement, men of learning and culture, monks in their religious observances, statesmen in their outlook. These were at one with him in his desire for a united Germany and a purer church, but Otto was placed by a great problem when he wished to reform and control his bishops. How far were the German clergy under his jurisdiction? How far did they owe obedience only to Rome, as they claimed, if he tried to exert his authority over them? Charlemagne had been able to deal easily with such difficulties, for the Pope had been his ally, almost, it might be said, his vassal, and so they could have but one mind on church matters. By the time of Otto the Great, however, German kings had long ceased to be emperors, and the imperial title, bandied about from one Italian prince to another, had become tarnished in the world's eyes. Was it worthwhile, then, for a German king to regain this title in order to gain control over the See of St. Peter? Students of history, able to test medieval policy by its ultimate results, will answer no, seeing that German kings would have done well to resist the will of the wisp bluer of the crowns of Lombardy and Rome. But to Otto, the question of interference in Italy bore a very different aspect. Too great to be dazzled by the title of emperor, too busy to invade Italy merely for the sake of forcing the Pope to become his ally, Otto found himself faced by the necessity of choosing whether he would make himself lord of the lands on other side of the Alps, or see one of his most powerful subjects, the Duke of Bavaria, do so instead. The occasion of this choice was the murder of Count Lothar of Provence, one of the claimants to the throne of Italy. Lothar's widow, Adelaide, a Burgundian princess, appealed to Germany to avenge her wrongs, a piece of knight-errantry with such prospects of profit that several of the German princes, and notably the Duke of Bavaria, whose lands lay just to the north of the Alps, were only too willing to undertake it. In 951, Otto the Great, anticipating their ambitions, crossed the Alps with an army, rescued Adelaide from her husband's murderer, married her himself, and was crowned King of Italy at Pavia. Recalled to Germany by foreign invasions, he appeared again in Italy ten years later, and in February 962 was crowned Emperor by the Pope at Rome. His successors, dropping the title King of Germany, claimed henceforth to be kings of the Romans on their election, and, after their coronation by the Pope, holy Roman emperors, temporal overlords of Christendom, as the Popes claimed to be spiritual viceroys. This coronation of Otto the Great was a turning point in the history of Germany, though at the time it caused little stir. To Otto himself it was merely the culminating success of his career, enabling him to undertake, without interference, the reform of the German church that he had planned, and also to issue a charter that, while confirming the popes in their temporal possessions, insisted that they should take an oath of allegiance to the emperor before their consecration. By this measure, the papacy became, in the eyes of Europe, merely the chief see in the emperor's dominion, and under Otto's immediate successors, this supremacy was not seriously disputed by the popes themselves. In some cases, they were German nominees, ready to acknowledge the scepter that secured their election. But even where this was not the case, there was a general feeling that Rome had less to fear from the tyranny of emperors beyond the Alps than from the encroachment of the petty lords of Italy. The dukes of Spoletum, counts of Tuscany, and barons of the Roman Campana had no respect at all for the head of Christendom except as a pawn in their political moves. One of the most unscrupulous and dissolute families in the vicinity of Rome, the Crescentia, who claimed the title of patrician once granted by eastern emperors to Italian viceroys, secured the papacy for three successive members of their house. Under the last of these, Benedict IX, a boy of twelve at the time of his election, Vice and tyranny walked through the streets of Rome, rampant and unashamed. The young pope, described by a contemporary as a captain of thieves and brigands, 
did not scruple to crown his sins by selling his holy office in a moment of danger to another of his family. As his excesses had already led the people of Rome to set up an anti-pope, and as he himself withdrew his abdication very shortly, the disgraceful state of affairs culminated in three popes, each denouncing one another and each arming his followers for battle in the streets. The interference of the emperor Henry III, a member of the Salian House of Saxony, was welcomed on all sides, and at the Synod of Sutri the rival popes were all deposed, and a German bishop, chosen by the emperor, elected in their place. Henry III has been described by a modern historian as the strongest prince that Europe had seen since Charlemagne. Not only did he succeed in subduing the unruly Bohemians and Hungarians, but he also built Germany into the temporary semblance of a nation, mastering her baronage and purifying her church. His influence over Italy was wholly for her good. But by the irony of fate, his cousin Bruno, whom he nominated to the See of St. Peter under the name of Leo IX, was destined to lay the foundations of a papacy independent of German control. Bruno himself insisted that he should be elected legally by the clergy and people of Rome, and, though of royal blood, he entered the city barefoot as a penitent. Unlike the haughty Roman nobles, to whom the title Pope had merely seemed an extra means of obtaining worldly honor and pleasure, he remained, after his consecration, gentle and accessible to his inferiors, and devoted his whole time to the work of reform. At his first council, he strongly condemned the sin of simony, and he insisted on the celibacy of the clergy as the only way to free them from worldly distractions and ambitions. In order that his message might not seem intended for Italy alone, he made long journeys through Germany and France. Everywhere he went, he preached the purified ideal of the church upheld by the monks of Cluny. But, side by side with this, he and his successor set another vision that they strove to realize, the predominance of the papacy in Italy as a temporal power. It was Leo IX who, dreading the Norman settlements in southern Italy as a menace to the states of the church, formed a league against the invaders. But after his defeat at their hands, followed shortly by his death, his successors, as we have seen, wisely concluded a peace that left them feudal overlords of Apulia and Calabria. Realizing that, to dominate the affairs of the peninsula, they must remain at home, future popes sent ambassadors called legates to express and explain their will in foreign countries. While in 1059, in a further effort towards independence, Pope Nicholas II revolutionized the method of papal elections. The popes, it was decreed, were no longer to be chosen by the voice of the people and clergy of Rome generally, but only by the cardinals, that is, the principal bishops of the city sitting in secret conclave. This body, the College of Cardinals, was to be free of imperial interference. Behind Pope Nicholas in this daring policy of independence stood one of the most powerful figures of his age, Hildebrand, Archdeacon of Rome. The son of a village carpenter, small, ill-formed, insignificant in appearance, he possessed the shrewd, practical mind and indomitable will of a born ruler of men. It is said that in boyhood his companions found him tracing with the chips and shavings of his father's workshop the words, I shall reign from sea to sea. Yet he began his career by deliberately accepting exile with the best of the popes deposed by the Council of Sutri. And it was Leo the Nine who, hearing of his genius, found him and brought him back to Rome. Gradually, not only successive popes, but the city itself grew to lean upon his strength, and when in 1073 the Holy See was left vacant, a general cry arose from the populace, Hildebrand is Pope, it is the will of St. Peter. Taking the name of Gregory the Seventh, Hildebrand reluctantly, if we are to believe his own account, accepted the headship of the church. Perhaps, knowing how different was his ideal of the office from its reality, he momentarily trembled at the task he had set himself. But, once enthroned, there was no weakness in his manner to the world. In his ears, the words of Christ, 
thou art peter and on this rock i will build my church could never be reconciled with vassalage to any temporal ruler to saint peter and his successors not to emperors or kings had been given the power to bind or loose and gregory's interpretation of this text did not even admit of two co-equal powers ruling christendom by their alliance human pride has created the power of kings he declared god's mercy has created the power of bishops the pope is master of emperors and is rendered holy by the merits of his predecessor saint peter the roman church has never erred and holy scripture proves that it can never err to resist it is to resist god such a point of view if put to any practical test was sure to encounter firm if not violent opposition thus when gregory demanded from william of normandy the oath of fealty alleged to have been promised by the latter to alexander the second in return for the papal blessing upon the conquest of england the conqueror replied by sending rich gifts in token of his gratitude for papal support but supplemented them with a message as uncompromising as the pope's ideal i have not sworn nor will i swear fealty which was never sworn by any of my predecessors to yours william thereupon proceeded to dispose of benefices and bishoprics in his new kingdom as he chose and even went so far as to forbid the recognition of any new pope within his dominions without his leave or the publication of papal letters and decrees that had not received his sanction perhaps if england had been nearer to italy or if william had misused his authority instead of reforming the english church gregory the seventh might have taken up the gauntlet of defiance thus thrown at his feet instead he remained on friendly terms with william and it was in the empire not in england that the struggle between church and state began the emperor henry the third who had summoned the synod of sutri had been a great ruler great enough even to have effected a satisfactory compromise with hildebrand but though before he died he succeeded in securing his crown for his son henry a boy of six he could not bequeath him the strength of character or statesmanship thus from his death in ten fifty six the fortunes of his house and empire slowly waned it is difficult to estimate the natural gifts of the new ruler of germany for an unhappy upbringing warped his outlook and affections left at first under the guardianship of his mother the empress agnes the young henry the fourth was enticed at the age of eleven on board a ship belonging to anno the ambitious archbishop of cologne while he was still admiring her wonders the ship set sail up the rhine and though the boy plunged overboard in an attempt to escape his kidnappers he was rescued and brought back for the next four years he remained first the pupil of archbishop anno who punished him for the slightest fault with harsh cruelty and deprived him of all companionship of his own age and then of adalbert archbishop of bremen who indulged his every whim and passion at length at the age of fifteen handsome and kingly in appearance but utterly uncontrolled and dissolute in his way of life henry was declared of age to govern for himself and straightway began to alienate his barons and people he had been married against his wish to the plain daughter of one of the margraves and expressed his indignation by ill-treating and neglecting her to the wrath of her powerful relations he also built castles on the hilltops in saxony from which his troops oppressed the countryside but the sin for which he was destined to be called into account was his flagrant misuse of his power over the german church at first when reproved by the pope for selling bishoprics and benefices henry was apologetic in his letters but he had no real intention of amending his ways and soon began to chafe openly at roman criticism and threats at last acrimonious disputes came to a head in what is called the investiture question and because it is a problem that affected the whole relation of church and state in the eleventh century it is important to understand what it exactly meant to europe investiture was the ceremony by which a temporal ruler such as a king transferred to a newly chosen church official such as a bishop the lands and rights belonging to his office 
the king would present the bishop with a ring and crozier and the bishop in return would place his hands between those of the king and do him homage like a lay tenant in chief the roman see declared that it was not fitting for hands sacred to the service of god at his altar to be placed in submission between those that a temporal ruler had stained with the blood of war behind this figure of speech lay the real reason the implication that if the ring and the crozier were to be taken as symbols of lands and offices bishops would tend to regard these temporal positions as the chief things in their lives and the oath of homage they gave in exchange as more important than their vow to do god's service gregory the seventh believed that he could not reform the church unless he could detach its officials from dependence on lay rulers who could bribe or intimidate them and in the age in which he lived he could show that for every william of normandy ready to invest good churchmen there were a hundred kings or petty rulers who only cared about good tenants that is landlords who would supply them faithfully with soldiers and weapons as a counter-argument temporal rulers maintained that churchmen who accepted lands and offices were lay tenants in this respect whatever popes might choose to call them the king who lost the power of investing his bishops lost control over wealthy and important subjects and since he would also lose the right to refuse investiture he might find his principal bishoprics in the hands of disloyal rebels or of foreigners about whom he knew nothing the whole question was complicated largely because there was so much truth on both sides gregory however forced the issue and early in ten seventy five in a synod held at rome put forth the famous decree by which lay investiture was henceforth sternly forbidden henry the fourth on the other hand spoiled his case by his wild disregard of justice in the same year he appointed a new archbishop to the important see of milan and invested him without consulting gregory the seventh at all he further proceeded to appoint two unknown foreigners to italian bishoprics angry at the letter of remonstrance which these acts aroused he called a church council at worms in the following year and there induced the majority of german bishops very reluctantly to declare gregory deposed henry king not by usurpation but by god's grace to hildebrand henceforth no pope but a false monk thus began his next letter to the roman pontiff to which hildebrand replied by excommunicating his deposer blessed peter as thy representative i have received from god the power to bind and loose in heaven and on earth for the honor and security of thy church in the name of god almighty i prohibit henry the king son of henry the emperor from ruling germany and italy i release all christians from the oaths of fealty they may have taken to him and i order that no one shall obey him this decree provided occasion for all german nobles whom henry the fourth had alienated to gather together under the banner of the papal legate and for the oppressed saxon countryside to renew the serious revolt which had broken out two years before even the german bishops grew frightened of the part they had played in deposing gregory so that the once powerful ruler found himself looked upon as an outlaw with scarcely a real friend save for the wife he had ill-treated and no hope save submission in the winter of 1066 as an old story tells when the mountains were frozen hard with snow and ice he and his wife and one attendant crossed the alps on sledges and sought the pope in his castle of canosa built amidst the highest regions of the apennines gregory coldly refused him audience the king he intimated might declare that he was repentant he had done so often in the past but words were not deeds putting aside his royal robes and clad in a penitent's woolen tunic henry to show his sincerity remained barefoot for three days like a beggar in the castle yard then only on the entreaty of some italian friends was he admitted to the presence of the pope who at his cry of holy father spare me raised him up and gave him formal forgiveness the scene at canosa is so dramatic in its display of hildebrand's triumph and the emperor's humiliation that it has lived in the world's memory yet it was no closing act in the struggle but merely an episode that passed and left little mark 
Henry the Fourth, as soon as he could win himself a following in Germany and Italy, returned to the practice of lay investiture, and Gregory the Seventh, who had never believed in his sincerity, continued to denounce him and plan the coronation of rival emperors. Imperial ambitions at last reached their height, for Henry the Fourth succeeded in inducing German and Italian bishops to depose Gregory once more, and even appoint an anti-pope in whose name imperial armies ravaged Lombardy, forced their way as far south as Rome, and besieged Hildebrand in the castle of San Angelo. From this predicament, he was rescued by the Normans of South Italy under Robert Guiscard, but these ruthless vassals of the church massacred and looted the holy city directly they had scaled the walls, and when they turned homewards, carrying Gregory the Seventh with them, they left half Rome in ruins. Gregory the Seventh died not long afterwards, homeless and deposed, but with unshaken confidence in the righteousness of his cause. I have loved justice and hated iniquity, he said, during his last illness. Therefore, I die in exile. In exile thou couldst not die, replied a bishop standing at his bedside. Vicar of Christ and his apostles, thou hast received the nations for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Future history was to show that Hildebrand, in defeat, had achieved more than his rival in victory. Henry the Fourth outlived his enemy by twenty-one years, but they were bitter with disillusionment. Harassed by Gregory the Seventh's successors, who continued to advocate papal supremacy, faced by one rebellion after another in Germany and Italy, Henry the Fourth yielded at last to weariness and old age when he found his sons had become leaders of the forces most hostile to him. Even in his submission to their demands, he found no peace, for he was thrust into prison, compelled to abdicate, and left to die miserably of starvation and neglect. In the reign of his son, Henry V, a compromise on the investiture question was arranged between church and empire. By the Concordat of Worms, it was agreed first that rulers should renounce their claim to invest bishops and abbots with a ring in the crozier. These were to be given by representatives of the church to candidates chosen and approved by them. But the second point of importance was that this ceremony must take place in the presence of the king or his representative to whom the new bishop or abbot would at once do homage for his lands and offices. Almost a similar settlement had been arrived at between church and state in England some fifteen years earlier, arising out of the refusal of Anselm, Archbishop of Canterbury, to do homage to Henry I, the conqueror's son. In this case, there was no clash of bitterness and dislike, for the old archbishop was perfectly loyal to the king at heart, though prepared to go to the stake on a matter of conscience, as this question had become to Ernest Churchman. His master, on his side, respected Anselm's saintly character, and only wished to safeguard his royal rights over all his subjects. Compromise was therefore a matter of rejoicing on both sides, and with the decision of the council at Worms, investiture ceased to be a vital problem. Its importance lies in the fact that it was one of the first battles between church and state, and though a compromise, yet a formal victory for the church. The dependence of the papacy on the imperial government that Europe had considered natural in the days of Charlemagne or of Otto the Great was a thing of the past, for the acknowledgment of ecclesiastical freedom from lay supremacy, one of the main issues for which Hildebrand had struggled, schemed, and died, had been won by his successors following in his steps. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve: Europe in the Middle Ages by Ierna Lippard Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve: The Early Crusades. The imperial standards of Constantinople were designed with a two-headed eagle, typifying Constantine's rule over the kingdoms of East and West. Towards the end of the 11th century, this emblem had become more symbolic of the emperor's anxious outlook upon hostile neighbors. With Asia Minor practically lost by the establishment of a Mohammedan dynasty at Nicaea, within 100 miles of the Christian capital, 
with the Bulgarians at the gates of Adrianople, and with the Normans and the popes in possession of his Greek patrimony in Italy, Alexius Comenus, when he ascended the throne of the Caesars, found himself master of an attenuated empire, consisting mainly of strips of Grecian seaboard. Yet, in spite of her shorn territories, Constantinople remained the greatest city in Europe, not merely in her magnificent site and architecture, nor even in her commerce, but in the hold she preserved over the imagination of men. Athenaric the Goth had exclaimed that the ruler of Constantinople must be a god. Eleventh century Europe accepted him as mortal, but still crowned the lord of so great a city with a halo of awe. It was Constantinople that had won the Russians, the Bulgars, and the Slavs from heathenism to Christianity, not to the Catholicism of Western Europe, but to the Greek interpretation of the Christian faith, called by its believers the Orthodox. It was Constantinople whose gold coin, the Byzant, was recognized as the medium of exchange between merchants of all nations. It was Constantinople again, her wealth, her palaces, her glory of pomp and government, that drew Russian, Norse, and Slav adventurers to serve as mercenaries in the emperor's army, just as auxiliaries had clamored of old to join the Roman eagles. Amongst the Varanger bodyguard, responsible for the safety of the emperor's person, were to be found at one time many followers of Harold the Saxon, who, escaping from a conquered England, gladly entered the service of a new master to whom the name Norman was also anathema. Alexius Comenus was in character like his empire, a shrinkage from the dimensions of former days. There was nothing of the practical genius of a Constantine in his unscrupulous ability to mold small things to his advantage, nothing of the heroic Charlemagne in his eminently calculating courage. Yet his daughter Anna Comana, who wrote a history of his reign, regarded him as a model of imperial virtues, and his court, that had ceased to distinguish pomp from greatness and elaborate ceremonial from glory, echoed this fiction. It was this mixture of pretension and weakness, of skill and cunning, of nerve and treachery, so typical of the later Eastern emperors that made the nations of Western Europe, while they admired Byzantium, yet used the word Byzantine as a term of mingled contempt and dislike. The emperor, on his part, had no reason to love his Western neighbors. The popes had robbed him of the exarchate of Ravenna, they had set up a headship of the church in Rome, deaf to the claims of Constantinople. When, in the 8th century, the emperor Leo the Isaurian earned the nickname of iconoclast or image-breaker by a campaign of destruction amongst devotional pictures and images that he denounced as idolatrous, Rome definitely refused to accept this ruling on behalf of Western Christendom. This was the beginning of the actual schism between the Eastern and Western churches, that had been always alien in their outlook. In the ninth century, the breach widened, for Pope Nicholas I supported a patriarch, or bishop of the Eastern Church, deposed by the emperor. Subsequent disputes were rendered irreconcilable in the middle of the 11th century, when the patriarch of Constantinople closed the Latin churches and convents in his diocese and publicly declared the views of Rome heretical. Besides the Pope at Rome, the Eastern Empire possessed other foes in Italy. Chief of these were the Normans, who, not content with acquiring Naples, had, under the leadership of Robert Guiscard and his son Bohemond, captured the famous port of Durazzo on the Adriatic and invaded Macedonia. From this province, they were only evicted by Alexius Comenus after wearying campaigns of guerrilla warfare to which his military ability was better suited than to pitch battles or shock tactics. More subtly dangerous than either Pope or Normans was the commercial rivalry of the merchant cities of the Mediterranean, Pisa, Genoa, and Venice. It was Venice who, from behind her barrier of islands, had watched Attila the Hun lead away his armies in impotent rage. It was Venice, again, who of the North Italian states successfully resisted the feudal domination of Western emperors and kept her own form of republican government, 
inviolate of external control. It was the young Venice, the queen of the Adriatic, as her sons and daughters proudly called her, that could, alone in her commercial splendor and arrogance, compare with the dying glory of Constantinople. Alexius Comenus, in his struggles against Robert Guiscard, had been compelled to call twice upon Venice for the assistance of her fleet. But he paid dearly for this alliance in the trading privileges he was forced to grant in eastern waters. Wherever in the Orient Venetian merchants landed to exchange goods, they were quick to establish a political footing, and the world mart on the Adriatic, into which poured silks and dyes the sugar and spices of Asia, built up under the rule of its doges or dukes a national as well as a commercial reputation. In 1095, necessity spurred Alexius Comenus to appeal not merely to Venice for succor, but to Pope Urban II and all the leading princes of Western Europe. From Jerusalem to the Aegean, he wrote, the Turkish hordes have mastered all, their galleys sweeping the Black Sea and the Mediterranean threaten the imperial city itself, which, if fall it must, had better fall into the hands of Latins than of pagans. These Turks, or Tartars, to whom he referred, were the cause of the Eastern Empire's sudden danger. Descendants of a Mongol race in Central Asia, of which the Huns were also an offshoot, they turned their faces westward some centuries later than the ancestors of Attila, fired by the same love of battle and bloodshed and the same contempt for civilization. To them, the wonderful Arabian kingdom, molded by successive caliphs of Baghdad out of Eastern art, luxury, and mysticism, held no charm save loot. Conquered Greece had endowed Rome with its culture, but the inheritance of Arun el-Rashid bequeathed to its conquerors only the fighting creed of Islam. Mohammedans had faith, the Turkish armies, more dangerous than ever because more fanatical, swept over Persia, Syria, Palestine, and Asia Minor, subjugating Arabs and Christians until they came almost to the Straits of the Bosporus. Here it was that they forced Alexius Comenus to realize his imminent danger and to turn to his enemies in Europe for the protection of his tottering empire. The Latins, or Christians of the West, to whom he appealed, had reasons enough of their own for answering him with ready promises of men and money. From the early days of the church, it had been the custom of pious folk, or of sinners anxious to expiate some crime, to set out in small companies to visit the holy places in Jerusalem, where tradition held that Christ had preached, prayed, and suffered, that there they might give praise to God and seek his pardon. These pilgrimages, with their mixture of good comradeship, danger, and discomfort, had become very dear to the popular mind, and, if not encouraged by the Mohammedan Arabs, had been at least tolerated. Hospitals or sanctuaries were built for the refreshment of weary or sick travelers, and pilgrims, on the payment of a toll, could wander practically where they chose. On the advent of the Turks, all was changed. The holy places became more and more difficult to visit. Christians were stoned and beaten, mulcted of their last pennies and extortionate tolls, and left to die of hunger or flung into dungeons for ransom. Tradition says that a certain French hermit called Peter, who visited Jerusalem during the worst days of Turkish rule, went one night to the Holy Sepulchre weeping at the horrors he had seen, and as he knelt in prayer, it seemed to him that Christ himself stood before him and bade him rouse the faithful to the cleansing of the holy places. With this mission in mind, he at once left the Holy Land and sought Pope Urban II, who had already received the letter of Alexius Comenus and now, fired by the hermit's enthusiasm, willingly promised his support. Whether Urban was persuaded by Peter or no is a matter of doubt, but he at any rate summoned a council to Clermont in 1095 and there, in moving words, besought the chivalry of Europe to set aside its private feuds and either recover the holy places or die before the city where Christ had given his life for the world. It is likely that he spoke from mixed motives. A true inheritor of the theories of Gregory the Seventh, he could not but recognize in the prospect of a religious war, 
where the armies of Europe would fight under the papal banner and at the papal will, the exaltation of the Roman see. Was there not also the hope of bringing the Greek church into submission to the Roman as the outcome of an alliance with the Greek empire? Might not many turbulent, feudal princes be persuaded to journey to the east, who by happy chance would return no more to trouble Europe? Such calculations could Urban's ambitions weave, but with them were entwined unworldly visions that lent him a force and eloquence that no calculations could have supplied. Wherever he spoke, the surging crowd would rush forward with a shout, Deus vult, it is the will of God, and this became the battle cry of the crusaders. The whole world, says a contemporary, desired to go to the tomb of our Lord at Jerusalem. First of all went the meaner people, and then the men of middle rank, and lastly very many kings, counts, marquesses, and bishops, and, thing that never happened before, many women turned their steps in that same direction. The order is significant, and shows that the appeal of Urban and of Peter the Hermit had touched first the heart of the masses to whom the rich man's temptation to hesitate and think of the morrow were of no account. Corn had been dear in France before the Council of Clermont, owing to bad harvests, but the speculators who had bought up the grain to sell at high price to those who later must eat or die, found it left on their hands after the council was over. The men and women of France were selling, not buying, regardless of possible famine, that they might find money to fulfill their burning desire to go to the Holy Land, and there win the Holy Sepulchre and gain pardon for their sins, as Pope and Hermit had promised them. The ordinary crusading route, passed through the Catholic kingdom of Hungary to Bulgaria and thence to Constantinople, where the various companies of armed pilgrims had agreed to meet. It was with the entry into Bulgaria, whose orthodox king was secretly hostile to the pilgrims, that trouble began. Food and drink were grudged by the suspicious natives, even to those willing to pay their way, whereupon the utterly indisciplined forces could not be prevented from retaliating on this inhospitality by fire and pillage. A species of warfare ensued in which Latin stragglers were cut off and murdered by mountain robbers, while the many undesirables who had joined the crusaders, more in hope of loot and adventure than of pardon, brought an evil reputation on their comrades by their greed and the brutality they exhibited toward the peasants. Reason enough was here to account for the pathetic failure of the advance guard of crusaders. The poor, the fanatic, the disreputable, drawn together in no settled organization and with no leaders of military repute. Alexius Comenas, who had demanded an army, not a rabble, dealt characteristically with the problem by shipping these first crusaders in haste and unsupported to Asia Minor. There he left them to fall a prey to the Turks, disease, and their own inadequacy, so that few ever saw the coasts of their native lands again. If the First Crusade began in tragedy, it ended in triumph, through the arrival in Constantinople of a second force from the West, this time of disciplined troops under the chief military leaders of Europe. Alexius Comenus had good cause to remember the prowess of his old enemy, Bohemond, son of Robert Guiscard, who rode at the head of a Sicilian Normans, while other names of repute were Godfrey de Bouillon, Duke of Lorraine, and Robert, the eldest son of William the Conqueror, with Archbishop Odo of Bayeux, his uncle. Some of the crusaders, wrote Anna Comena, were guileless men and women, marching in all simplicity to worship at the tomb of Christ. But there were others of a more wicked kind, to wit, Bohemond and the like. Such men had but one object, to obtain possession of the imperial city. These suspicions, perhaps well-founded, were natural to the daughter of the untrustworthy Alexius Comenus, who trusted nobody. Hating to entertain at his court so many well-armed and often insolent strangers, yet fearing in his heart to aid their advance lest they should set up a rival kingdom to his own, the emperor, having cajoled the leaders into promises of homage for any conquest they might make, at length transported them and their followers across the Hellespont. The Christian campaign began with the capture of Nicaea in 1097, followed by a victorious progress through Asia Minor. 
For nearly a year, the Crusaders besieged and then were in their turn besieged in Antioch, enduring tortures of hunger, thirst, and disease. When courage flagged and hope seemed nearly dead, it was the supposed discovery by one of the chaplains of the lance that had pierced Christ's side as he hung upon the cross that kept the Christians from surrender. With this famous relic born in their midst by the papal legate, the crusaders flung the gates of Antioch wide and issued forth in a charge so irresistible in its certainty of victory that the Turks broke and fled. The defeat became a rout, and Antioch remained as a Christian principality under Bamond when the crusaders marched southward along the coast route toward Jerusalem. They came in sight of this, the goal of their ambitions, on the 7th June, 1099, not garbed as knights and soldiers, but barefooted as humble pilgrims, kneeling in ecstasy of awe upon the Mount of Olives. This mood of prayer passed rapidly into one of fierce determination, and on the 15th of June, Godfrey de Bouillon and his Lorrainers forced a breach in the massy walls, and, hacking their way with sword and spear through the streets, met their fellow crusaders triumphantly entering from another side. The scene that followed, while in keeping with medieval savagery, has left a shameful stain upon the Christianity it professed to represent. Turks, Arabs, and Jews, old men and women, children and babies, thousands of a defenseless population were deliberately butchered as a sacrifice to Christ, who, dying, preached forgiveness. Their crusaders rode their horses up to the knees in the blood of that human shambles. There might no prayers nor crying of mercy prevail, says an eyewitness. Such a slaughter of pagan folk had never been seen nor heard of. None knew their number, save God alone. Their mission accomplished, the majority of crusaders turned their faces homewards. But before they went, they elected Godfrey de Bouillon to be the first ruler of the new Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, with Antioch and Edessa in the north as dependent principalities. Godfrey reigned for almost a year, bearing the title Guardian of the Holy Grave, since he refused to be crowned master of a city where Christ had worn a wreath of thorns. His protest is typical of the genuine humility and love of God that mingled so strangely in his veins with pride and cruelty. When he died, he left a reputation for courage and justice that wove around his memory romance and legends like the tales of Charlemagne. His immediate successors were a brother and a nephew, and it is in the reign of the latter that we first hear mention of the military orders, so famous in the crusading annals of the Middle Ages. These were the Hospitallers, or Knights of St. John, inheritors of the rents and property belonging to the old hospital founded for pilgrims in Jerusalem, and the Templars, so called from their residence near the site of Solomon's Temple. Both orders were bound, like the monks, by the vows of poverty, obedience, and chastity. But the work demanded of them, instead of labor in the fields, was perpetual war against the infidel. When the Templars are summoned to arms, said a 13th century writer, they inquire not of the number, but of the position of their foe. They are lions in war, lambs in the house to the enemies of Christ fierce and implacable, but to Christians kind and gracious. Yet a third order, that of the Teutonic Knights, was founded in the 12th century, arising like that of the Knights of St. John out of a hospital, but one that had been built by German merchants for crusaders of their own race. At the end of the 13th century, the order removed to the southern Baltic, and on these cold, inhospitable shores, embarked on a crusade against the heathen Lithuanians. It is of interest to students of modern history to note that in the 16th century, the last Grand Master of the Teutonic Knights became converted to the doctrines of Luther, suppressed his order, and absorbed the estates into an hereditary fife, the Duchy of Brandenburg. On the Mark and Duchy of Brandenburg, both founded with entirely military objects, was the future kingdom of Prussia built. The Latin kingdom of Jerusalem, 1099 to 1187, survived for more than three quarters of a century. That it had been established with such comparative ease was due not only to the fighting quality of the Crusaders, but also to the feuds that divided Turkish rulers of the House of Seljuk. 
The Turks far outnumbered the Christians, and whenever the caliphs of Baghdad and Cairo should sink their rivalries, or one Moslem ruler in the east gain supremacy over all others, the days of the small Latin kingdom in Palestine would be numbered. In the meantime, the Latins maintained their position with varying fortune. Now, with the aid of fresh recruits from Europe and Genoese and Venetian sailors, capturing coast towns, now losing land outposts there were insufficient garrisons to protect. It was the loss of Edessa that roused Europe to its second crusade, this time through the eloquence of St. Bernard of Clairvaux, who persuaded not only Louis the Seventh of France and his wife Queen Eleanor, but also the at first reluctant Emperor Conrad III to bind the cross in their arms and go to the succor of Christendom. The Christian who slays the unbeliever in the holy war is sure of his reward, more sure if he is slain. The pictures of the glories of martyrdom and of earthly conquest painted by the famous monk were so vivid that on one occasion he was forced to tear up his own robes to provide sufficient crosses for the eager multitude. But the triumph to which he called so great a part of the population of France and Germany proved the beckoning hand of death and failure. Both the king and emperor reached Palestine. Louis the Seventh even visited Jerusalem. But when they sailed homewards, they had accomplished nothing of any lasting value. Edessa remained under Mohammedan rule, and the Christians had been forced to abandon the siege of Damascus that they had intended as a prelude to a victorious campaign. What was worse was that Louis and Conrad had left the chivalry of their armies in a track of whitening bones where they had retreated, victims not merely of Turkish prowess and numbers, but of Christian feuds, Greek treachery, and the failure of food supplies and disease. The Byzantine Empire owed to the First Crusaders large tracts of territory recovered from the Turks in Asia Minor. But, angered by broken promises of homage on the part of Latin rulers, the Greeks repaid this debt in the Second Crusade by acting as spies and secret allies of the Mohammedans. On occasion, they were even to be found fighting openly side by side with the Turks. Yet more merciless than these pagans in their brutal refusal to give food and drink to the stragglers of the Latin armies whom they had so basely betrayed. The widows and orphans of France and Germany, when their rulers returned, bereft both of glory and men-at-arms, reviled St. Bernard as a false prophet. But though he responded sternly that the guilt lay not with God, but in the worldliness of those who had taken the cross, he was sorely troubled at the shattering of his own hopes. The sons of God, he wrote wearily, have been overthrown in the desert, slain with a sword, or destroyed by famine. We promised good things, and behold disorder. The judgments of the Lord are righteous, but this one is an abyss so deep that I must call him blessed who is not scandalized therein. For some years after the Second Crusade, Western Europe turned a deaf ear to entreaties for help from Palestine, and the Latin kingdom of Jerusalem continued to decline steadily, not only in territory, but in its way of life. The enervating climate, the temptations to an unhealthy luxury that forgot Christian ideals, the almost unavoidable intermarriage of the races of East and West, all these sapped the vitality and efficiency of the crusading settlers while the establishment of a feudal government at Jerusalem resulted in the usual quarrels amongst tenants and chief and their sub-tenants. In these feuds, the Hospitallers and Templars joined with an avaricious rivalry unworthy of their creed of self-denial. By 1183, Guy de Lusignan, who had succeeded in seizing the crown of Jerusalem by craft on the failure of the royal line, could only count on the lukewarm support of the majority of Latin barons. Thus handicapped, he found himself suddenly confronted by a union of the Turks of Egypt and Syria under Saladin, Caliph of Cairo, a leader so capable and popular that the downfall of divided enemies was inevitable. At Hatton, near the Lake of Tiberias, on a rocky, waterless spot, the Christians and Mohammedans met for a decisive battle in the summer of 1187. The Latins, hemmed in by superior numbers and tortured by the heat and thirst, fought desperately beneath the relic of the true cross that they had borne with them as an incitement to their courage. But the odds were too great, and King Guy himself was forced to surrender when the defeat of his army had turned into a rout. 
In the autumn of the same year, Jerusalem, after less than a month's siege, opened her gates to the victor. Very different was the entry of Saladin to that of the first crusaders, for instead of a general massacre, the Christian population was put to ransom by the sultan and his brother as an acceptable alms to Allah, freeing hundreds of the poorer classes for whom enough money could not be provided. Europe received the news that the Holy Sepulchre had returned to the custody of the infidel with a shame and indignation that was expressed in the Third Crusade. This time, however, no straggling bands of enthusiasts were encouraged, and though the expedition was approved by the Pope, neither he nor any famous churchmen, such as Peter the Hermit or St. Bernard of Clairvaux, were responsible for the majority of volunteers. The Third Crusade was in character a military campaign of three great nations, of the Germans under the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, or the Redbeard, of the French under Philip II, and of the English under Richard the Lionheart. Other princes, famous enough in their lands for wealth and prowess, sailed also, and had there been union in that great host, Saladin might well have trembled for his empire. He was saved by the utter lack of cohesion and petty jealousies of his enemies, as well as by his statescraft and military skill. While English and French rulers still haggard over the terms of an alliance that would allow them to leave their lands with an easy mind, Frederick Barbarossa, the last to take the cross, set out from Germany, rapidly crossed Hungary and Bulgaria, reduced the Greek emperor to hostile inactivity by threats and military display, and began a victorious campaign through Asia Minor. Here, fate intervened to help the Mohammedans, for while fording a river in Cilicia, the emperor was swept from his horse by the current and drowned. So passed away Frederick the Redbeard, and with him what his strong personality had made an army. Some of the Teutons returned home, while those who remained degenerated into a rabble, easy victims for their enemies' spears and arrows. In the meantime, Richard of England, 1189-99, to and Philip of France had clasped the hand of friendship and, having levied the Saladin tithe, a tax of one-tenth of the possessions of all their subjects, in order to pay their expenses, set sail eastward from Marseilles. Both were young and eager for military glory, but the French king could plot and wait to achieve the ultimate success he desired, while in Richard the statesman was wholly sunk in the soldier of fortune. To medieval chroniclers there was something dazzling in the Lionheart's physical strength and in the sheer daring with which he would force success out of apparently inevitable failure or realize some dangerous enterprise. Though fortune wreaks her spleen on whomever she pleases, yet he was not drowned for all her adverse waves. The Lord of Ages gave him such generosity of soul and endued him with such virtues that he seemed rather to belong to earlier times than these. To record his deeds would cramp the writer's finger joints and stun the hearer's mind. Such are a few of the many flattering descriptions, the obvious sincerity of which paints the English king as he seemed to the man who fought beside him. A clever strategist, a born leader in battle, fearless himself and with a restless energy that inspired him when sick to be carried on cushions in order to direct the fire of his stone slingers, Richard turned his golden qualities of generalship to dust by his utter lack of diplomacy and tact. Of gifts such as these that are one half of kingship, he was not so much ignorant as heedless. He willed to do things like his great ancestor, the conqueror, but his sole weapon was his right hand, not the subtlety of his brain. The king of England had gallows erected outside his camp to hang the thieves and robbers on deeming it that no matter what country the criminals were, he considered every man as his own and left no wrong unavenged. This typical high-handed action, no doubt splendid in theory as a method of discouraging the crimes that had helped to ruin previous campaigns, was, when put into practice, sufficient alone to account for the hatred Richard inspired amongst rulers whose subjects he thus chose to judge and execute at will. The King of France, we are told, winked at the wrongs his men inflicted and received, but he gained friends, while Richard's progress was a series of embittered feuds accepted lightheartedly without any thought of his own future interests 
or those of the crusade. Open rupture with Philip II of France was brought about almost before they had left the French coast through Richard's repudiation of his ally's sister, to whom he had been betrothed, since the English king was now determined on a match with Berengaria, the daughter of the king of Navarre. In South Italy, he acquired his next enemies in both claimants then disputing the crown of Sicily. But before he sailed away, he had battered one of the rivals, the Norman Tancred, into an outwardly submissive ally after a battle in the streets of Messina. The other rival, Henry, son of Frederick Barbarossa, and afterwards the Emperor Henry VI, remained his enemy, storing up a grudge against him in the hopes of a suitable opportunity for displaying it. From Cyprus, Richard, pursuing military glory, drove its Greek ruler, because he had dared to imprison some shipwrecked Englishmen. And thus, adding an island to his dominions and the eastern emperor to his list of foes, arrived at last in Palestine in the summer of 1191, just in time to join Philip II in the siege of Acre. The two kings and peoples did less together than they would have done separately, and each set but light store by the other. So the tale runs in the contemporary chronicle. And when Acre at last surrendered, the feuds between English and French had grown so irreconcilable that Philip II, who had fallen sick, sulkily declared that he had fulfilled his crusading vow and departed homewards. Not long afterwards went Leopold, Archduke of Austria, nursing cold rage against Richard in his heart because of an insult to his banner that, planted on an earthwork beside the arms of England, had been contemptuously flung into the ditch below. The Lionheart was now master of the enterprise in Palestine, a terror to the Turks, who would use his name to frighten their unruly children into submission. But though he remained fourteen months, the jealousies and rivalries of his camp, with which he was not the man to contend, kept him dallying on the coast route to Jerusalem, unable to proceed by open warfare or to get the better of the wily Saladin in his diplomacy. News came that Philip II and the Emperor Henry VI were plotting with his brother John for his ruin at home, and Richard, weary at heart and sick in health, agreed to a three years and eighth months truce that left the Christians in the possession of the seaports of Jaffa and Tyre, with the coastal territory between them, and gave pilgrims leave to visit Jerusalem untaxed. He himself refused, with tears in his eyes, even to gaze from a distant height on the city he could not conquer. But, vowing he would return, he set sail for the west in the autumn of 1192, and with his departure the Third Crusade ended. There were to be many other crusades, but none that expressed in the same way as these first three expeditions the united aspirations of Western Europe for the recovery of the land of the Holy Sepulchre. National jealousies had ruined the chances of the Third Crusade, and with every year the spirit of nationality was to grow in strength and make common action less possible for Europe. There is another reason also for the changing character of the Crusades, namely the loss of the religious enthusiasm in which they had had their origin. Men and women had believed that the cross on their arms could turn sinners into saints, break down battlements, and destroy infidels as if by miracle. When they found that human passions flourished as easily in Palestine as at home, and that the way of salvation was, as ever, the path of hard labor and constant effort, they were disillusioned, and eager multitudes no longer clamored to go to the east. The Crusades did not stop suddenly, but degenerated with a few exceptions into mere political enterprises, patronized now by one nation, now by another. The armies were recruited by mere love of adventure, lust of battle, or the desire for plunder. If Western Christendom had gained no other blessing by them, the early Crusades at least freed the nations at a critical moment from a very large proportion of the unruly baronage that had been a danger to commerce and good government. England paid heavily in gold for the Third Crusade, but the money supplied by merchants and towns was well spent in securing from the Lionheart privileges and charters that laid the foundations of municipal liberty. In France, the results of the Second Crusade had been for the moment devastating. Whole villages marched away, cities and castles stood empty, 
and in some provinces it was said scarce one man remained to seven women. In the orgy of selling that marked this exodus, lands and possessions rapidly changed hands, the smaller fiefs tending to be absorbed by the larger fiefs, and many of these, in their turn, by the crown. Aided also by other causes, the king of France, with his increased domains and revenues, came to assume a predominant position in the national life. Perhaps the chief effect of the Crusades on Europe, generally, was the stimulus of new influences. Men and women, if they live in a rut and feed their brains continually on the same ideas, grow prejudiced. It is good for them to travel and come in contact with opposite views of life and different manners and customs, however much it may annoy them at the time. The Crusades provided this kind of stimulus not only to the commerce of Mediterranean ports, but in the world of thought, literature, and art. The necessity of transport for large armies improved shipbuilding, the cunning of Turkish foes, the ingenuity of Christian armorers and engineers, the influence of Byzantine architecture and mosaics, the splendor of Venice and stone and color. Western Europe continued to hate the East, but she could not live without her silks, spices, and perfumes, nor forget the dream of the fabulous wonders of Cathay. Thus the age of the Crusades will be seen at last to merge its failures in the successes of an age of discovery that were to lay bare a new west and another road to the Orient. End of chapter 12Chapter 13 of Europe in the Middle Ages by Irna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13. The Making of France. Amongst those who took the cross during the Second Crusade had been Louis VII of France and his wife, Queen Eleanor. They were an ill-matched pair, the king of mediocre ability, weak, peace-loving, and pious. Eleanor, like all the house of Aquitaine to which she belonged, imperious, fierce-willed, and without scruple, for she loved or hated. Restless excitement had prompted her journey to Palestine, and Louis was impelled by the scandal to which her conduct there gave rise, and also by his annoyance that they had no son, to divorce her soon after they returned home. The foolishness of this step, from a political point of view, can be gauged by studying a map of France in the middle of the 12th century, and remembering that, though king of the whole country in name, Louis, as a feudal overlord, could depend on little but the revenues and forces to be raised from his own estates. These lay in a small block round Paris, while away to the north, east, and south were the provinces of tenants-in-chief three or four times as extensive in area as those of the royal house of Capet. By marrying Eleanor, Countess of Poitou and Duchess of Aquitaine, Louis had become direct ruler of the middle and southwest of France, as well as of his own crown domains. But when he divorced his wife, he at once forfeited her possessions. Worse, from his point of view, was to follow, for Eleanor made immediate use of her freedom to marry Henry, Count of Anjou, a man fourteen years her junior, but the most important tenant-in-chief of the King of France, and therefore, if he chose, not unlikely to prove that king's most dangerous enemy. This Henry, besides being Count of Anjou, Maine, and Touraine, was also Duke of Normandy and King of England, for he was a grandson of Henry I, and had, in 1154, succeeded the feeble Stephen, of the anarchy of whose reign we gave a slight description in another chapter. Before dealing with the results of Henry's marriage with the heiress of Aquitaine, it is well to note his work as King of England, for this was destined to be the greatest and most lasting of all the many tasks he undertook. In character, Henry was the exact opposite of Stephen. Where the other had wavered, he pressed forward, utterly determined to be the master of his own land. One by one he besieged the rebel barons and leveled with the ground the castles they had built in order to torture and oppress their neighbors. He also took from them the crown lands which Stephen had recklessly given away in the effort to buy popularity and support. When he found that many of these nobles had usurped the chief offices of state, 
he replaced them as quickly as he could by men of humble rank and of his own choosing. In this way, he appointed a Londoner, Thomas Becket, whom he had first created Chancellor, to be Archbishop of Canterbury. But the impetuous choice proved to be one of his few mistakes. Henry was so self-confident himself that he was apt to underrate the abilities of those with whom life brought him in contact and to believe that every other will must necessarily bow to his own. It is certain that he found it difficult to pause and listen to reason, for his restless energy was ever spurring him on to fresh ambitions, and he could not bear to waste time, as he thought, in listening to criticisms on what he had already decided. Chroniclers describe how he would fidget impatiently or draw pictures during Mass, commending the priest who read the fastest, while he would devote odd moments of his day to patching his old clothes for want of something more interesting to do. Henry II was so able that haste in his case did not mean that his work was slipshod. He had plenty of foresight and did not content himself with destroying those of his subjects who were unruly. He knew that he must win the support of the English people if he hoped to build up his estates in France. And this though destined to bear no lasting fruit, was ever his chief ambition. Henry II was one of the greatest of English kings, but he had been brought up in France and remained more of an Angevin than an Englishman at heart. Instead of driving his barons into sulky isolation, Henry summoned them frequently to his magnum concilium, or great council, and asked their advice. When they objected to serving with their followers in France as often as he wished, he arranged a compromise that was greatly to his advantage. This was the institution of scutage or shield money, a tax paid by the barons in order to escape military service abroad. With the funds that scutage supplied, Henry could hire mercenary troops while the feudal barons lost a military training ground. Besides consulting his great council, destined to develop into our national parliament, Henry strengthened the Curia Regis, or King's Court, that his grandfather Henry I had established to deal with questions of justice and finance. The barons in the time of Stephen had tried to make their own feudal courts entirely independent of royal authority. But Henry, besides establishing a central court of justice to which any subject who thought himself wronged might appeal for a new trial, greatly improved and extended the system of itinerant justices whose circuits through the country to hold pleas of the crown had been instituted by Henry I. This interference, he found, was resented not only by the feudal courts, but also by the sheriffs of the county courts, the Norman form of the old shire moots, a popular institution of Anglo-Saxon times. Of late years, the latter courts had more and more fallen under the domination of neighboring landowners, and, in order to free them, Henry held an inquest into the doings of the sheriffs and deposed many of the great nobles who had usurped these offices, replacing them by men of lesser rank who would look to him for favor and advice. Other sovereigns in Europe adopted somewhat similar means of exalting royal authority. But England was fortunate in possessing such popular institutions as the moots or meetings of the shire and hundred through which Henry could establish his justice instead of merely through crown officials who would have no personal interest in local conditions. By the assize of Clarendon, it was decreed that twelve men from each hundred and four from each township should decide in criminal cases who amongst the accused were sufficiently implicated to be justly sentenced by the royal judges. Local representatives also were employed on other occasions during Henry's reign in assisting as judges in assessing taxes and in deciding how many weapons and what sort the ordinary freeman might fittingly carry to the safety of his neighbors and of himself. In civil cases, as when the ownership of land or personal property was in dispute, twelve lawful men of the neighborhood, or in certain cases twelve knights of the shire, were to be elected to help the sheriff arrive at a just decision. In this system of recognition, as it was called, lay the germ of our modern jury. It is probable that the knights and representatives of the hundreds and townships 
grumbled continually at the trouble and expense to which the king's legislation put them for neither they nor henry the second himself would realize that they were receiving a splendid education in the ABC of self-government. That must be the foundation of any true democracy. Yet a few generations later, when Henry's weak grandson and namesake, Henry III, misruled England, the Knights of the Shire were already accepted as men of public experience and their representatives summoned to a parliament to defend the liberties of England. Henry II used popular institutions and crown officials as levers against the independence of his baronage, but the chief struggle of his reign in England was not with the barons so much as with the church. Thomas Becket, as chancellor, had been Henry's right hand in attacking feudal privileges. He had warned his master that as a leading churchman his love might turn to hate his help to opposition. The king refused to believe him, thrust the burden of the Archbishopric of Canterbury on his unwilling shoulders, and then found, to his surprise and rage, that he had secured the election of a very Hildebrand, who held so high a conception of the dignity of the church that it clashed with royal demands at every turn. One of the chief subjects of dispute was the claim of the church to reserve for her jurisdiction all cases that affected clerks, that is, not only priests, but men employed in the service of the church, such as acolytes or choristers. The king insisted that clerks convicted in ecclesiastical courts of serious crimes should be handed over to the royal courts for secular punishment. His argument was that if a clerk had committed a murder, the ecclesiastical judge was not allowed by canon law to deliver a death sentence, and so could do no more than unfrock the guilty man and fine or imprison him. Thus, a clerk could live to commit two murders, where a layman would, by command of the royal judges, be hung at the first offense. Becket, on his side, would not swerve from his opinion that it was sacrilege for royal officials to lay hands on a priest or clerk, whether criminous or not. And when Henry embodied his suggestions of royal supremacy in a degree called the Constitutions of Clarendon, the archbishop publicly refused to sign his agreement to them. Threats and insults were heaped upon him by angry courtiers, and one of his attendants, terrified by the scene, exclaimed, Oh, my master, this is a fearful day. The day of judgment will be yet more fearful, answered the undaunted Becket, and in the face of his fearlessness, no one at the moment dared lay hands on him. Shortly afterwards, Becket fled abroad, hoping to win the support of Rome. But the Pope, to whom he appealed, did not wish to quarrel with the King of England, and used his influence to patch up an agreement that was far too vague to have any binding strength. Thomas Becket returned to Canterbury, but exile had not modified his opinions, and he had hardly landed before he once more appeared in open opposition to Henry's wishes excommunicating those bishops who had dared to act during his absence without his leave. The rest of the story is well known. The ungovernable rage of the Angevin king at an obstinacy as great as his own, his rash cry, Is my house so full of fools and dastards that none will avenge me on this upstart clerk? And then his remorse on learning that four knights who had taken him at his word and murdered the archbishop as he knelt, still undaunted on the altar steps of Canterbury Cathedral. So great was the horror and indignation of Europe, even of those who were devoted to Henry's cause, that the king was driven to strip and scourge himself before the tomb of Thomas the Martyr as a public act of penance, and all question of the supremacy of the state over the church was for the time dropped. One of the many pilgrims who in the next two years visited the shrine of St. Thomas of Canterbury in hope of a miracle was Louis the Seventh of France, and the miracle that he so earnestly desired was the recovery of his son and heir Philip Augustus from a fever that threatened his life. With many misgivings, the old king crossed the channel to the land of a ruler with whom he had been at almost constant war since Eleanor of Aquitaine's remarriage, but his faith in the vision of the martyr that had prompted his journey was rewarded. Henry received him with great rejoicing and honor, after the manner of a loyal vassal, 
and when the French king returned home, he found his son convalescent. The sequel to this journey, however, was the sudden paralysis and lingering death of Louis himself, and the coronation of the boy prince in whom France was to find so great a ruler. When the bells of Paris had rung out the joyous tidings of his birth one hot August evening fourteen years before, a young British student had just put his head out of his lodging window and demanded the news. A boy, answered the citizens, has been given to us this night, who by God's grace shall be the hammer of your king, and who beyond a doubt shall diminish the power and lands of him and his subjects. One half of the reign of Philip Augustus, le Dieu donné, or God given, was the fulfillment of this prophecy. At first sight, it would seem as though Henry II of England entered the lists against his overlord, the champion of France, with overwhelming odds in his favor. Ruler of a territory stretching from Scotland, his dependency to the Pyrenees, he added to his lands and wealth the brain of a statesman and the experience of long years of war and intrigue. What could a mere boy, fenced round even in his capital of Paris by turbulent barons, hope to achieve against such strength? Yet the weapons of destruction lay ready to his hand in the very household of the Angevin ruler himself. Legend records that the blood of some demon ancestress ran in the veins of the dukes of Aquitaine, endowing them with a ferocity and falseness strange even to medieval minds, and the sons whom Eleanor bore to her second husband were true to this bad strain, if to nothing else. Dost thou not know, wrote one of them to his father, who had reproached him for plotting against his authority, that it is our proper nature that none of us should love the other, but that ever brother should strive with brother and son against father? I would not that thou shouldst deprive us of our hereditary right and seek to rob us of our nature. Louis the Seventh, in order to weaken Henry the Second, had encouraged this spirit of treachery and even provided a refuge for Becket during his exile. His policy was continued by Philip Augustus, who kept open house at Paris for the rebellious family of his tenant-in-chief whenever misfortune drove them to fly before their father's wrath or ambition brought them to hatch some new conspiracy. Could Henry have once established the same firm grip he had obtained in England over his French possessions, he might have triumphed in the struggle with both sons and overlord. But in Poitou and Aquitaine, he was merely regarded as Eleanor's consort, and the people looked to his heirs as rulers, especially to Richard, his mother's favorite. Yet never had they suffered a reign of greater license and oppression than under the reckless and selfish Lionheart. After much secret plotting and open rebellion, Henry succeeded in imprisoning Eleanor, who had encouraged her sons to defy their father. But with Richard supported by Philip Augustus and the strength of southern France, he was forced to come to terms toward the end of his reign. Though only fifty-six, he was already failing in health, and the news that his own province of mine was fast falling to his enemies had broken his courage. Cursing the son who had betrayed him, he sullenly renewed the oath of homage he owed to Philip, and promised to Richard the wealth and independence he had demanded. The compact signed, he rode away, heavy with fever, to his castle of Chinon, and there, indifferent to life, sank into a state of stupor. News was brought to him that his youngest son, John, for whom he had carved out a principality in Ireland, had been a secret member of the league that had just brought him to his knees. Is it true, he asked, roused for the minute, that John, my heart, has deserted me? Reading the answer in the downcast faces of his attendants, he turned his face to the wall. Now let things go as they will. I care no more for myself or the world. Thus the old king died. In 1189, Richard the False succeeded his father, and by his prowess in Palestine became Richard Coeur de Lyon. How he quarreled with Philip II we have seen in the last chapter, and that Philip, after the siege of Acre, returned home in disgust at the other's overbearing personality. Philip Augustus does not cut the same heroic figure on the battlefield as his rival. 
Indeed, there was no match in Europe for the devil of Aquitaine, who knew not the word fear, and the glamour of whose feats of arms has outlasted seven centuries. It is in kingship that Philip stands preeminent in his own age, ready to do battle at the right moment, but still more ready to serve France by patient statecraft. While Richard remained in Palestine, Philip plotted with the ever-treacherous John for their mutual advantage at the absent king's expense. But their enmity remained secret until the joyful news arrived that the royal crusader had been captured in disguise on his way home by the very Leopold of Austria whose banner he had once contemptuously cast into a ditch. Now the Duke of Austria's overlord was the Emperor Henry the Sixth, whose claims to Sicily Richard had often derided, and the Lionheart, passing from the dungeon of the vassal to that of the overlord, did not escape until his subjects had paid a huge ransom, and he himself had promised to hold England as a fief of the empire. Beware, the devil is loose, wrote Philip to John, when he heard that their united efforts to bribe Henry the Sixth into keeping his prisoner permanently had failed. The next few years saw a prolonged struggle between the French armies that had invaded Normandy and the forces of Richard, who, burning for revenge, proved as terrible a rival to Philip in the north of France as he had been in the east, and the duel continued until a poisoned arrow pierced the Lionheart's shoulder, causing his death. God visited the land of France, wrote a chronicler, for King Richard was no more. From this moment, Philip Augustus began to realize his most cherished ambitions, slowly at first, but thanks to the worst of the English kings, with ever-increasing rapidity. John, who had succeeded Richard, was neither statesman nor soldier. To meaningless outbursts of Angevin rage, he added the treachery and cruelty of the House of Aquitaine and a sluggish disregard of dignity and ordinary decency peculiarly his own. Soon all his subjects were banded together against him in fear, hatred, and scorn. The church, on whose privileges he trampled, the barons whose wives and daughters were unsafe at his court, and whose lands he ravaged and confiscated, the people, whom his mercenaries tortured and oppressed. How he quarreled with the chapter of Canterbury over its choice of an archbishop, defied Pope Innocent III, and then, brought to his knees by an interdict, did homage to the Holy See for his possessions, these things, and the signing of Magna Carta, the English Charter of Popular Liberties at Runnymede, are tales well known in English history. What is important to emphasize here in a European history is the contrast of the unpopularity that John had gained for himself amongst all the classes of his own subjects at the very moment that Philip Augustus seemed, in French eyes, to be indeed their God-given king. While John feasted at Rouen, messengers brought word that Philip was conquering Normandy. Let him alone. Some day I will win back all that he has taken, so answered the sluggard. But when he at last raised his standard, it was already too late. The English barons would have followed Cour de Lyon on the road to Paris. They were reluctant to take sword out of scabbard for John. The very Angevins and Normans were beginning to realize that they had more in common with their French conquerors than with any king across the Channel. Aquitaine, it is true, looked sourly on Philip's progress, but the reason was not that she loved England, but that she feared the domination of Paris, and made it a systematic part of her policy for years to support the ruler who lived farthest away, and would therefore be likely to interfere the least in her internal affairs. In 1214, John made his most formidable effort, dispatching an army to Flanders to unite with that of the powerful Flemish Count Ferrand, one of Philip's tenants-in-chief, and with the Emperor Otto IV in a combined attack on the northern French frontier. At Bovin, the armies met, Philip Augustus in command of his forces, riding with a joyful face no less than if he had been bidden to a wedding. The battle, when it opened, found him wherever the fight was hottest, wielding his sword, encouraging, rallying, until by nightfall he remained victor of the field, with the Count of Flanders and many another of his chief enemies, including the English commander, prisoners at his mercy. 
Philip carried Count Ferrand behind him in chains on his triumphal march to Paris, while all the churches along the way rang their bells, and the crowds poured forth to cheer their king and sing te deums. The Battle of Bovin was perhaps the most important engagement ever fought on French soil, so wrote a modern historian before the War of 1914. In the days of Louis the Seventh, the kings of France had stood dwarfed amid dukes of Normandy and Aquitaine and counts of Flanders and Anjou. Now the son of Louis had defeated an emperor, thrown one rebellious tenant-in-chief into a dungeon, and from another, the Angevin John gained as the reward of his victory all the long coveted provinces north of the Loire. Even the crown treasury, once so poor, was replete for the time with the revenues of the confiscated Norman and Angevin estates of the English barons, who had been forbidden by their sovereign to do homage any more to a French overlord. Philip Augustus had shown himself Philip the Conqueror, but he was something far greater, a king who, like Henry II of England, could build as well as destroy. During his reign, the menace of the old feudal baronage was swept away, and the government received its permanent stamp as a servant of the monarchy. In his dealing with the French church, Philip followed the traditions of Pepin the Short and Charlemagne, yet gratifying as were his numerous gifts to monasteries and convents, they were dovetailed into a scheme of combining the liberal patron with a firm master. That good relations between king and clergy resulted was largely due to Philip's policy of replacing bishops belonging to powerful families by men of humble origin accustomed to subservience. Also, he would usually support the lesser clergy in their frequent quarrels with their ecclesiastical superiors, thus weakening the leaders while he won the affection of the rank and file. Like John, he came into collision with the iron will of Pope Innocent III, but on a purely moral question, his refusal to live with the Danish princess Ingeborg, to whom he had taken a violent and unaccountable dislike on his wedding day. The bride was a girl of eighteen. She could speak no French. Her husband's bishops were afraid to uphold her cause, whatever their secret opinions, but in appealing to the Pope for help, she gained an unyielding champion. In other chapters, we shall see Innocent III as a politician and a persecutor of heretics. Here he stands as the moral leader of Europe, and no estimate of his character and work would be fair that neglected this aspect. It was to Innocent's political advantage to please the French king, whose help he needed to chastise the English John, and to support a crusade against an outburst of heresy in Languedoc. Moreover, he had no armies to compel a king who accused his wife of witchcraft to recognize her as queen. Yet Innocent believed that Philip was in the wrong, and when the French king persuaded his bishops to divorce him, and then promptly married again, papal letters proceeded to denounce the divorce as a farce and the new marriage as illegal. Recall your lawful wife, wrote Innocent, and then we will hear all that you can righteously urge. If you do not do this, no power shall move us to right or left until justice be done. This letter was followed by threats of excommunication, and after some months by an interdict that reduced Philip to a promise of submission in return for a full inquiry into his case. The promise so grudgingly given remained but a promise, and it was not until 1213, nearly twenty years since he had so cruelly repudiated Ingeborg, that, driven by continual papal pressure and the critical state of his fortunes, Philip openly acknowledged the Danish princess as his wife and queen. We have seen something of Philip's dealings with his greater tenants-in-chief, but such achievements as the conquest of Normandy and Anjou and the victory of Bovin were but the fruits of years of diplomacy during which the royal power had permeated the land, like ether the atmosphere, almost unnoticed. In lending a sympathetic ear to the complaints of Richard and his brothers against their father, Philip was merely carrying out the policy we have noticed in his treatment of the church. He never began a new campaign without forming alliances that might support him at each step, says Philip's modern biographer, and these allies were often the sub-tenants of large feudal estates to whom in the days of peace he had given his support against the claims of their feudal overlords. 
Sometimes he had merely used his influence as a mediator. At others, he had granted privileges to the tenants, or else he had called the case in dispute before his own royal court for judgment. By one means or another, at any rate, he had made the lesser tenants feel that he was their friend, so that when he went out to battle, they would flock eagerly to his banner, sometimes in defiance of their overlord. One danger to the crown lay not in the actual feudal baronage, but in the prevos, officials appointed by the king with power to exact taxes, administer the laws, and judge offenders in his name in the provinces. When the monarchy was weak, these prevos, from lack of control, developed into petty tyrants, and it was fortunate for Philip that their encroachments were resented by both nobles and clergy, so that a system of reform that reduced them again to a subordinate position was everywhere welcomed. Gradually, a link was established between local administration and the king's council, namely, officials called in the north of France bailies, in the south seneschals, whose duty it was to keep a watch over the preval and to depose or report him if necessary. The preval was still to collect the royal revenues as of old, but the bailey would take care that he did not cheat the king and would forward the money that he received to the central government. He would also hold assizes and from time to time visit Paris, where he would give an account of local conditions and how he had dealt with them. In these reforms, as in those of Henry II of England, a process that was gradually changing the face of Europe can be seen at work. First, a crumbling of feudal machinery too clumsy to keep pace with the needs and demands of dawning civilization, and next, its replacement by an official class educated in the intricacies of finance, justice, and administration, and dependent not on the baronage but on the monarchy for its inspiration and success. The chief nobles of France in early medieval times had regarded such titles as mayor of the palace, seneschal, chamberlain, butler, and the like, as bestowing both hereditary glory and also political power. With the passing of years, some of the titles vanished, while under Philip Augustus and his grandson Louis the Ninth, those that remained passed to new men of humbler rank, who bore them merely while they retained the office, or else, shorn of any political power, continued as honors of the court and ballroom. In effect, the royal household, once a kind of general servant doing a bit of everything inadequately as in the days of Charlemagne, had now developed into two distinct bodies, each with their separate sphere of work. The great nobles surrounding their sovereign with the dignity and ceremonial in which the Middle Ages rejoiced, the trained officials advising him and carrying out his will. In his attitude to the large towns, except on his own crown lands, where, like other landowners, he hesitated to encourage independence, Philip II showed himself sympathetic to the attempts of citizens to throw off the yoke of neighboring barons, bishops, and abbots. Many of the towns had formed communes, that is, corporations, something like a modern trade union, but these, though destined to play a large part in French history, were as yet only in their infancy. They had their origin sometimes in a revolutionary outburst against oppression, but often in a real effort on the part of leading townsmen to organize the civil life on profitable lines by means of guilds or associations of merchants and traders with special privileges and laws. Some of the privileges at which these city corporations aimed were the right to collect their own taxes, to hold their own law courts for deciding purely local disputes, and to protect their trade against fraud, tyranny, and competition from outside. It all sounds natural enough to modern ears, but it awoke profound indignation in a French writer of the 12th century. The word commune, he says, is new and detestable, for this is what it implies that those who owe taxes shall pay the rent that is their due to their lord but once in the year only, and if they commit a crime against him, they shall find pardon when they have made amends according to a fixed tariff of justice. Except within his own domains, Philip too readily granted charters confirming the communes in their coveted rights, and he also founded new towns under royal protection, offering there, upon certain conditions, a refuge to escaped serfs able to pay the necessary taxes. 
In Paris itself, his reign marks a new era, when, instead of a town famed according to a chronicler of the day, chiefly for its pestiferous smells, there were laid the foundations of one of the most luxurious cities of Europe. The cleansing and paving of the filthy streets, the building of fortifications, of markets, and of churches, and above all, that glory of Gothic architecture, Notre Dame de la Victoire, founded to celebrate the triumph of Beauvin. Such were some of the works planned or undertaken in the capital during this reign. Over the young University of Paris, the king also stretched out a protecting hand, defending the students from the hostility of the townfolk by the command that they should be admitted to the privileges enjoyed by priests. For this practical sympathy, he and his successors were well repaid in the growth of an educated public opinion ready to exalt its patron the crown by tongue and pen. Philip Augustus died in July 1223. Great among the many great figures of his day, French chroniclers have yet left no distinct impression of his personality. It would almost seem as if the will, the foresight, and the patience that have won him fame in the eyes of posterity built up a baffling barrier between his character and those who actually saw him. Men recognized him as a king to be admired and feared, august in his conquest, terrible in his wrath if any dared cross his will. But his reserve, his indifference to court gaiety, his rigid attitude of dislike to those who used oaths or blasphemy, they found wholly unsympathetic and strange. Of the great work he had done for France, they were too close to judge fairly, and would have understood him better had he been rash and heedless of design like the Lionheart. For a real appreciation of Philip Augustus, we must turn to his modern biographer. Quote, he had found France a small realm, hedged in by mighty rivals. When he began his reign, but a very small portion of the French-speaking people owned his sway. As suzerain, his power was derided. Even as immediate lord, he was defied and said it not. But when he died, the whole face of France was changed. The king of the Franks was undisputedly the king of by far the greater part of the land, and the internal strength of his government had advanced as rapidly and as securely as the external power. Such was the change in France itself. But we can estimate also today what no contemporary of Philip Augustus could have realized, the effect of that change on Europe, when France, from a collection of feudal fiefs, stood forth at last a nation in the modern sense, ready to take her place as a leader amongst her more backward neighbors. End of chapter 13「Europe in the Middle Ages」by Ierna Lifford Plunkett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14 Empire and Papacy When the Emperor Henry IV crossed the ice-bound Alps on his journey of submission to Canossa, he was accompanied by a faithful knight, Frederick of Buren, whom he later rewarded for his loyalty with the hand of his daughter and the title Duke of Swabia. Frederick's son was elected emperor as Conrad III, the first of the imperial line of Hohenstaufen that was destined to carry on, through several generations, the war between empire and papacy. The Hohenstaufen received their name from a hill on which stood one of Frederick of Buren's strongest castles, but they were also called Wablingen, after a town in their possession, while the House of Bavaria, their chief rivals, was called Welf, after an early ancestor. The feud of Wablingen and the Welfs that convulsed Germany had no less devastating an effect upon Italy, always exposed to influence from beyond the Alps, and the names of the rivals, corrupted on Italian tongues into Ghibellines and Gulfs, became party cries throughout the 13th and 14th centuries. In our last chapter, we spoke of French communes, municipalities that rebelled against their overlords, setting up a government of their own. The same process of emancipation was at work in North Italy, only that it was able to act with greater rapidity and success for a time 
on account of the national tendency towards separation and the vigor of town life. In France, says a 13th century Italian in surprise, only the townspeople dwell in towns. The knights and noble ladies stay on their own domains. Certainly the contrast with this native Lombardy was strong. There, each city lived like a fortified kingdom on its hilltop, or in the midst of wide plains, cut off from its neighbors by suspicion, by jealousy, by competition. In the narrow streets, noble and knight jostled shoulders perforce with merchants, students, mountebanks, and beggars. The limits of space dictated that many things in life must be shared in common, whether religious processions or plagues, and if street fighting flourished in consequence, so also did class intimacy and a sharpening of wits as well as of swords. Thus, the towns of North Italy, like flowers in a hothouse, bore fruits of civilization in advance of the world outside, whether in commerce, painting, or the art of self-government and visitors from beyond the Alps stared astonished at merchants' luxurious palaces that made the castles of their own princes seem mere barbarian strongholds. Yet this profitable independence was not won without struggles so fierce and continuous that they finally endangered the political freedom in whose interests they had originally been waged. At first, the struggle was with barbarian invaders, and here, as in the case of Rome and the Popes, it was often the local bishops who, when emperors at Constantinople ceased to govern except in name, fostered the young life of the city-states and educated their citizens in a rough knowledge of war and statecraft. With the dawn of feudalism, bishops degenerated into tyrants, and municipalities began to elect consuls and advisory councils, and under their leadership to rebel against their former benefactors, and to establish governments independent of their control. The next danger was from within. The cities are swayed more easily than nations, and too often the communes of Lombardy became the prey of private factions or of more powerful city neighbors. Class warred against class, and city against city, and out of their struggles arose leagues and counter-leagues, bewildering to follow like the ever-changing colors of a kaleidoscope. Into this atmosphere of turmoil, the quarrel between popes and holy Roman emperors, begun by Henry IV and Hildebrand, and carried on by the Hohenstaufen and the inheritors of Hildebrand's ideals, entered from the commune's point of view like a heaven-sent opportunity for establishing their independence. In the words of a 10th century bishop, the Italians always wish to have two masters that they may keep one in check by the other. The cities that followed the Hohenstaufen were labeled Ghibelin, those that upheld the Pope Gulf. And at first, and indeed throughout the contest where cruelty and treachery were concerned, there was little to choose between the rivals. Later, however, the fierce imperialism of Frederick I was to give to the warfare of his opponents, the Gulfs, a patriotic aspect. Frederick I, the Barbarossa of the Third Crusade, was a Hohenstaufen on his father's side, and a wolf on his mother's, and it had been the hope of those who elected him emperor that, like a cornerstone, he would bind the two together, and thus, with God's blessing, he might end their ancient quarrel. At first, it appeared this hope might be realized, for the new emperor made a friend of his cousin Henry the Lion, who, as Duke of Bavaria and Saxony, was heir to the wealth ambitions. Frederick also, by his firm and businesslike rule, established what the chroniclers called such unwanted peace that men seemed changed, the world a different one, the very heaven milder and softer. Unfortunately, Frederick, who has been aptly described as an imperialist Hildegram, regarded the peace of Germany merely as a stepping stone to wider ambitions. Justinian, who had ruled Europe from Constantinople, was his model, and with the help of lawyers from the University of Bologna, whom he handsomely rewarded for their services, he revived all the old imperial claims over North Italy that men had forgotten or allowed to slip into disuse. The communes found that rights and privileges for which their ancestors had fought and died 
were trampled underfoot by an imperial official, the Podesta, sent a supreme governor to each of the more important towns. Taxes were imposed and exacted to the uttermost coin by his iron hand. Complaint or rebellion were punished by torture and death. Death for freedom is the next best thing to freedom, cried the men of Crema, flaming into a wild revolt, while Milan shut her gates against her Podesta in an obstinate three years siege. Deliverance was not yet, and Frederick and his vast army of Germans desolated the plains. Crema was burned, her starving population turned adrift. The glory of Milan was reduced to a stone quarry. Pope Alexander III, who, feeling his own independence threatened by imperial demands, had supported the movement for liberty, was driven from Rome and forced to seek refuge in France. Everywhere, the Ghibellines triumphed, and it was in these black days in Italy that the Gulfs ceased for a time to be a faction and became patriots, while the Pope stood before the world the would-be savior of his land from foreign yoke. Amid the smoldering ruins of Milan, the Lombard League sprang into life. Town after town, weary of German oppression and insolence, offered their allegiance. Even Venice, usually selfish in the safe isolation of her lagoons, proffered ships and money. Milan was rebuilt, and a new city, called after the patriot Pope Alessandria, was founded on a strategic site. Alessandria della Paglia, Alessandra of the Straw, Barbarossa nicknamed it contemptuously, threatening to burn it like a heap of weeds. But the new walls withstood his best engines, and plague and the damp cold of winter devastated his armies and camped around him. The political horizon was not, indeed, so fair for the emperor as in the early days of his reign. Germany seethed with plots in her master's absence, and Frederick had good reason to suspect that Henry the Lion was their chief author, the more that he had sulkily refused to share in the last Italian campaign. Worst of all was the news that Alexander III, having negotiated alliances with the kings of France and England, had returned to Italy and was busy stirring up any possible seeds of revolt against Frederick, whom he had excommunicated. In the year 1176, at Lagano, 15 miles from Milan, the armies of the League and Empire met in a decisive battle. Barbarossa, nothing doubting of his success against mere armed citizens, but the spirit of the man of Crema survived in the company of death, a bodyguard of Milanese knights sworn to protect their carroccio or sacred cart, or else to fall beside it, Upon the carroccio was raised a figure of Christ with arms outstretched, beneath his feet an altar, while from a lofty pole hung the banner of St. Ambrose, patron saint of Milan. When the battle opened, the first terrific onslaught of German cavalry broke the Milanese lines, but the company of death, reckless in their resolve, rallied the waverers and turned defense into attack. In the ensuing struggle, the emperor was unhorsed, and in the rumor spread through the ranks that he had been killed, the Germans broke, and their retreat became a wild, unreasoning rout that bore their commander back on its tide, unable to stem the current, scarcely able to save himself. Such was the Battle of Lagana, worthy to be remembered not as an isolated 12th century victory of one set of forces against another, but as one of the first very definite advances in the great campaign for liberty that is still the battle of the world. At Venice in the following year, the Hohenstaufen acknowledged his defeat and was reconciled to the church, while by the perpetual peace of Constance, signed in 1183, he granted to the communes of North Italy all the royal rights, regalia, which they had ever had or at the moment enjoyed. Such rights, coinage, the election of officials and judges, the power to raise and control armies to impose and exact taxes, these are the pillars on which democracy must support our house of freedom. Yet since freedom to the medieval mind too often implied the right to oppress someone else or maintain a state of anarchy, too much stress must not be laid on the immediate gains. 
North Italy in the coming centuries was to fall again under foreign rule, her communes to abuse and betray the rights for which the company of death had risked their lives. Yet, in spite of this taint of ignorance and treachery, the victory of Lugano had won for Europe something infinitely precious, the knowledge that tyrants could be overthrown by the popular will and feudal armies discomfited by citizen levies. Barbarossa returned to Germany to vent his rage on Henry the Lion, to whose refusal to accompany him to Italy he considered his defeat largely due. Strong in the support of the church, to which he was now reconciled, he summoned his cousin to appear before an imperial diet and to make answer to the charge of having confiscated ecclesiastical lands and revenues for his own use. Henry merely replied to this mandate by setting fire to church property in Saxony, and in his absence the ban of outlawry was passed against him by the Diet. Here again was the old Wamligan and Welf feud bursting into flame like a fire that had been but half suppressed, and cousinship went to the wall. Henry the Welf was a son-in-law of Henry II of England and had made allies of Philip Augustus and the King of Denmark. His duchy of Bavaria in the south and of Saxony in the north covered a third of German territory. He had been winning military laurels in a struggle against the Slavs, while Frederick had been losing Lombardy. Thus, he pitted himself against the emperor, unmindful that even in Germany the hand of the political clock were moving forward and feudalism slowly giving up its dominion. To the dawning sense of German nationality, Barbarossa was something more than first among his barons. He was a king supported by the church, and Bavarians and Saxons came reluctantly to the rebel banner, while as the campaign developed, the other princes saw their fellow vassals beaten and despoiled of his lands and driven into exile without raising a finger to help him. Frederick allowed Henry the Lion to keep his Brunswick estates, but Saxony and Bavaria he divided up amongst minor vassals in order to avoid the risk of another powerful rival. Master of Germany, not merely in name but in power, he and his successors could have built up a strong monarchy, as Philip II and the House of Capet were to do in France, had not the siren voice of Italy called them to wreck on her shifting policies. Hitherto we have spoken chiefly of North Italy, but Frederick I bound Germany to her southern neighbors by fresh ties when he married his eldest son Henry in 1187 to Constance, heiress of the Norman kingdom of Naples and Sicily. By this alliance, he hoped to establish a permanent Hohenstaufen counterpoise in the south to the alliance of the Pope and the Gulf towns in the north. Triumphant over the wrathful but helpless Roman see, he felt himself an emperor indeed, and having crowned his son Henry as Caesar in imitation of classic times, he rode away to the Third Crusade, still lusting after adventure and glory. The news of his death in Asia Minor swept Germany with sadness and pride. Like all his house, he had been cruel and hard, but vices like these seemed to weigh little to the medieval mind against the peace and prosperity enjoyed under his rule. Legends grew about his name, and the peasants whispered that he had not died, but slept beneath the sandstone rocks, and would wake again when his people were in danger to be their leader and protector. Henry the Sixth, who succeeded Frederick in the empire, succeeded also to his dreams and the pitfalls that they inspired. One of his earliest struggles had been the finally successful attempt to secure Sicily against the claims of Count Tancred, an illegitimate grandson of the last ruler. Great were the sufferings of the unhappy Sicilians who had adopted the Normans' cause, for Henry, having bribed or coerced the Pope and North Italy into a temporary alliance, exacted a bitter vengeance. Tancred's youthful son, blinded and mutilated, was sent with his mother to an alpine prison to end his days, while in the dungeons of Palermo and Apulia torture and starvation brought to his followers death as a blessed relief from pain. Queen Constance, who had been powerless to check these atrocities, 
turned against her husband in loathing. The Pope excommunicated their author, but Henry the Sixth laughed contemptuously at both. It was his threefold ambition, first, to make the imperial crown not elective but hereditary in the house of Hohenstaufen, next, to tempt the German princes into accepting this proposition by the incorporation of Naples and Sicily as a province of the empire, and thirdly, to rule all his dominions from his southern kingdom with the Pope at Rome, as in the days of Otto the Great, the chief bishop in his empire. Strong-willed, persistent, resourceful, with the imagination that sees visions and the practical brain of a man of business who can realize them, Henry the Sixth, had he lived longer, might have gained at least a temporary recognition of his schemes. But in 1197 he died at the age of 32, leaving a son not yet three years old as the heir of Hohenstaufen ambitions. Twelve months later died also Queen Constance, having reversed as much as she could during her short widowhood of her hated husband's German policy, and having bequeathed the little king of Naples to the guardianship of the greatest of medieval popes and the champion of the Gulfs, Innocent III. At the coronation of Innocent III, the officiating priest had used these words, Take the tiara, and know that thou art the father of princes and kings, the ruler of the world, the vicar on earth of our Savior Jesus Christ. To Lothario de Conti, this utterance was but the confirmation of his own beliefs, as unshakable as those of Hildebrand, as wide in their scope as the imperialism of Frederick Barbarossa or Henry the Sixth. The Lord Jesus Christ, he declared, has set up one rule over all things as his universal vicar, and as all things in heaven, earth, and hell bow to the knee of Christ, so should all obey Christ's vicar, that there be one flock and one shepherd. Again, princes have power on earth, priests have also power in heaven. In illustration of these views, he likened the papacy to the sun, the empire to the lesser light of the moon, and recalled how Christ in the garden of Gethsemane gave to St. Peter two swords. By these, he explained, were meant temporal and spiritual power, and emperors who claimed to exercise the former could only do so by the gracious consent of St. Peter's successors, since the Lord gave Peter the rule not only of the universal church, but also the rule of the whole world. Gregory the Seventh had made men wonder in the triumph of Canossa whether such an ideal of the papacy could ever be realized. But, as if in proof, he had been hunted from Rome and died in exile. It was left to Innocent III to exhibit the partial fulfillment, at any rate, of all that his predecessor had dreamed. In character, no saintly Bernard of Clairvaux, but a clear-brained, practical statesman, he set before himself the vision of a kingdom of God on earth after the pattern of earthly kingdoms, and to this end, that he sincerely believed carried with it the blessing of God for the perfecting of mankind, he used every weapon in his armory. Sometimes his ambitions failed, as when, in the real glow of enthusiasm, he preached the Fourth Crusade, an expedition that ended in Venice, who had promised the necessary ships diverting the crusaders to storm her a coveted port on the Dalmatian coast, and afterwards to sack and burn Constantinople in the mingled interests of commerce and pillage. His anger at the news that the remonstrances of his legates had been ignored could hardly at first be extinguished. Not thus had been his plan of winning eastern Christendom to the Catholic faith and of destroying the infidel. For the Latin Empire of Constantinople, set up by the victorious crusaders, was obviously too weak to maintain for long its tyranny over hostile Greeks, or to serve as an effective barrier against the Turks. Statesmanship, however, prompted him to reap what immediate harvest he could from the blunders of his faithless sons, and he accepted the submission of the church in Constantinople as a debt long owing to the Holy See. 
The Fourth Crusade, in spite of the extension of Rome's ecclesiastical influence, must be reckoned as one of Innocent's failures. In the West, on the other hand, the atmosphere created by his personality and statecraft made the name of the Lord Innocent one of weight and fear to his enemies, of rejoicing to his friends. When upholding Queen Ingeborg, he had stood as a moral force, bending Philip Augustus to his will by his convinced determination, and this same tenacity of belief and purpose added to the purity of his personal life and the charm of his manner, won him the affection of the Roman populace, usually so hostile to its vicars. Medieval popes were, as a rule, respected less in Italy than beyond the Alps, and least of all in their own capital, where too many spiritual gifts had been seen debased from material ends, and papal acts were often at variance with pious professions. During the pontificate of Innocent III, however, we find the prefect, the imperial representative at Rome, accept investiture at his hands. The senator, chief magistrate of the municipality, do him homage, and through this double influence, his control became paramount over the city government. In Naples and Sicily, he was able to continue the policy of Constance, drive out rebellious German barons, struggle against the Saracens in Sicily, and develop the education of his ward, the young king of Naples, as the spiritual son who should one day do battle for his ideals. God has not spared the rod, he wrote to Frederick II. He has taken away your father and mother, yet he has given you a worthier father, his victor, and a better mother, the church. In Lombardy, where the Gulfs naturally turned to him as their champion, the papal sway was comparatively smooth, for the cruelty of Barbarossa and his son Henry VI had aroused hatred and suspicion on all sides. Thus, Innocent found himself more nearly the master of Italy than any pope before his time, and from Italy his patronage and alliances extended like a web all over Europe. Philip Augustus of France, trying to ignore and defy him, found, in the end, the anger he aroused worth placating. John of England changed his petulant defiance into submission and an oath of homage. Portugal accepted him as her suzerain. Rival kings of Hungary sought his arbitration. Even distant Armenia sent ambassadors to ask his protection. His most impressive triumph, however, was secured in his dealings with the empire. Henry VI had wished, as we have seen, to make the imperial crown hereditary but no German prince would have been willing to accept the child he left as heir to his troubled fortunes. The choice of the electors, therefore, wavered between another Hohenstaufen, Philip of Swabia, brother of the late emperor, and the Welf Otto, son of Henry the Lion. The votes were divided, and each claimant afterwards declared himself the legally elected emperor, one with the title Philip II, the other with that of Otto IV. For ten long years, Germany was devastated by their civil wars. Otto, as a Gulf representative, gained the support of Innocent the Great, to whom the claimants at one time appealed for arbitration. But Philip refused to submit to this judgment in favor of his rival, believing that he himself had behind him the majority of the German princes and of the official class. Inasmuch, declared Innocent, as our dearest son in Christ, Otto, is industrious, prudent, discreet, strong and constant, himself devoted to the church, we by the authority of St. Peter receive him as king and will in due course bestow on him the imperial crown. Here was papal triumph. Rome no longer patronized, but patron with Otto on his knees, gracefully promising submission and homage with every kind of ecclesiastical privilege to complete the picture. Yet circumstances change traditions as well as people, and when the death of Philip of Swabia left him master of Germany, the Gulf Otto found his old ideas impracticable. He became a Ghibelline in policy, announced his imperial rights over Lombardy, even over some of the towns belonging to the Pope, 
while he loudly announced his intention of driving the young Hohenstaufen from Naples. Innocent's wrath at this volteface was unbounded. Otto, no longer his dearest son in Christ, was now a perjurer and schismatic, whose excommunication and deposition were the immediate duty of Rome. Neither, however, was likely to be effective unless the Pope could provide Italy and Germany with a rival, whose dazzling claims, backed by papal support, would win him followers wherever he went. In this crisis, Innocent found his champion in the Hohenstaufen prince denounced by Otto, a lad educated almost since infancy in the tenets and ambitions of the Catholic Church. Frederick, king of Naples and Sicily, was an interesting development of hereditary tastes and the atmosphere in which he had been reared. To the southern blood that leaped in his veins, he owed perhaps his hot passions, his sensuous appreciation of luxury and art, his almost Saracen contempt for women, save as toys to amuse his leisure hours. From the Hohenstaufen he imbibed strength, ambition, and cruelty. From the Norman strain on his mother's side, his reckless daring and treachery. With the ordinary education of a prince of his day, Frederick's qualities and vices might have merely produced a warrior king of rather exceptional ability, but thanks to the papal tutors provided by Innocent, the boy's naturally quick brain and imagination were stirred by a course of studies far superior to what his lay contemporaries usually enjoyed, and he emerged in manhood with a real love of books and culture, and with an eager curiosity on such subjects as philosophy and natural history. In the royal charter by which he founded the University of Naples, Frederick expressed his intention that here those within the kingdom who had a hunger for knowledge might find the food for which they were yearning. In his court at Palermo, if from one aspect dissolute and luxurious, was also a center for men of wit and knowledge against whose brains the king loved to test his own quips and theories. When Frederick reached Rome on Innocent's hasty summons to unsheathe the sword of the Hohenstaufen against Otto, much of his character was as yet a closed book even to himself. Impulsive and eager like any ambitious youth of seventeen called the high adventure, and with a genuine respect for his guardian, he did not look far ahead, but kneeling at the Pope's feet, pledged his homage and faith before he rode away northward to win an empire. In Germany, a considerable following awaited him, lifelong opponents of Otto on account of his wealth blood, and others who hated him for his churlish manners. Amongst them, Frederick scattered lavishly some money he had borrowed from the Republic of Genoa, and this generosity, combined with his Hohenstaufen strength and daring, increased the happy reputation that papal legates had already established for him in many quarters. In December 1212, he was crowned in Mainz. The civil war followed, embittered by papal and imperial leagues, but in 1214, Otto IV was decisively beaten at Boulogne in the struggle with Philip II of France that we have already described, and the tide which had been previously turning against him now swept away his few friends and last hopes. With the entry of his young rival into the Rhineland provinces, the dual empire ceased to exist, and Frederick was crowned in Aachen, the old capital of Charlemagne. Innocent III had now reached the summit of his power, for his pupil and protege sat on the throne of Rome's imperial rival. In the same year, he called a council to the Lateran Palace, the fourth gathering of its kind, to consider the two objects dearest to his heart, the deliverance of the Holy Land and the reform of the Church universal. Crusading zeal, however, he could not rouse again. To cleanse and spiritualize the life of the church in the 13th century was to prove a task beyond men of finer fiber than innocent. But, as an illustration of his immense influence over Europe, the Fourth Lateran Council, with its dense submissive crowds, representative of every land and class, was a fitting end to his pontificate. In the year 1216, Innocent III died. 
the most powerful of all popes a striking personality whose life by kindly fate did not outlast his glory in estimating innocent's ability as a statesman there stands one blot against his record in the clear light shed by after events namely the short-sighted policy that once again united the kingdom of naples to the empire and laid the papacy between the upper millstone of lombardy and the nether millstone of southern italy excuse may be found in innocent's desperate need of a champion with otto the fourth threatening his papal heritage added to his belief in the promises of the young hohenstaufen to remain his faithful vassal he also tried to safeguard the future by making frederick publicly declare that he would bequeath naples to a son who would not stand for election to the empire but in trusting the word of the young emperor he had sown a wind from which his successors were to reap a whirlwind the new emperor was just twenty years old when innocent died either to please his guardian or moved by a momentary religious impulse he had taken the cross immediately after his entry into aachen but the years passed and he showed himself in no haste to fulfil the vow much of his time was spent in his loved southern kingdom where he completed innocent's work of reducing to submission the saracen population that had remained in sicily since the mohammedan conquest as infidels the papacy had regarded these arabs with special hatred but frederick once assured that they were so weak that they would be in future dependent on his favor began protecting instead of persecuting them he also encouraged their silk industry by building them a town lucera on the neapolitan coast where they could pursue it undisturbed while he enrolled large numbers of arab warriors in his army and used them to enforce his will on the feudal aristocracy descendants of the norman adventurers of the eleventh century so successful was he in playing off one section of his subjects against another opposing or aiding the different classes as policy dictated that he soon reigned as an autocrat in naples many of the noble strongholds were leveled with the dust their claim to wage private war was forbidden on pain of death cases were taken away from their law courts and those of the feudal bishops to be decided by royal justices towns were deprived of their freedom to elect their own magistrates while crown officials sent from palermo administered the laws and imposed and collected taxes on the whole these changes were beneficial for private privileges had been greatly abused in naples and frederick like philip augustus or the angevin henry the second had the instinct and ability to govern well when he chose nevertheless the subjugation of the kingdom as naples was usually called in italy was of course received with loud outcries of anger by neapolitan barons and churchmen who hastened to inform the holy see that their ruler loved infidels better than christians and kept an eastern harem at palermo honorius the third the new pope accepted such reports and scandals with dismay he had himself noted uneasily frederick's absorption in italian affairs and frequently reminded him of his crusading vow being gentle and slow to commit himself to any decided step however it was not till the hohenstaufen deliberately broke his promise to innocent the third and had his eldest son henry crowned king of the romans as well as king of naples thus acknowledging him as his heir both in germany and italy that honorius's wrath flamed into a threat of excommunication for a time it spread no farther since frederick was lavish in explanations and in promises of friendship that he had no intention of fulfilling while the old pope chose to believe him rather than risk an actual conflagration at last however the patient honorius died gregory the ninth the new pope who was of the family of innocent and shared to the full his views of the world-wide supremacy of the church an old man of austere life and feverish energy he regarded frederick as a monster of ingratitude and became almost hysterical and quite unreasonable in his efforts to humble him goaded by his constant reproaches and threats 
the emperor began to make leisurely preparations at brindisi for his crusade but when he at last started an epidemic of fever to which he himself fell a victim forced him to put back to port gregory refusing to believe in this illness as anything more than an excuse for delay at once excommunicated him and then though frederick set sail as soon as he was well enough repeated the ban giving as his reason that the emperor had not waited to receive his pardon for the first offence like an obedient son of the church a crusader excommunicated by the head of christendom first for not fulfilling his vow and then for fulfilling it this was a degrading and ridiculous sight and frederick now definitely hostile to rome continued on his way determined with obstinate pride that if not for the catholic faith then for his own glory he would carry out his purpose the templars refused him support the christians still left in the neighborhood of acre helped him half-heartedly or stood aloof frightened by the warnings of their priests but frederick achieved more without the pope's aid than other crusaders had done of late years with his blessing by force of arms and still more by skilful negotiations he obtained from the sultan possession of jerusalem and entering in triumph placed on his head the crown of the latin kings his vow fulfilled he sailed for sicily and the pope whose troops in frederick's absence had been harrying the kingdom hastily patched up a peace at san germano i will remember the past no more cried frederick but anger burned within him at papal hostility the emperor has come to me with the zeal of a devoted son said gregory but there was no trust in his heart that corresponded to his words a hohenstaufen who had taken jerusalem unaided supreme in naples supreme also in germany stretching out his imperial scepter over lombardy what pope who believed that the future of the church rested on the temporal independence of rome could sleep tranquilly in his bed with such a vision it is not possible to describe here in any detail the renewed war between empire and papacy that followed the inevitable breakdown of the treaty of san germano very bitter was the spirit in which it was waged on both sides frederick whatever his intentions could not forget that it was the father of christendom who had tried to ruin his crusade the remembrance did not so much shake his faith as waken him an exasperated sense of injustice that rendered him deaf to those who counseled compromise unable to rid himself wholly of the fear of papal censure he yet saw clearly enough that the sin for which the popes relentlessly pursued him was not his cruelty nor profligacy nor even his toleration of saracens but the fact that he was king of naples as well as holy roman emperor to a man of frederick's haughty temperament there was but one absolution he could win for his crime so to master rome that he could squeeze her judgments to his fancy like a sponge between his strong fingers italy is my heritage he wrote to the pope and all the world knows it in his passionate determination to obtain this heritage statesmanship was thrown to the winds he had planned a strong monarchy in naples but in germany he undermined the foundations of royal authority that barbarossa and henry the sixth had begun to lay let every prince he declared enjoy in peace according to the improved custom of his land his immunities jurisdictions counties and hundreds both of those which belonged to him in full right and those which had been granted out to him in fife the italian hohenstaufen only sought from his northern kingdom whose good government he thus carelessly sacrificed to feudal anarchy sufficient money to pay for his campaigns beyond the alps and leisure to pursue them in the words of a modern historian he bartered his german kingship for an immediate triumph over his hated foe at first victory rewarded his energy and skill his hereditary enemy the lombard league had tampered with the loyalty of his eldest son henry king of the romans whom he had left to rule in germany 
but Frederick discovered the plot in time and deposed and imprisoned the culprit. In despair at the prospect of lifelong imprisonment held out to him, the young Henry flung himself to his death down a steep mountainside, and Conrad, his younger brother, a boy of eight, was crowned in his stead. In North Italy, Frederick pursued the policy not so much of trampling down resistance with his German levies, like his grandfather Barbarossa, as of employing Italian nobles at the Ghibelline party, whom he supported and financed, that they might fight his battles and make his wrath terrible in the popular hearing. Such were Eccoline de Romano and his brother Alberigo, lords of Verona and Vicenza, whose tyranny and cruelty seemed abnormal even in their day. The devil's own servant, Eccelin is called by a contemporary, who describes how he slaughtered in cold blood 11,000 prisoners. Quote, I believe, in truth, no such wicked man has been from the beginning of the world unto our own days, for all men trembled at him as a rush quivers in the water. And he who lived today was not sure the morrow. The father would seek out and slay his son, and the son his father, or any of his kinsfolk, to please this man. Alberigo hanged twenty five of the greatest men of Treviso, who had in no wise offended or harmed him, and as the prisoners struggled in their death agonies, he thrust among their feet their wives, daughters, and sisters, whom he afterwards turned adrift, half naked, to seek protection where they might. Revenge, when this limb of Satan fell into the hands of his enemies, was of a brutality to match, for Alberigo and his young sons were torn in pieces by an infuriated mob, his wife and daughters burned alive, though they were noble maidens and the fairest in the world and guiltless. Passions ran too deep between guilt and ghibelline to distinguish innocency or to spare youth or sex. Cruelty, the most despicable and infectious of vices, was the very atmosphere of the 13th century, desecrating what has been described from another aspect as an age of high ideals and heroic lives. It is remarked with some surprise by contemporaries that Frederick II could pardon a joke at his own expense, but on the other hand we read of his cutting off the thumb of a notary who had misspelt his name and callously ordering one of his servants, by way of amusement, to dive and dive again into the sea after a golden cup, until from sheer exhaustion he reappeared no more. At Cortanova, the Lombard League was decisively beaten by the imperial forces, the Carroccio of Milan seized and burned. Frederick, flushed with success, now declared that not only North, but also Middle Italy, was subject to his allegiance, and replied to a new excommunication by advancing into Romana and besieging some of the papal towns. Gregory, worn out by grief and fury, died as his enemy approached the gates of Rome, and his immediate successor, unnerved by excitement, followed him to the grave before the cardinals who had elected him could proceed to his consecration. Innocent IV, who now ascended the papal throne, had of old shown some sympathy to the imperial cause. But Frederick, when he heard of his election, is reported to have said, I have lost a friend, for no pope can be a Ghibelline. With the example of Otto IV in his mind, he should have added that no emperor could remain a gulf. Frederick had indeed gained an inveterate enemy, more dangerous than Gregory the Ninth, because more politic and discreet. From Lyon, whither he had fled, Innocent IV maintained unflinchingly the claims he could no longer set forth in Rome, declaring the victorious emperor excommunicate and deposed. Has the Pope disposed me? asked Frederick scornfully when the news came. Bring me my crown so that I may see what he has taken away. One after another he placed on his head the seven crowns his attendants brought him the royal crown of Germany, an imperial diadem of Rome, the iron circlet of Lombardy, the crowns of Jerusalem, of Burgundy, of Sardinia, and of Sicily and Naples. See, he said, are they not all mine still? 
and none shall take them from me without a struggle. So the hideous war between Wealth and Wobblingen, between Gulf and Ghibelline, continued, and Germany and Italy were deluged with blood and flames. After the Emperor Frederick was put under the ban, says a German chronicler, the robbers rejoiced over the spoils. Then were the plowshares beaten into swords and reaping hooks into lances. No one went anywhere without flint and steel to set on fire whatever he could kindle. The ebb from the high water mark of the emperor's fortunes was marked by the revolt and successful resistance of the Gulf city of Parma to the imperial forces, a defeat Frederick might have wiped out at fresh victory had not his own health begun to fail. In 1250 he died, still excommunicate, snatched away to hell, according to his enemies, not dead, according to many who from love or hate believed his personality of more than human endurance. Yet Frederick, whether for good or ill, had perished, and with him his imperial ambitions. Popes might tremble at other nightmares, but the supremacy of the Holy Roman Empire over Italy would no more haunt their dreams for many years. Naples also, to whose conquest and government he had devoted the best of his brain and judgment, was torn from his heirs and presented by his papal enemy to the French House of Anjou. Struggling against these usurpers, the last of the royal line of Hohenstaufen, Conradin, son of Conrad, a lad of fifteen, gallant and reckless as his grandfather, was captured in battle and beheaded. Frederick had destroyed in Germany and built on sand elsewhere, and all of his conquests and achievements, only their memory was to dazzle after generations. Stupor et gloria mundi, he was called by those who knew him, and in spite of his ultimate failure and his vices, he still remains a wonder of the world, set above enemies and friends by his personality, the glory of his courage, his audacity, and his strength of purpose. End of chapter 14